One deception to rule them all. The Apotheosis of Man. Gregory Lessing Garrett. This is an anthology. This is an anthology. This book is an anthology of the best writings, including my own, which expose the Luciferian scheme to achieve apotheosis though the utilization of satanic occult secret knowledge. The Luciferian elite call it apotheosis. The rest of us know it as transhumanism. What is the one deception to rule them all? The one deception to rule them all is nothing other than the apotheosis of man, to become God, through occult knowledge coming from alleged alien contact and mediated and parceled out through the conduit of artificial intelligence. The future we face is where doctors are computer technicians instead of physicians. Of course, the deception is that this apotheosis will be for all mankind. It will not. It was always intended for only the Luciferian elite to ascend into godhood, while the rest of mankind exist as their slaves or are exterminated. Bible prophecy watchers call this time the Great Tribulation and predict a worldwide struggle to deal with the horrors brought on by massive unemployment caused by AI, robot wars, and the feeling that humanity has been raped by an artificial alien intelligence. The Vatican Jesuits, who may otherwise be called the Ashkenazi, Nazi Party, Khazarian Mafia, Luciferian Elite, Talmudic Jews, or Illuminati, have been implicated by multiple researchers including myself, as central to this nefarious plot against humanity. From Freemason, Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, the Jesuits eventually received their evolutionary theory, which was necessary to keep the heliocentric globe model lie going, as well as to aid in social Darwinian eugenics, genocide, programs, worldwide. If the universe came from a Big Bang, then it needed to evolve, and eventually evolve to a point where it is revealed that man actually came from alien life, which would lead to the idea of an alien messiah antichrist. This long-running thematic development was a wicked Jesuit machination, all along. How do they intend to achieve this? First of all, they are achieving. It is all woven into the digital fabric of the 5G artificial intelligence smart grid surveillance system that has come up around us over the past few decades. Everyone is tracked and watched in every move they make, online and off, while being socially engineered to conform to a hive mind, psychosocial, consumer slave mentality. The ultimate goal will include smart dust nano microchips in the skies, in the land, in the water, in our bloodstream, the entire world online to serve a singular AI. Borg Intelligence The 5G Artificial Intelligence Smart Grid is the superstructure that provides the ironclad technological prison that the elite are using for their current worldwide war. Yes, WW3 has begun. The Third World War is the phony war on terror. It started on September 11, 2001, and it is the hidden war that is being used to strip all civil liberties away from the citizens of the earth. Eventually, through terror and smart grid technologies, all will either be exterminated or locked down into highly controlled surveillance, with minimal movement allowed. However, they will not know that is happening. People will submit to the smart grid tyranny, as they are doing even now, under their own volition. Privacy will be a thing of the past under this worldwide smart grid lockdown. But again, this situation will be the result of people's desire to be imprisoned in this surveillance system that will be its real source of effectiveness. All the government has to do is claim they need to track all movements, whereabouts, and transactions for the benefit of national security, and the masses allow it. We have all been conditioned to permit this invasion of our privacies and lose of civil liberties since birth. We are a demoralized people. How many people, even today, do not willingly offer all of their personal data, doings, and moment-to-moment -moment geographic location to Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat? 
and modern sexuality has been transformed into a brave new world-style competition for deviance and decadence, with no thought of procreation or child-rearing left. The elite have employed their social engineers to make a perverted sexual animal of man, reducing him into an attention whore who seeks to fulfill his narcissistic supply of likes, matches, and sexual conquests. Both genders are implicit in this. The elite dictate all the sordid fetishes, gender styles, and sexual appetites of the world now. We watch movies where the hypersexualization of war, technology, violence, and leisure is commonplace. It is very much like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where sexual customs are determined by the world state. The act of sex is controlled by a system of social rewards for promiscuity and lack of commitment, the more promiscuous the better the reward. The old moral system of the world has been subverted and inverted. We have become enslaved by a compulsion for easy pleasure without accountability, and where a banal popular culture opiates the masses. A world where, day by day, big business encourages us to sacrifice our privacy and spy on friends and families through social media. Reality TV, selfies, mass pornography, and the internet voyeurism are ubiquitous, and what was once the moral abomination of yesterday is now is now the blasé and perfectly acceptable of today. We are swiftly becoming a world at the mercy of an all-powerful elite. It is a reoccurring theme gaining increasing momentum, especially in modern film and literature. Just think of The Hunger Games, Insurgent, Black Mirror, Humans, Utopia, and earlier, Brave New World, and 1984. The emergence of an elite who control the majority, who invariably are low-income consumers, is a worldwide social phenomenon, increasingly we are taught to believe that a peaceful utopian life for all is only possible in a world where dissent and real human emotions are crushed. We see this in the film, Equilibrium, where all human emotions are suppressed for the cause of universal peace. And what is the new age but this same false peace? We are being subdued by a concealed weapon, technology, the Luciferian apple, Apple Computer, which was the doorway to the occult Luciferian promise of salvation and apotheosis from the Garden of Eden. It was always intended to be the secret knowledge that man would discover to become God, albeit a false and crude imitation of God. This digital weapon penetrates the mind and heart, filling it with a babble of distractions, news items, mutually irrelevant bits of information, cognitive dissonance, relentless news flashes, erotic images, social media pages, blasts of carabantic and sentimental music. Our favorite bands and soundtrack noises in the form of truncated digital sound bites, continually repeated doses of drama that bring no catharsis, no peace, no lasting satisfaction, but merely create a craving for daily, or even hourly digitally based dopamine fixes. We are all digital addicts now. And we are at a crossroads now. We can choose to ignore the signs and allow a worldwide smart grid of unimaginable oppression to go up around us, or we can start opposing it by gradually unplugging from the digital beast system that has been constructed all around us. It is a choice that can no longer be ignored. The promise to heal the world has been offered to mankind through the conduit of technology, but depopulation and mass genocide will precede all this, where only the elite will be allowed to inhabit the new healed world order. As long as we desire the pleasures of technology and stagger onwards, drunk upon the techno-hypnotic trance of digital convenience, we will become slaves to the elite plan for transhumanism, where the Luciferian elite ascend and make everyone else their digitally imprisoned slaves. The choice is ours. Dedication this book is the logical extension of my book, The Scientism Delusion. It is dedicated to all those waking up and rubbing the sleep of occult science from their eyes in their fearless quest for truth. 
Very soon, the internet will be completely compromised and you will only have hard copy books and articles, PDFs, DVDs, portable hard drives, flash drives, etc. to learn and share truth from. The internet is already governed by quantum-based, Google AI bots and algorithms beyond human comprehension. For all those who thought it couldn't happen, simply search your favorite controversial theories now to see how many websites are in place to counter and deny what you had once known to be true yesterday and see how your favorite truth videos have been deleted by Trump charges of copyright infringement. Eyes wide shut will no longer suffice. Romans 12 colon 2 King James Version, KJV 2 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect, will of God. King James Version, KJV, When you conform to the world and its idols. Allowing yourself to worship the beast of Luciferian transhumanistic technology, you have surrendered your soul to eternal hell. Forward. The invisible chains of occultism in the world today, there is a Luciferian occult epistemological autocracy where truth is allocated to a few Luciferian elite scientism priests. There is a self-professed superiority amongst these hypnotized pseudo-academics, drunk on blind ambition, and hellbent on creating a worldwide techno-mystical technocracy. In their eyes, they should be the supreme rulers over all others in a sterile, brave new world, digitally manipulated and controlled tyranny. Where any sane and seasoned thinker would see inherent limitations to what mankind can know and perceive, there are no such intrinsic limitations of empirical or epistemic reasoning within this cult of the Luciferian elite. Because of their emphasis upon radical empiricism, where all knowledge is derived from the five senses, they have quarantined off any other modes of epistemological investigation. They have delegated the five senses, but only their five senses, as the only sovereign and rational option for scientific inquiry. Any metaphysical opposition or even empirical variance to the presumed superiority of their data and conclusions is mocked and ridiculed while their gatekeepers of peer review marginalized, condemned and consigned to academic oblivion any who challenge their self-professed authority. Increasingly, many great academic minds are finding themselves relegated to the untenure trash heap of epistemic apostasy for any epistemological dissent regardless of the merits of their research and findings. Even though empiricism, ultimately, is nothing more than a circumstantial juxtaposition existing merely as the temporal succession of spatial proximity, and not truth, per se, they have made a deity of it. They preach it from their highest ivory tower as the only method of inquiry. And yet in a paradoxical tour de force of hypocrisy, they fail to worship their own publicly lauded deity, empiricism, and instead they indulge in the deification of unproven quantum mystical claims, spurious cosmological assumptions, and nebulous and unfounded occult conjectures that have little or no relation to their or anyone else's empirical observations or data whatsoever. The result is what I call scientism, where the floodgates of ancient occult doctrines seep to the surface in the guise of modern science. Turning away from their own empirical religion, they have adopted a new religion based upon the repackaging of occult hermeticism and Kabbalistic mysticism to create a fake form of science that they preach as empirical science. Perhaps, alternative faculties of truth are being concealed and suppressed by this epistemological cartel called modern science which indeed, reveres multiple presuppositions and unproven fantasies as the bedrock of its intellectual foundation. For all we know now, they are raising the cone of power at CERN, and using child sacrifice, pentagrams, and ritualistic torture to advance the body of scientific inquiry now. We really do not know. We do know, however, that they are no longer applying rational empirical reasoning anymore. If they are, there is little or no evidence of it. 
On the contrary, all we see are occult doctrines and occult alchemical principles repackaged and disseminated by them as tenable and actual science, which, indeed, it is not. For example, they offer us gravity, Big Bang cosmology, heliocentrism, and evolution based upon micro-random constituent processes are still entirely unproven theories and have no empirical basis for being upheld as any kind of truth. And yet they are embraced as facts by the epistemological cartel of paid-off, fraudulent scientists who have been systematically brainwashed. We all have been brainwashed by this hoax called modern science. Before recoiling in disbelief and calling all of this conspiracy, that catch-all phrase applied to any who question their reality deeply or think critically. You may want to inquire deeper into why anyone would find it crucial to expose this elite cartel of pseudoscientists before joining ranks with the very same neo-scholastic dictatorship of epistemological authoritarianism that you would run from in horror if you actually realized the number they have done on your mind. This book plunges deep below the surface of the deception called modern science. Modern science is neither empirical like we have been misled to believe nor honest in any way. If anything, it is merely repackaged hermetic alchemical occultism pushed forward in the guise of a Trojan horse called modern science, all hoax and completely unsubstantiated mathematics with spurious claims to assumed authority and truth. Grounded on fake theoretical doctrines of circumstantial juxtaposition. The unproven tenets of modern science make mystical faith look like hardcore empiricism at this point, though you may have been misdirected to not even be suspicious of this situational crisis in science today, and in particular, within the fraudulent halls of quantum theoretic science and astrophysics, 100% hoax. The ivory tower is your enemy and not Christianity. Christianity has been misrepresented so fiercely that most defer to scientism to avoid the apparent atrocities of the Christian church. Long ago, flowing back to pre-Constantine, the Christian church was infiltrated by pagan occultists and perverted to create the Catholic brand of Christianity that many have been rightfully fighting their whole life. This brand of Christianity is today known as the Vatican Church. But this Vatican Catholic interpretation of Christianity has nothing to do with authentic spirituality or actual Christianity. It is pagan in origin and practice. Why do I mention Christianity with such emphasis? Because that is the real issue here, and it is the elephant in the room, everyone's room. How did Christianity become the enemy of mankind? when it teaches love, mercy, forgiveness, and salvation? How did it become subservient to this relatively new religion, scientism? For, because of Jesuit mind control, scientism is the new religion of the masses, blinded by science, as it were, to borrow the song idea from pop musician, Thomas Dolby. Hinduism, atheism, the Islamic faith, pantheism, etc. These are all side shows. Christianity was and still is the main attraction under fire. Why is it that the occult Satanists and Illuminants have only one real goal, to destroy Christianity and genocide billions and make the rest their slaves under the New Age banner of Christianity wrong? Luciferianism right. Why did you think that was their goal? Did you think they were just lightly considering the actual reality of the Christian faith and the existence of God? Did you think the Luciferian epistemological cartel who run this world actually think God is a hoax and Christianity is just some mystical hocus pocus? Did you really think they embrace a quantum pantheistic explanation to the universe as the ultimate eschatological destiny of humanity and the world? some species of atheistic empiricism, stemming from some atheistic soulless materialism. I assure you they do not, but they want you to think this way. The reason they are in control is because you were never supposed to figure any of this out. 
The Illuminati infiltration of the Christian faith that we hear about so much was merely a recent attempt to contaminate Christian doctrine and take down Christianity to supplant it with a pseudo-mystical religiosity, a kind of atheistic materialism. Tempered with an epistemically autocratic mindset. The real infiltration began many, many centuries ago, as far back as the Luciferian promise of apotheosis through esoteric occult secret knowledge was offered to mankind by the serpent. All of us have been carefully programmed by a full-spectrum dominance, mind-control grid of media, educational systems, entertainment, online web, revisionist history, NASA deceptions, and Jesuit-infiltrated government, business, and religions. Most of us have heard about what I am talking about, but I sincerely doubt the masses comprehend the sheer magnitude, scope, and influence that this ubiquitous occult mind control has had on their minds and all minds for over 1700 plus years of occult religious governance. Most people think they are free thinkers or awakened, but they are merely programmed to think that way, part of the Jesuit mind control. Paradoxically, in my experience, it is the atheists and the ones who think they have broken the shackles of religious indoctrination that are the most mentally enslaved. There is nobody more enslaved than the one who does not see the invisible chains. The difference between me and most people is that I am absolutely aware that my mind is not my own. I am entirely aware that all my thoughts have been carefully programmed into my brain over a lifetime of exposure to the world we live in by Jesuit mind control NASA, Internet, Hollywood, culture, subculture, countercultures, media, academia, news, government, etc. All channels of occult control. And waking up is a bitch. Once you see that you have been programmed to reject Christianity by these Vatican Jesuit overlords, you then start to see why and what is actually going on with this world. It's a slow process to see it, a process called, waking up. We have been hypnotized into an astrotheological mindset of epistemic materialism. The Catholic Church was never Christian. It was merely an occult repackaging of ancient Egyptian hermeticism and necromancy with the intention of vile murder, mind control, enslavement, and genocide. And quantum mystical, astrophysics is the religion of the New World Order. You have been exposed to satanic pagan, pantheistic occultism, thinking it was authentic Christianity, and nobody could blame you for hating Christianity in the form you have been shown it to be. Who wouldn't hate it? You were carefully programmed to hate Christianity by Jesuit masters, we all have been. Hollywood's satanic and rampant pedophilia and hate of Christianity is just the tip of the iceberg. The Crusades, the Inquisition, etc. And all of the alleged horrors of the Christian faith you have been spoon-fed by the Jesuit masters who govern all, have been fed to us through media, academia, internet, and Hollywood to destroy any faith you could have possibly had. Jesuit mind control is absolute mind control. All of it is and was a lie. Through artful sophistry and Hegelian dialectical materialism, Catholic Jesuit Vatican scholars have dropped an all-conclusive technological overlay of scientific authoritarianism over the world. Now we all worship scientism and hate Christianity. That was the plan. The ridiculous MYTHS of Christianity we are told, the endless delusions of Christianity we are force-fed, the absurdity of faith we are shown, the endless castigation of Christianity, total O and L S L A U G H T. all of it was all by plan, the Jesuit Catholic plan to destroy Christianity. The Catholic Vatican wants you in an astrophysical mindset. Who do you think invented the Big Bang Theory and supports the theory of evolution more than science does? The Vatican Church. They invented the Big Bang Theory. George Henry Joseph Edouard Lemaitre, RAS associate was a Belgian Catholic priest, 
astronomer and professor of physics at the Catholic University of Leuven, invented the Big Bang Theory. Let that sink in. The Vatican Church has the biggest telescope in the world at MT. Graham. They govern all major astrophysical and astronomical institutions from their Jesuit Vatican scientific materialism helm. Are you getting the picture yet? You are supposed to reject Christianity and embrace a more astrophysical materialistic mindset by design. That was the Vatican Catholic plan all along. The world is under their epistemological technocratic autocracy, currently the scientism priests, and especially the Jesuit Catholic scientism priests, have been working on man's mind for thousands of years to insert your brain into a techno-mystical, techno-spiritual, quantum worldview trance. They have been successful, as in absolutely successful in every way to the extent that most people have no idea what I am even talking about, that successful, indeed, dumbed down that far, the bottom of consciousness. And now, it requires absolutely phenomenal scholarship to even see through any of this immense mind control. And so, this is the real conundrum, to understand what I am referring to, and why. And yet, as I said, I am nearly scratching the surface. Atheism was gradually introduced into the world as a careful socially engineered mythology to mesmerize and brainwash the gullible masses. Epistemology is the investigation of what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. The elite occult established epistemological cartels of knowledge, leaning upon a radical empiricism to block any free thinking about the biogenesis of life, how life began. The Royal Society in England was one such cartel. Through these epistemological cartels, Elite occultists were able to use an anthropocentric epistemology to endorse a metaphysical claim to biogenesis and the disallowance or necessity of a god, making man the measure of all things. By placing man at the center of biogenesis causation, God was factored out of the creation equation, and the occult elite were able to dominate man's passion and rape man of any real free thought or self determinism. Reducing man to a random chaotic event in a meaningless and hostile illusory heliocentric universe. The blind ignorance of atheism was taught as the new creation myth, where no real mechanism or reason for life was offered, just ignorant and blind irrationality. This caused cognitive dissonance in the uneducated masses, and so they clung to atheism, as a man overboard, devoid of any hope or faculties of legitimate reasoning power. In this book, I seek to dispel all the occult myths and delusions we collectively suffer beneath and resurrect the empirical truth of Earth and mankind's place on it. Gregory Lessing Garrett Definitions Truth with lies One crucial thing to consider when researching the occult is their method of mixing truth with lies. They do this to assume a facade of sincerity and legitimacy in their deceptions. For instance, they will allow conspiracy theorist, Alex Jones, to tell us about every major satanic deception and crime to come from the Illuminati, but then Jones will omit the role that Jesuit Zionist Israel has in assisting the Illuminati in the Jesuit Ashkenazi Jewish New World Order. The omission of truth is the tiny drop of arsenic in an otherwise pure beaker of truth, which will poison and kill the seeker if not vigilant. Mixing truth with lies makes it very difficult for most people to see though the deception before them because it all appears so truth and real, except for crucial factors that are twisted and perverted or otherwise omitted. Matthew 13 The parable of the weeds explained 36 Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. 37 He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. 38 The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, 39, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. 
The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. 40 As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. 41 The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. 42 They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 43 Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Dash New International Version, NIV, Luciferianism, the religion of apotheosis Luciferianism constitutes the nucleus of the ruling class religion. While there are definitely political and economic rationales for elite criminality, Luciferianism can account for the longevity of many of the oligarchs' projects. Many of the longest and most brutal human endeavors have been underpinned by some form of religious zealotry. The Crusades testify to this historical fact. Likewise, the power elite's ongoing campaign to establish a socialist totalitarian global government has Luciferianism to thank for both its longevity and frequently violent character. In the mind of the modern oligarch, Luciferianism provides religious legitimacy for otherwise morally questionable plans. Luciferianism is the product of religious engineering, which sociologist William Sims Bainbridge defines as the conscious, systematic, skilled creation of a new religion, new religions, science, and secularization, no pagination. In actuality, this is a tradition that even precedes Bainbridge. It has been the practice of Freemasonry for years. It was also the practice of Masonry's religious and philosophical progenitors, the ancient pagan mystery cults. The inner doctrines of the Mesopotamian secret societies provided the theological foundations for the Christian and Judaic heresies, Kabbalism and Gnosticism. All modern Luciferian philosophy finds scientific legitimacy in the Gnostic myth of Darwinism. As evolutionary thought was popularized, variants of Luciferianism were popularized along with it, particularly in the form of secular humanism, which shall be examined shortly. A historical corollary of this popularization has been the rise of several cults and mass movements, exemplified by the various mystical sects and gurus of the 60s counterculture. The metastasis of Luciferian thinking continues to this very day. Luciferianism represents a radical revaluation of humanity's ageless adversary, Satan. It is the ultimate inversion of good and evil. The formula for this inversion is reflected by the narrative paradigm of the Gnostic hypostasis myth. As opposed to the original biblical version, the Gnostic account represents a revaluation of the Hebraic story of the first man's temptation, the desire of mere men to be as gods by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Rashki 26. Karl Rashki elaborates, in the Hypostasis of the Archons, an Egyptian Gnostic document, we read how the traditional story of man's disobedience toward God is reinterpreted as a universal conflict between knowledge, gnosis, and the dark powers, exousia, of the world, which bind the human soul in ignorance. The hypostasis describes man as a stepchild of Sophia, wisdom, created according to the model of Ion, the imperishable realm of eternity. On the other hand, it is neither God the imperishable nor Sophia who actually is responsible in the making of man. On the contrary, the task is undertaken by the archons, the demonic powers who, because of their weakness, entrap man in a material body, and thus cut him off from his blessed origin. They place him in paradise and enjoin him against eating of the tree of knowledge. The prohibition, however, is viewed by the author of the text not as a holy command, but as a malignant effort on the part of the inferior spirits to prevent Adam from having true communion with the high God, from gaining authentic gnosis. According to this bodlerization, Adam is consistently contacted by the High God in hopes of reinitiating man's quest for Gnosis. 
The Archons intervene and create Eve to distract Adam from the pursuit of Gnosis. However, this Gnostic Eve is actually a sort of undercover agent for the High God, who is charged with divulging to Adam the truth that has been withheld from him. The Archons manage to sabotage this covert operation by facilitating sexual intercourse between Adam and Eve, an act that Gnostics contend was designed to defile the woman's spiritual nature. At this juncture, the hypostasis reintroduces a familiar antagonist from the original Genesis account, but now the principle of feminine wisdom reappears in the form of the serpent, called the Instructor, who tells the mortal pair to defy the prohibition of the Archons and eat of the Tree of Knowledge. The serpent successfully entices Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit but the bodily defilement of the woman prevents man from understanding the true motive underpinning the act. Thus, humanity is fettered by the Archon's curse, suggesting that the orthodox theological view of the violation of the command is sin must be regarded anew as the mindless failure to commit the act rightly in the first place. In this revisionist context, the serpent is no longer Satan, but is an incognito savior instead. Meanwhile, God's role as benevolent Heavenly Father is vilified, the God of Genesis, who comes to reprimand Adam and Eve after their transgression, is rudely caricatured in this tale as the arrogant Archon who opposes the will of the authentic Heavenly Father. Of course, within this Gnostic narrative, God incarnate is equally belittled. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, is reduced to little more than a forerunner of the coming Gnostic adept. According to the Gnostic mythology, Jesus was but a mere type of this perfect man. He came as a teacher and an exemplar to show others the path to illumination. The true Messiah has yet to come. Equally, the serpent is only a precursor to this Messiah. He only initiates man's journey towards Gnosis. The developmental voyage must be further facilitated by the serpent's predecessor, the Gnostic Christ. The hypostasis provides the paradigmatic template for all Luciferian mythologies. Like the hypostasis, the binary opposition of Luciferian mythology caricatures Jehovah as an oppressive tyrant. He becomes the archon of arrogance, the embodiment of ignorance, and religious superstition. Satan, who retains his heavenly title of Lucifer, is the liberator of humanity. Masonry, which acts as the contemporary retainer for the ancient mystery religion, reconceptualizes Satan in a similar fashion. In Morals and Dogma, 33rd degree Freemason Albert Pike candidly exalts the fallen angel, Lucifer, the lightbearer. Strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. He makes man aware of his own innate divinity and promises to unlock the God within us all. This theme of apotheosis underpinned both Gnosticism and the pagan mystery religions. While Gnosticism's origins with the ancient mystery cults remains a source of contention amongst scholars, its promises of liberation from humanity's material side is strongly akin to the old pagan mystery's variety of psychic therapy. In addition, the ancient mystery religion promised the opportunity to erase the curse of mortality by direct encounter with the patron deity, or in many instances by actually undergoing an apotheosis a transfiguration of human into divine. Like some varieties of Satanism, Luciferianism does not depict the devil as a literal metaphysical entity. Lucifer only symbolizes the cognitive powers of man. He is the embodiment of science and reason. It is the Luciferians' religious conviction that these two facilitative forces will dethrone God and apotheosize man. It comes as little surprise that the radicals of the early revolutionary faith celebrated the arrival of Darwinism. 
Evolutionary theory was the edifying science of Promethean zealotry and the new secular religion of the scientific dictatorship. According to Masonic scholar Wilmshurst, the completion of human evolution involves man becoming a godlike being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient. During the Enlightenment, Luciferianism was disseminated on the popular level as secular humanism. All of the governing precepts of Luciferianism are encompassed by secular humanism. This is made evident by the philosophy's rejection of theistic morality and enthronement of man as his own absolute moral authority. While Luciferianism has no sacred texts, Humanist Manifesto I and II succinctly delineate its central tenets. Whitaker Chambers, former member of the Communist Underground in America, eloquently summarizes this truth, humanism is not new. It is, in fact, man's second oldest faith. Its promise was whispered in the first days of creation under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, ye shall be as gods. Transhumanism offers an updated, high-tech variety of Luciferianism. The appellation transhumanism was coined by evolutionary biologist Julian Huxley, Transhumanism, Wikipedia, The Free Encyclopedia, No Pagination. Huxley defined the transhuman condition as man remaining man, but transcending himself, by realizing new possibilities of, and for his human nature, no pagination. However, by 1990, Dr. Max Moore would radically redefine transhumanism as follows, Transhumanism is a class of philosophies that seek to guide us towards a post-human condition. Transhumanism shares many elements of humanism, including a respect for reason and science, a commitment to progress, and a valuing of human, or transhuman, existence in this life. Transhumanism differs from humanism in recognizing and anticipating the radical alterations in the nature and possibilities of our lives resulting from various sciences and technologies. Transhumanism advocates the use of nanotechnology, biotechnology, cognitive science, and information technology to propel humanity into a post-human condition. Once he has arrived at this condition, man will cease to be man. He will become a machine, immune to death and all the other weaknesses intrinsic to his former human condition. The ultimate objective is to become a god. Transhumanism is closely aligned with the cult of artificial intelligence. In the very influential book The Age of Spiritual Machines, AI High Priest Ray Kurzweil asserts that technological immortality could be achieved through magnetic resonance imaging or some technique of reading and replicating the human brain's neural structure within a computer, technological immortality, no pagination. Through the merger of computers and humans, Kurzweil believes that man will become godlike spirits inhabiting cyberspace as well as the material universe. Following the biblical revisionist tradition of the Gnostic hypostasis myth, transhumanists invert the roles of God and Satan. In an essay entitled In Praise of the Devil, transhumanist ideologue Max Moore depicts Lucifer as a heroic rebel against a tyrannical God, the devil Lucifer is a force for good, where I define good simply as that which I value. Not wanting to imply any universal validity or necessity to the orientation. Lucifer means light bringer, and this should begin to clue us into his symbolic importance. The story is that God threw Lucifer out of heaven because Lucifer had started to question God and was spreading dissension among the angels. We must remember that this story is told from the point of view of the Godists, if I may coin a term and not from that of the Luciferians, I will use this term to distinguish us from the official Satanists with whom I have fundamental differences. The truth may just as easily be that Lucifer resigned from heaven. According to Moore, Lucifer probably exiled himself out of moral outrage towards the oppressive Jehovah, God, being the well-documented sadist that he is. 
no doubt wanted to keep Lucifer around so that he could punish him and try to get him back under his, God's, power. Probably what really happened was that Lucifer came to hate God's kingdom, his sadism, his demand for slavish conformity and obedience, his psychotic rage at any display of independent thinking and behavior. Lucifer realized that he could never fully think for himself, and could certainly not act on his independent thinking so long as he was under God's control. Therefore he left heaven, the terrible spiritual state ruled by the cosmic sadist Jehovah, and was accompanied by some of the angels who had had enough courage to question God's authority and his value perspective. More proceeds to reiterate 33rd degree Mason Albert Pike's depiction of Lucifer. Lucifer is the embodiment of reason, of intelligence, of critical thought. He stands against the dogma of God and all other dogmas. He stands for the exploration of new ideas and new perspectives in the pursuit of truth. Lucifer is even considered a patron saint by some transhumanists, transtopian symbolism, no pagination. Transhumanism retains the paradigmatic character of Luciferianism, albeit in a futurist context. Worse still, transhumanism is hardly some marginalized cult. Richard Hayes, executive director of the Center for Genetics and Society, elaborates, last June at Yale University, the World Transhumanist Association held its first national conference. The transhumanists have chapters in more than 20 countries and advocate the breeding of genetically enriched forms of post-human beings. Other advocates of the new techno-eugenics, such as Princeton University professor Lee Silver, predict that by the end of this century, all aspects of the economy, the media, the entertainment industry, and the knowledge industry, will be controlled by members of the Genric class. Naturals will work as low-paid service providers or as laborers. With a growing body of academic luminaries and a techno-eugenical vision for the future, transhumanism is carrying the banner of Luciferianism into the 21st century. Through genetic engineering and biotechnological augmentation of the physical body, transhumanists are attempting to achieve the very same objective of their patron saint. I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Isaiah 14 13-14, this declaration reflects the aspirations of the power elite as well. Whatever form the Luciferian religion assumes throughout the years, its goal remains the same, Apotheosis. Dash, by Philip D. Collins Copyright, Jan. 10, 2006 HTTP, slash slash www.conspiracyarchive.com slash 2014 slash 05 slash 14 slash Luciferianism the religion of Darwinian evolution Darwinian evolution is the great myth of Freemasonry, going all the way back to Freemason, Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, who wrote Zoonomia, which Charles plagiarized to create his On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. The theory of evolution was a Masonic attempt to make a case for racism, favored white supremacy. As is underscored in the title of Darwin's book, preservation of favored races, and was propagated by epistemological cartels, such as the Royal Society of Great Britain to perpetual the evolutionary explanation for mankind's existence in the vacuum of abiogenesis and insufficient proof or evidence of such a theoretical framework having any real empirical justification for being whatsoever. Little has changed since then in spite of the adamant protestations of avid fans of Darwin's failing theory. The trend quickly became to cite variations in species as examples of evolution, and the use of the molecular clock and DNA similarities as evidence of evolution as well. 
Nevertheless, to date, such attempts have gained no verification or empirical traction in authentically scientific and epistemological circles. The propaganda of Darwinism This isn't about Darwinism, but about propaganda. We all swim in a vast sea of propaganda. Why is it not only pertinent but essential to grasp this? Because propaganda techniques are what were, and still are, being used to propagate the Darwinian religion. Once you understand this, you can easily see through the tricks, tactics, techniques and manipulations of public opinion going on all around you, not only with the spread of evolutionary lies and pseudoscience, but politics, religion, public morality, everything. And once you see it, it loses its control over your thinking and your opinion forming. This is not conspiracy theory. This is simply the way governments and other groups function today through the media, public education, and advertising. Dash, Gary Hitch Evolution, the secret behind the propaganda everybody knows, one might suppose, that evolution is about facts and the creation model is about belief. Certainly, this was the message of the PBS TV series entitled Evolution. An internal memo sent to PBS station stated concerning evolution, all known scientific evidence supports evolution. New discoveries over the past 150 years have all supported the validity of the theory of evolution. PBS Internal Memo 2001 The Evolution Controversy, Use It or Lose It Evolution Project slash WGBH Boston June 15th P. 5 the memo further defined a scientific theory as a higher level of understanding that ties facts together p. 5. As to the creation model, the memo dismissed it as not science. It is part of a religious belief system p. 6. Such statements and other similar ones over the years have convinced many that science in general and evolution in particular are based on observations from the natural world, and thus they are empirically or factually based. The interesting thing is that this is not the modern understanding of science among scientists themselves. They have long since abandoned much concern for actual data. The modern outlook on science is readily apparent from remarks by scientists about their discipline. It was David Hull, a well-known philosopher of science, who wrote as early as 1965 that Science is not as empirical as many scientists seem to think it is. Unobserved and even unobservable entities play an important part in it. Science is not just the making of observations. It is the making of inferences on the basis of observations within the framework of a theory. Within this statement we see what appears to be a balance between facts and interpretation or theory. Dr. Hall, however, had a dubious grasp of what constituted data. The previous year, he had written concerning the concept of descent with modification from a common ancestor, phylogeny or evolution the first factor in the phylogenetic program and the only one that is of an empirical nature is phylogeny. But even phylogeny is not a brute fact to be discovered merely by looking and seeing. Phylogeny, the subject matter of phylogenetic taxonomy, is an abstraction. It is an abstraction in two respects. First, it is inferred almost exclusively from morphological, genetical, paleontological, and other types of evidence, and is not observed directly. His thoughts concerning evolutionary descent, we discover, were merely conclusions, not directly indicated by the evidence. Views on the nature of science were actually in a state of flux at the time that Dr. Hull wrote these papers. Karl Popper in 1934 had pointed out that no theory in science could ever be proven true. The only alternative, he suggested, was to try to prove that theories were false. Those well-tested theories which had not been falsified or disproven on the basis of experimental data, 
would then qualify for the designation of scientific theory. The only catch was that many areas of scientific research did not meet these criteria. Theories which could not be falsified were said to be metaphysical belief-based rather than scientific. Accordingly, an editorial in the scientific journal Nature in 1981 pointed out that both Darwinism and the idea that God created the world were metaphysical theories since the course of supposed past evolution cannot be rerun. However, such embarrassing characterizations of Darwinism as non-scientific were on their way out. Thomas Kuhn had published his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in 1962 thereby ushering in a post-empirical age in scientific understanding. According to Thomas Kuhn, all science must be conducted in terms of a unifying set of ideas. Without such a theoretical system, said Kuhn, facts were meaningless and science non-existent. According to philosopher of science, Del Ratsch, in his recent book, Science and Its Limits, this primacy of theory over data has had enormous implications for the practice of science. The result is that empirical data are not that important to science anymore. According to Dr. Ratsch, in arguing that we have no paradigm-independent access to some ultimate reality, and that paradigm choices are in part value choices made by scientists. Kuhn is moving the ultimate court of appeal concerning correct pictures of reality away from the world itself, data, and toward the informed consensus of scientists. Dr. Ratsch further pointed out, since there is no complete and stable and independent external reality to which we have access, there is no particular point in talking about truth in science. So, what do modern scientists do with data? What they do is to interpret their data in terms of the current scientific paradigm. They do not seek to falsify any paradigm such as evolution because paradigms are not supposed to be easily toppled. Individual falsifying facts won't cause a paradigm to be rejected. Even a lot of contrary data will have little effect on a paradigm. Evolution of course is the most obvious paradigm, which is largely immune to the influence of empirical data. Cosmology is another. The most obvious casualties of this new definition of science are the concepts of reality and truth. Biologists Mark Siddall and Arnold Kluge, in 1997, for example, suggested that the search for truth was a misguided venture in science from the start and one that has no basis in reality. They further opine that truth, though not irrelevant to science, is nonetheless irrelevant to the choice among scientific theories because it is unknowable. Nevertheless, these authors conclude that the good news is that we will keep on doing science. They depict the situation thus, our assertions regarding the terminal elusiveness of this truth may be seen by some as troubling or even nihilistic. We counter that it is the impossibility of achieving truth that ensures the continuation of scientific endeavor, and that guarantees our perpetual realization of that which is more valuable than truth itself understanding. Science has definitely come a long way. Initially in the 18th and 19th centuries, actual observations, empirical data, were highly valued. In some cases, they were esteemed too highly. Some people like 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume declared that there was no reality other than what our senses could discover. The material world was all there was. Gradually theory came to be more important until at the present time empirical data are often ignored. Not all scientists, however, support the Kuhnian appeal to consensus among scientists. Tom Settle, another philosopher of science, deplored the situation. Many thinkers, seeing that the search for truth is an unending quest, abandon it, in despair perhaps, and settle for agreement with their fellows. If they are right that it is consensus rather than truth that ought to be aimed for in science, then the picture that emerges is gloomy.
The worst aspect of the situation is that scientists so dogmatically defend interpretations which are based only on consensus. But what is vacuous is to abandon truth as regulative and then to agree to something's being so. And it undermines science rather than affirms it, since it rules out appeal to reality, it rules out striving to be objective. It is evident that modern scientists do not attempt to prove paradigms or important theories like evolution wrong. They merely interpret their data in terms of the paradigm. Evolution is a philosophical starting point, not an observation. As Sidall and Kluger remark, biologists are no more immune to the requirements of a sound philosophical foundation than are these other sciences if our occupation ever is to be more than a simple cataloging of the experiences of our senses. Evolutionary biology, and phylogenetics in particular, demands this even more because, like the quantum physicist, we are not able to observe that which we seek to explain. Another biologist. Andrew Brower characterized dissent with modification as a circular argument or a metaphysical assumption. There is clearly an ontological leap between tests of individual observations and tests of dissent with modification, if the latter is even testable without tautology. If the background knowledge of dissent with modification underlying cladistics is not testable by independent means, it would seem to be more a metaphysical first principle like vitalism or orthogenesis than a component of a Popperian hypothetico-deductive approach. In other words, evolution is not falsifiable but is an a priori assumption. Christians, on the other hand, typically take a much more traditional or empirical approach to science. They expect that when contrary data are pointed out, that the hearer's response will be to reject the paradigm. All too often, however, the hearer minimizes the significance of the data, calling them merely anomalous or poorly understood. Most supporters of evolution theory expect that the obvious problems will eventually be solved and, in the meantime, they concentrate on less controversial aspects of the paradigm. For the present, consensus by scientists is indeed used as a major point in favor of a paradigm. Individuals arguing from a minority position already have a major strike against them. Some scientists also claim that science is an all-or-nothing proposition with no room for a critical evaluation of individual aspects of the discipline. It was Hull who articulated the all-or-none principle. He was referring specifically to evolutionary versus numerical, empirical, categorizing of organisms, and this same argument is used today against the creation model. Are the inductive inferences made by evolutionists in reconstructing phylogeny sufficiently warranted? Any decision must rest on the advances of the various sciences using the techniques of discovery and justification which they do use. Hence, induction is justified by an induction. The arguments presented by the empiricists against evolutionary reconstructions, if sound would annihilate not just evolutionary taxonomy, but all empirical science. According to him, it is pointless to contest scientific speculations on the basis of data. Because the whole scientific enterprise holds together. If some theorizing is acceptable, then all of it is beyond challenge. Since the importance of empirical data in science has long since been downgraded to a subsidiary importance relative to theory, the PBS statements concerning evolution and creation are all the more interesting. The PBS memo implied that evolution could easily have been falsified by negative empirical evidence. On the contrary, scientists have devoted their best efforts to protecting evolution theory from negative data. In actual fact, it is the creation model supporters today who so frequently appeal to empirical evidence, such as the coded nature and information content of DNA, and the evolutionists who so blissfully fail to recognize the significance of these very same data. Indeed, when all is said and done, 
The essence of much modern science is that it is not empirical at all but rather post-empirical or theory-based. That's quite a difference. Maybe PBS should run a new creation-based series to alert the public to the real situation. The occult version of the will of the creator from the method underscored with the occult motto, Ordo of Chow, Order Out of Chaos. We can surmise that the occult would view the will of the creator to be that the destiny of all things is uncertain. With this view, they manipulate people and events to direct this uncertain outcome to conform to their will. As they see it, the creator wills it that they be able to manipulate the destiny of all people. Ashkenazism and Zionism whenever the term Jew appears in this book as responsible for the new world order, I am referring to the Jews who are not Jews, the Ashkenazi bloodline which has nothing to do with true Jewish ancestry. Revelation 2 9, Jesus said, I know your works, tribulations and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. In Revelation 3 9, Jesus said, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews, and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet, and to know that I have loved you. I have endured to constantly inform anyone who reads my books that I do not endorse anti-Semitism in any way. Most Jews, Christians, and Muslims, alike, have no idea that the Ashkenazi are impersonating Jews in order to advance an agenda of anti-Semitism. They do this in order to suppress any form of opposition to their demoralization of the world, which lays the foundation for their new world order acceptance. To fully understand the story of this Ashkenazi agenda for world tyranny, it is important to understand that they follow a Zionist agenda and what Zionism really is. Zionist propaganda has led the American people to believe that Zionism and Judaism are one and the same, and that they are religious in nature. This is a blatant lie. Judaism is a religion, but Zionism is a political movement started mainly by East European Ashkenazi Jews, Jews who are not Jews, who for centuries have been the main force behind communism, socialism, Satanism, and the struggle for the New Age New World Order. The ultimate goal of the Zionists is a one-world government under the control of the Ashkenazi Zionists and the Zionist-oriented Jewish international bankers. Introduction in this next chapter to my book, The Scientism Delusion, I will maintain my original premise that modern science is a repackaging of ancient occult Luciferian, Hermetic, and Kabbalistic philosophy and mysticism. However, in this book, I will also shift my focus slightly to expose the way in which ancient aliens in outer space, the Anunnaki and Nephilim myths, including the planet Nibiru myth, an evolving AI alien consciousness and transhumanism or Gnostic deceptions which are, likewise, being repackaged as modern scientific and cultural realities. Additionally, though I will continue to examine the Luciferian and alchemical antecedents of modern science and quantum mysticism, I intend to contextualize them more precisely within modern Christian thought and ancient Christian salvation, exploring what this means in our modern Luciferian context. Always remember that scientism moved in like a Trojan horse to advance an occult hermetic agenda to propagate a Kabbalistic religious framework, cloaked as actual science, and architected to exalt the occult elite into power. The epistemological cartels of the ages have ascended to supreme authority and are sweeping out to infiltrate and capture all truth communities and control all ranges of debate through a sinuous application of the Hegelian dialectic. It has never been more important and crucial than now to wake up the sleeping giant called the world's population. Whatever your specialty is, whether in the field of esoteric investigation, geopolitics, ancient aliens, demonic mysticism, Christian eschatology, Anunnaki lore, hermetic and alchemical science, astrophysics, cosmology, Babylonian mystery school research, quantum mysticism, new age deception.
etc., our cause is the same, our foe singularly ghastly, our enemy chameleon-like and relentless. We have a crisis in modern higher education. Physics, and in particular quantum physics, has become scientism, and the practice of radical empiricism with its epistemological tyranny has ascended into a scientific dictatorship. This scientific dictatorship had captured the minds of the world through its cunning use of descriptive syntax to change the perception of the world we live in. Subsequently, even the top scientists must talk in enigmatic code to remain relevant and vital within the sycophantic halls of today's ivory tower. Yes, modern physics, in the form of scientism, has become a neo-fascist scholasticism. It is languishing in the avoidance of real questions in the pursuit of trivial methodology. It is hiding in is the memorization of an endless list of names and mathematical manipulations in lieu of understanding real observable mechanics and experimentally provable truths. It practicing subterfuge in the setting up of some black data hole and extemporizing on an endless string of ever more ridiculous hypotheses instead of looking at known physical problems closer at hand. It is the knee-jerk invocation of authority and the explicit squelching of dissent. It is the hiding behind tall gates and a million gatekeepers and euphemizing it as peer review. Additionally, it is the institutionalized acceptance of censorship and the creation of dogma. Grandmasters like Feynman say, shut up and calculate. And everyone finds this amusing. Why does no one find it a clear instance of fascism and oppression? Well, try pointing this out, and you'll receive the proverbial peers review jackboot on your face, and you're done, tossed out of the school, the job, and destined to write blogs on science for zero money and recognition the rest of your life. An internet search on against Feynman or Feynman was wrong or disagree with Feynman turns up nothing. The field is monolithic. It is completely controlled and one-dimensional. All discussion has been purged from the standard model, and all debate has been marginalized. Any non-standard opinion must be from a crank and blacklisting is widespread. Contrary to what we are told, contemporary physics is not booming. It is not very near to omniscience. It is not the crown jewel of anything. In fact, it is near death. It has been damaged by any number of things, only a few of which I have mentioned by name here. But the prime murderer has been abstract mathematics. Physics has succumbed to suffocation. It is the victim of strangulation. It is in a not-so-shallow grave and piled on top of it like dirt are a thousand fields and operators and variables and names and spaces and terms and eigenvalues and dimensions and criteria and functions and coordinates and conjugates and base and bijective maps and automorphism groups and abelian gauge fields and Dirac spiners and Feynman diagrams and so on ad nauseum. The only way the grave could be any deeper and darker, in fact, is if we allowed deconstruction to dump its transfinite dictionary of onanic terms on top of this current grave. Again, the epistemological cartels of the ages have ascended to supreme authority, and now they are sweeping out to infiltrate and capture all truth communities and control all ranges of debate through their Hegelian dialectic using scientism. In the religion known as scientism, there is absolutely no room to discuss any observation that takes place prior to proof of the observation taking place via experimentation. The experimentation itself must take place at only the top institutions in the world and must be replicated at a minimum of five different times with the involvement of hundreds of participants in order to be even considered as a potential topic for discourse. Scientism is obviously a mindset that solidifies intelligent discourse and protects the sanctity of the scientific field at its highest form.
Regardless of your beliefs and convictions, within the context of this neo-fascist scholasticism, with its Hollywood shill scientism high priests like the late Carl Sagan, Sean Carroll, Richard Dawkins, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Michio Kaku, we are all in their crosshairs, rest assured. And they will not stop until they have captured the perceptual faculties of all the world with their occult nonsense, and their Jesuit master's current infiltration of all truth communities, truth forums, and truth groups. Adapted, in part, from Death by Mathematics. Quotations If I am a fool, it is, at least, a doubting one, and I envy no one the certainty of self-approved wisdom. Lord Byron, 1788-1824 English poet the vernacular of modern scientific has become indistinguishable from the vernacular of ancient occult hermeticism and Kabbalah. Gregory Lessing Garrett Don't you believe in flying saucers, they ask me? Don't you believe in telepathy? In ancient astronauts? In the Bermuda Triangle? In life after death? No, I reply. No, 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 and again no. One person recently, goaded into desperation by the litany of unrelieved negation, burst out don't you believe in anything? Yes, I said. I believe in evidence. I believe in observation, measurement, and reasoning, confirmed by independent observers. I'll believe anything, no matter how wild and ridiculous, if there is evidence for it. The wilder and more ridiculous something is, however, the firmer and more solid the evidence will have to be. Isaac Asimov Chapter 1 Jesuit Infiltration for Globalization Society of Jesus People are aware of the prestigious claim to be of a Jesuit school or having Jesuit training. While many colleges boast of such high claim, few know the dark doctrines of Jesuits and what they intend. The Jesuit Oath of Induction is a recorded document still filed in the Library of Congress, yet as of late is difficult to trace, that states their projected aim is to abolish Christianity, true Christianity, and to sacrifice, kill, a heretic Protestant. The Jesuit Oath of Induction had been recorded in the Congressional Record of the U.S., House Bill 1523. Yet since the Jesuits control the stream of education and history, they have managed to suppress their past from public scrutiny and to revise their tainted history with a version of innocence and prestige. And also its spinsters have managed to debunk the claims and offer explanation that attempts to discredit the discreditors. According to past historical accounts, the Jesuits were masters of espionage, infiltration, and assassination. They would guise as a Catholic to the Catholics, but even offer themselves as Protestant to the Protestants in order to gain and subvert their enemy. Very deceptive and working secretly as the guise of their target. Their motto the end justifies the means allows them the shredding of guilt for what they must do for the intent of the whole agenda and cause. Their tactic was to subvert the Catholic Church as a means to plant their agents within nations through the Vatican-sponsored institution and to be a servant of all in order to gain access to information. The whole concept of the Catholic Confession was used to gain inside info by its priests capturing minute detail about a person as he cleansed his soul of guilt. Then they were kept in files that could be used for blackmail. Ingenious The Jesuits were started under Ignatius of Loyola in 1534. He was influenced by the Spanish Illuminati, Los Alambrados, who started the secret society to stand in the absence of the Knights Templar over the Catholic Church. While it was not defined under which name they would be considered, or for what purpose stated, it was suggested they call themselves the Society of Jesus in order to gain access into Vatican ranks. In 1540 Pope Paul III recognized them to be his Catholic missionaries, militant strongarm, in order to reign in those heretic Protestants and bring all back under the submission of the state of religious Roman Catholicism. 
In the wake of Protestant Reformation, it became necessary for the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, to lead the Counter-Reformation against the movement. They were successful in filtrating Protestantism and subduing it through their education influence. When the nations were reporting loss of control over their state, it was found that the Jesuits had ulterior motives to infiltrate the world for a globalist one-world empire with their order in control. The Freemasons realized the Jesuits came out from under their control to become its own powerful order working independent. Under pressure to stop their plans, Pope Clement issued a decree to abolish the Jesuits. However, he realized he signed his death warrant upon doing so, and soon after was poisoned to death. A Noted Jesuit M.O. of Assassination The Jesuits disappeared by 1773. In its place came an order founded by an ex-Jesuit trained by birth, Adam Weishaupt, who was a professor of law at Ingolstadt University. With the help of funding from the Rothschilds, Weishaupt founded the ancient Illuminate Seers of Bavaria on May 1, 1776. This became the new modern branch of the infamous Illuminati. Weishaupt took several tactics right out of the Jesuit playbook to subdue and subvert sectors of society, nations, and control governmental systems for a centralized government. His disciples, known as perfectibilists, were put into position to carry out the task of forming an elite government. Their order planned wars and every war since the French Revolution, asterisk. Some believe Weishaupt carried on the Jesuits in their hiatus however, in documents it is apparent he did so without Jesuit blessing, and was dubbed an enemy of the other order rather than its successor. The Jesuits re-emerged in 1814 under Pope Pius and became the authority of Vatican. As Vatican influence diminished, it seemed to simply have changed hands once and for all. In the 1960s Vatican II was written, which defined the new direction and in that the age-long feud between Jesuits and Freemasons ended. Many are aware of the visible Pope, but few are aware of a hidden Pope behind the scenes, known as the Black Pope. Simultaneously a White Pope, the Visible One, is in power along with a Black Pope, hidden. The Black Pope serves as the Superior General of the Order. The current Pope, Francis, is the first time a Jesuit was elected as white pope. This makes a white pope and black pope both Jesuits in office at the same time. An indication that the fulfillment of their goal is being reached. The Jesuits took over the education centers and seminaries. Even Charles H. Spurgeon warned that clergy were trained under the doctrines of Jesuits and indoctrinated to preach a gospel with portions left out. A watered-down ecumenical gospel, as the result. Many have been unwittingly subject to their doctrines through the modern churches and the means of contemplative prayer, as well as other indoctrinations. Their goal is still globalism, See Georgetown University document Jesuits for Globalization, but intended to use Vatican as the global headquarters of the world with Jesuits in complete power. Their goal is to bring all religions under Vatican ecumenicalism and water down the faiths to coexist for the New Order religion. The Jesuits were also instrumental in the development of communism and socialism. They influenced Karl Marx and others to bring the ideology to the public. They also crafted liberalism and the movement of tolerance, as well as social justice. Several Jesuits have come into politics and religion. Billy Graham was trained under Jesuit Fulton Sheen, I found this unusual fact in my search after suspicions of Graham's Vatican connection. This is the same Sheen that Jesuit-trained Martin Sheen, Ramon Antonio Gerardo Estevez, adopted as his surname in honor of Fulton. Here are some influential people who are Jesuit-trained, Joseph Dunford, 
U.S. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff John Kerry, U.S. Secretary John Boehner, U.S. Speaker of the House Tim Kaine, U.S. Virginia Senator John Podesta, U.S. Counselor to President Barack Obama Wilbur Ross, U.S. Secretary of Commerce John Kelly, U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Jerry Brown, U.S. Governor of California, but consider this. Donald Trump claims to be Presbyterian and has been recently sworn in as Christian, yet he attended Jesuit Fordham University for two years and then transferred to the covertly Jesuit-controlled University of Pennsylvania. Whether indoctrinated in that time, he certainly has a connection to consider. Ivanka Trump, daughter of an U.S. assistant to President Donald Trump, also trained at Jesuit University of Pennsylvania Eric Trump, son of and trustee of the Trump Organization, attended Jesuit Georgetown University. So, who is fooling who? Are we under a globalist world agenda? Are Jesuits placing their agents in high influential positions ready for a world takeover? Will they continue to rival other secret societies, such as the Freemasons? Our cultural decline follows the Illuminati conspiracy stems from expulsion of Murano's disclaimer, whenever Jews are mentioned in my books, I am never referring to the good religious, authentic Jews. I am referring to the Jews pretending to be Jews that Christ spoke of. These are really Kazarian bloodlines from Georgia, Russia, who infiltrated Judaism, and continue the process to imitate Jews in order to advance unimpeded towards a new world order based upon satanic Kabbalistic principles and doctrine. Here is his synopsis, the expulsion of Murano Jews from Spain in 1492 created a messianic fervor, which inspired the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria. Columbus, Cortes, Pizarro were all Muranos, looking to conquer new territory as a refuge from the expulsion. Moranos entered Franciscans, Dominicans, and Carmelites, and included Saint Teresa of Avila. Moranos also created the Jesuits. Moranos went to Italy and fostered the Renaissance, which was Christian Kabbalah. One of its most important exponents was Reuchlin, who was the great uncle to Luther's partner. Luther was also interested in Kabbalah, and was hailed as a possible messiah by the Jews. In England, Christian Kabbalah was expressed by Spencer, Marlowe and John Dee who inspired the Rosicrucians, who were based on the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria. Rosicrucians fleeing to England were responsible for fanning millenarian expectations about the coming of a messiah in 1666. At their heart was Manasseh ben Israel, chief rabbi of Amsterdam, who funded Cromwell to carry out his revolution. The result was the readmittance of the Jews to England. Manasseh's circle, known as the Hartlib Circle, or the Invisible College, evolved into the Royal Society, and were all connected to Sabbatai Zevi and his mission. It also included John Milton, William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania, and John Winthrop the founder of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The so-called pilgrims were Rosicrucians, escaping persecution to found a Jewish Christian colony in the New World, modeled after Francis Bacon's Rosicrucian tract, The New Atlantis. Moranos everywhere. Christian Kabbalists and the conquest of the New World The Spanish Inquisition, and the expulsion from Spain in 1492, were some of the most pivotal events in modern times. Jewish converts penetrated to Christianity, where they could exact their revenge. Jewish Kabbalists became Christian Kabbalists. When they entered Italy, they fostered the Renaissance and in Amsterdam, the Northern Renaissance. Luther established Protestantism, creating a schism that permanently removed large sections of Christian Europe from Catholic control. Rosicrucians cultivated the career of the foremost false prophet and Jewish apostate, Sabbatai Zevi. Leaving from the Netherlands, these secret Rosicrucians, known to American history as the Pilgrims, set sail for the New World via England, where they hoped to found a new Masonic experiment, known as the New Atlantis. 
In 1290, King Edward issued a decree to have all Jews expelled from England. All the crowned heads of Europe then followed his example. France expelled the Jews in 1306. In 1348 Saxony followed suit. In 1360 Hungary, in 1370 Belgium, in 1380 Slovakia, in 1420 Austria, in 1440 for the Netherlands. As in other parts of Europe, violent persecution had been growing in Spain and Portugal, where in 1391, hundreds of thousands of Jews had been forced to convert to Catholicism. Publicly, the Jewish converts were known as Moranos, and also as conversos were Christians, but secretly they continued to practice Judaism. While secret conversion of Jews to another religion during the Spanish Inquisition is the most known example, as Rabbi Joaquin Prinz explained in The Secret Jews. Jewish existence in disguise predates the Inquisition by more than a thousand years. There were also the examples of the first Gnostic sects, which comprised of Merkaba mystics who entered Christianity. Likewise, in the 7th century, the Quran advised the early Muslim community, and a faction of the people of the scripture say, to each other. Belief in that which was revealed to the believers at the beginning of the day, and rejected at its end that perhaps they will abandon their religion. As demonstrated by Louis I. Newman in Jewish influences on Christian reform movements, a similar tendency can be attributed to the advent of Catharism and eventually to Protestantism and other Christian heresies. The Cathars, also known as the Albigensians, were a Gnostic sect of the 13th century who worshipped Lucifer. Their influence extended to the legends of the Holy Grail, by way of the Templars, and thereby to Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. In his denunciation the heresy, adversus Albigenses, Lucas of Ty, a Spanish monk, noted, the secular heads and judges of the cities hear the doctrines of heresy from Jews whom they number among their familiars and friends. They teach other Jews to propose their blasphemies against Christians in order that they can thus pervert the Catholic faith. All the synagogues of the malignant Jews have patrons, and they placate the leaders with innumerable gifts, and seduce by gold the judges to their own culture. Moranos joined orders like the Franciscans, Dominicans, and discalced Carmelites, where their prophetic eschatology was often branded as heresy. The Discalced Carmelites were established in 1593 by two Spanish saints, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. John of the Cross was born Juan de Yepes y Alvarez into a Morano family. John's mystical theology is influenced by the Neoplatonic tradition of Pseudo-Dionysus, a Christian theologian and philosopher of the late 5th to early 6th century. The author pseudonymously identifies himself as the figure of Dionysius the Areopagite, the Athenian convert of the Apostle Paul. The Dionysian mystical teachings were universally accepted throughout the East, amongst both Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians, and also had a strong impact in later medieval Western mysticism, most notably Meister Eckhart. Based upon preliminary reports made by members of the Discalced Carmelite Mission in Basra during the 16th century, the Mandeans of Iraq are called Christians of St. John. 7. Often identified with the Sabians, the source of the occult teachings of the Ismailis, which were reportedly transmitted to the Templars. For this reason, the Mandeans were the Eastern mystics of Rosicrucian legend, who later became the basis of the Sabbatean sect of the Asiatic Brethren. Teresa of Avila's paternal grandfather, Juan Sanchez de Toledo, was a Murano. 8. During a bout of severe illness, Teresa experienced periods of religious ecstasy. Around 1556, when various friends suggested these were diabolical, her confessor, the Jesuit Saint Francis Borgia reassured her of their divine inspiration. The House of Borgia, an Italo-Spanish noble family, which rose to prominence. 
during the Italian Renaissance, was widely rumored to be of Murano origin. The Borgias became prominent in ecclesiastical and political affairs in the 15th and 16th centuries, producing two popes, Pope Calixtus III during 1455-1458, and Pope Alexander VI, during 1492-1503. Especially during the reign of Alexander VI, they were suspected of many crimes, including adultery, incest, simony, theft, bribery, and murder, especially by arsenic poisoning. The Muranos were also involved in the creation of the Order of the Jesuits. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits in 1534, had been a member of a heretical sect known as the Alambrados meaning illuminated, which was composed mainly of conversos. Although there is no direct evidence that Loyola himself was a Murano, according to Lo Judeo Conversos en España y América, Jewish conversos in Spain and America, Loyola is a typical converso name. As revealed by Robert Merricks, in the Jesuit order as a synagogue of Jews, Loyola's successor Diego Lainez was a Murano, as were many Jesuit leaders who came after him. In fact, Muranos increased in numbers within Christian orders to the point where the papacy imposed purity of blood laws, placing restrictions on the entrance of new Christians to institutions like the Jesuits. Woody Allen, How Sex Became Our Religion, Woody Allen, 42. And schoolgirl Mariel Hemingway, 17. Their romance was depicted in his hit 1979 movie Manhattan. In her autobiography, Hemingway said Alan also tried to bed her in real life at 17. Never in the Jewish tradition was sexual asceticism a religious value. How did society become sex crazed? How did sex get separated from love and marriage? We have been inducted into a satanic sex cult. Kabbalist Judaism, Freemasonry. This week, we learned that the movie Manhattan was based on Alan's real-life affair with a 17-year-old. True, an ambitious actress and model, she threw herself at him. The relationship lasted eight years and included threesomes with Mia Farrow, who later accused Alan of pedophilia when he dumped her for her teenage adopted daughter. The point is, Jewish sex addicts like Woody Allen provided our perception of reality. They trained us to think sex is the holy grail. Kabbalist Jews believe that sex is a prayer to God. They do a pelvic thrust called davening when they pray. Many Jews have been unwittingly inducted into this cult and have inducted society through their media control. About 80% of the media figures caught in the hashtag MeToo scandal are Jews. The president of CBS, Les Moonves, had staff members on call to administer blowjobs. He was recently fired and lost a $200 million severance. These degenerates provide our vision of reality. Now they're being thrown to the wolves to advance a higher cause making heterosexuality look sick and evil. For homosexuals, promiscuity compensates for their inability to bond with the opposite sex. The Illuminati want sex to compensate heterosexuals for the loss of God. This is the contemporary face of Satanism, making sex our God. Latest, Alan Dershowitz implicated in Epstein scandal. Is Trump next? Harvey Weinstein's casting couch, I reprise one of my most important articles. Kabbalah, how sex became our religion sex, love and relationships have become the ersatz religion of modern society. The implied message dash, sex is the way to God has been in our cultural drinking water since the 1960s and longer. Movies portrayed sexual intercourse in mystical terms, perfect bodies coupling to a chorus of angels. The Illuminati music industry pushed the theme that romantic love and sex connect us to God.
Take Kathy's song, 1965, by Paul Simon. So you see I have come to doubt slash all that I once held is true slash I stand alone without beliefs slash the only truth I know is you. This was followed by this scholarly exegesis, man is alienated and alone in the universe. Life has no intrinsic meaning, so we must invent one. Man overcomes his separation from God through sexual intercourse, which is mystical in nature. In other words, man and God become one by copulation. Little did we know that the mystification of sex is pure Kabbalah. Kabbalah, the Illuminati religion, is Satanism. Why Satanic? To begin, only the Kabbalist Jew and his disciples are separated from God. They are separated by virtue of their Luciferian rebellion, based on their desire to supplant God. They have convinced mankind to join their rebellion and feel alienated. I suspect most dysfunction originates in this revolt which is the essence of modernism. Instead of reality, we live in a Masonic Jewish solipsism, i.e. self-created reality. Notice, God isn't part of it. God is a dirty word. Thanks to their media control, the Illuminati have convinced humanity that sexual union restores unity with the divine. This is Kabbalah. In Sigmund Freud and the Jewish Mystical Tradition, 1958, Jewish psychology professor David Bakken writes, The soul, according to the Zohar, i.e. Kabbalah, has an unquenchable yearning to be united with its source in God. This union is characteristically discussed in the metaphor of sex. Generally speaking, the union of male and female is taken as the ideal form of existence. Thus, human sexual relations become symbolic vehicles of divine acts, and the divine creativity is understood as of a deeply erotic character itself. P.273, according to the Kabbalah, God has a female side, called the Shekinah. Just as man seeks unity with God through sex, so God supposedly seeks union with his female nature. In other words, man both imitates and helps God by having sexual intercourse. All of this is nonsense. Even Jewish sources dismiss the Kabbalah as a hoax. Nevertheless, this hoax, along with the Talmud, defines Judaism. Kabbalism divides God into a father and mother figure and adds son and daughter figures. Despite the incestuous implications, the Kabbalah is all about the son and daughter gods having sex which is being prevented by Satan, who is the god of the Gentiles by the way. The duty of pious Jews is to restore through their prayers and religious acts the perfect divine unity, in the form of sexual union between male and female entities. The prayers actually enact this seduction. Israel Shahak, Jewish History, Jewish Religion, The Weight of 3,000 Years, pp. 33-34 Why Kabbalah is satanic first, it denies our connection to God who speaks to us through our divine spirit, soul. Kabbalah preaches that God is formless and unknowable. The whole point of religion is to worship, obey, God. How can you obey something formless and unknowable? Naturally, the Satanist will convince the unwary that God is unknowable. Second, by making the sex act a means for reaching God, the Kabbalist sets up a false god. According to the Kabbalist, sexual intercourse is tantamount to mystical union. Orgasm is revelation. In fact, unity with God is reached by grace, worship, devotion, selfless service, and spiritual discipline, not by copulating. But just as homosexuals use sexual excess to compensate for loss of healthy intimacy between a man and woman, heterosexuals use it to compensate for loss of God. Naturally, the Illuminati want us to imitate homosexuals. Third, the god of the Kabbalah combines good and evil. Somehow, good will come from doing evil. This is salvation through sin. 
Again, this is nonsense. God is moral. He is perfection. Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5:48. God speaks to man through our spiritual ideals such as truth, beauty, justice, and love. Thus, the Kabbalah is typically satanic, making evil appear good, lies appear true, sick appear healthy, and vice versa. Finally, Bakken writes, Never in the Jewish tradition was sexual asceticism religious value. 272. This alone disqualifies Judaism as a religion. All true religions require control over lust. Far from ascetic, the Talmud and Kabbalah are degenerate, opening the door to pederasty and incest. The Kabbalah also holds that man is bisexual, which explains Illuminati promotion of homosexuality and androgyny. Anything to overturn the natural order and spit in God's eye. The Illuminati used Sigmund Freud, a Kabbalist, to convince the world that sexual restraint leads to neuroses and sickness. In a speech to the B'nai B'rith on his 70th birthday, Freud emphasized his Jewishness. He said he joined the Masonic Jewish Lodge because of many dark emotional forces that made Jews and Judaism irresistible. He was drawn to the clear consciousness of our inner identity the intimacy that comes from the same psychic structure. Bakken p. 305. Most Jews have hardly heard of the Talmud and Kabbalah, let alone read or understand them. They don't know that Judaism is a satanic cult masquerading as a religion. The same applies to those dupes known as Christian Zionists. Goddesses thus, the Kabbalah is the reason why pussy is the holy grail and young women are idealized as goddesses. This pagan sex cult is peddled by the Illuminati-controlled media. Here are some recent headlines from the Huffington Post, which puffs up the value of sex and ensures it is always in our face. Are we adults? Apparently not. Adult now designates porn, violence, and arrested development. We are their goyim, cattle, after all. The elevation of young women to goddess status is more than sexual. Hollywood portrays them as warriors and geniuses as well. In Zero Dark Thirty, a 98-pound Jessica Chastain gets the credit for tracking down and killing Osama bin Laden. Even lesbians thought the movie was propaganda. But Illuminati filmmakers think portraying a falsehood as a truth is enough to make it so. As George Orwell observed, when everyone is deviant, sick, deviant becomes the new normal. The female focus is also reflected in the obsession with relationships, encouraging more woman worship and codependency. Relationships are a female preoccupation. None of this means the Illuminati give a damn about women. They are promoting them to feminize men and destabilize society. Conclusion Human beings are strange animals. If they are taught to seek sex instead of love, they believe sexual intercourse is mystical. But eventually, they will realize it was just infatuation and novelty. Sex, in the words of Andy Warhol, is the biggest nothing in the world, yet another Illuminati Jewish con. Nevertheless, society has been totally sexualized. 30% of all internet traffic is porn. In spite of 50 years of feminism, or because of it, women define their value in terms of sex appeal, just as homosexuals do. Society is saturated with sex which degrades all human relationships, including children, to the lowest common denominator. Popular culture increasingly is devoted to death, destruction, pornography, and the occult. We rarely see a positive and uplifting vision. We rarely feel good to be human. Because of the age-old Kabbalist, Masonic, Jewish hatred of other Jews, God and mankind, depravity, and occult fantasy pass as culture.
Progress and social change promote social degradation and disintegration. Freud's part in our satanic possession Shlomo Freud, a member of the Illuminati BNAI Brith, played a key role in mankind's induction into the Kabbalah sex cult. Psychiatry may have a subversive hidden agenda, hardly a surprise given its origins. Freud declined an invitation to travel saying, a wealthy woman client might get well during my absence. My mood depends very much on my earnings. Money is laughing gas for me. Sigmund Shlomo Freud's career illustrates how a satanic cult, the Illuminati, cast its morbid spell over humanity. The Illuminati sprung out of the Sabbatean Jewish heresy of the 17th century. Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, was a Sabbatean who sold his perverted Satanist beliefs to the world in the guise of science and medicine. The Illuminati-controlled media and education system hailed him as a great prophet. The Sabbateans were a sex cult that indulged in every sexual perversion imaginable as a way of spitting in God's eye. This is what Satanists do, incest, pedophilia, orgies, homosexuality, everything that is unnatural and unhealthy. Freud and his B'nai B'rith, Illuminati, backers convinced the world that sexual desire, libido, is the primary motivation of human life, and that sexual satisfaction is the universal panacea. He taught that repressing sexual urges is harmful and results in neuroses. He taught that males experience castration anxiety and females suffer penis envy. As an overture to incest and pedophilia, he taught that children have sexual feelings for their opposite-sexed parents and feel hostility to their same-sex parent. At the extreme, his Oedipus complex states that a boy subconsciously wants to kill his father and rape his mother. The philosopher Karl Popper said Freudian psychoanalysis is as devoid of scientific method as palm reading. Freud's Oedipus complex has absolutely no scientific basis. Typical of a Satanist, Freud denied man's spiritual dimension, our hunger for God exemplified by our spiritual ideals like harmony, love, truth and beauty. The Kabbalah teaches that God has no characteristics and is unknowable. Influenced by the Kabbalah, Freud taught that God is merely the projection of an imaginary father figure designed to make us repress our sexual urges. According to Wikipedia, Freud is considered one of the most prominent thinkers of the first half of the 20th century. In terms of originality and intellectual influence, learning from a Satanist after joining the Masonic Jewish B'nai B'rith in 1897, Freud's stillborn career began a meteoric rise. Psychology professor David Bakken describes Freudian psychoanalysis as derivative of the Lurianic Kabbalah and the Zohar. Lurianic Kabbalah is a 2nd century Gnostic formulation which was picked up by Jewish heretic Sabbatai Zevi. Sigmund Freud and the Jewish Mystical Tradition, Beacon Press, Boston 1958, Freud discussed Kabbalah with a rabbi Heim Block in 1920. The rabbi told Prof. Bakken that the two men argued when Freud proposed that Moses had been an Egyptian pharaoh, not a Jew. Freud stormed off, leaving the rabbi alone in his study. It was then that Block saw books on the shelves which identified Freud as a follower of Sabbatai Zevi, the Sabbatean founder. Freud thanked the members of B'nai B'rith Lodge for their support. Indeed, several members of the Lodge provided the initiating cadre who founded the quackery of psychoanalysis. According to E. Michael Jones, Freud's psychoanalytical association was structured as a secret society. Libido Dominandi p. 122, presumably, it had the same secret goals as the B'nai B'rith, to subvert, exploit, and enslave. Freud's letters revealed he regarded his clients as suckers. He compared himself to a lion in a cartoon he saw. 
The lion is checking his watch at feeding time and asks, where are my negroes? Freud said his patients were his negroes. Jones P. 116, Freud declined an invitation to travel saying, a wealthy woman client might get well during my absence. My mood depends very much on my earnings. Money is laughing gas for me, he wrote. 116, called the talking cure, psychoanalysis was a scam. As Michael Jones writes, for a fee, rich people received absolution for their guilty pleasures and permission to proceed. Jones believes psychoanalysis was based on the Illuminati initiatory ritual and is a form of mind control. Both were based on having the patient or adept give in-death, quasi-confessional examinations of conscience during which they told the Illuminist controller or psychotherapist details of their personal lives which could later be used against them. Both Illuminism and psychoanalysis ended up as covert forms of psychic control, whereby the controller learned of the adept's dominant passion and manipulated him accordingly. P.127 the bottom line is that psychiatrists, whether they know it or not, are part of this satanic secret society. The true Illuminati goal is to make people sick and take their money. This would explain why psychiatrists are putting millions of people, including children, on drugs. See also, the Soviet art of brainwashing. The secret society model may apply to the medical profession as a whole, as well as to other professions. Freud was a precursor of Alfred Kinsey, the pervert who killed himself trying to masturbate. Kinsey filled his famous Rockefeller-sponsored report with the behavior patterns of his fellow homosexuals. Thus, he convinced Americans that promiscuity and deviance were the norm. Similarly, Freud had an affair with his wife's sister, Minna Bernays, who got pregnant. His psychiatric theories about incest and sex were attempts to exonerate himself. Ironically, Adam Weishaupt, the Illuminati organizer, also got his sister-in-law pregnant. Freud went through a period where he was enamored by the salutary properties of cocaine. When some friends became addicted, he supposedly gave it up. However, Wikipedia reports, some critics have suggested that most of Freud's psychoanalytical theory was a byproduct of his cocaine use. Conclusion Sigmund Freud illustrates that modern culture is controlled by a satanic cult to degrade and enslave mankind. We have been duped by Satanists in the guise of science and medicine. Satanists promote sexual excess and deviance to enslave humanity. Anything goes, is the Satanist watchword. Freud gave society permission to go hog wild. Free sex tramples marriage and family, institutions necessary for social stability and health. It debases every human relationship to the lowest common denominator, sex. It presents sex and relationships as the single gateway to personal development and happiness. For the past 200 years, progress and enlightenment have been measured in terms of increased sexual license, until today we genuflect at the obscene antics of obese, naked gay pride paraders. This is progress in satanic terms. We are the victims of a diabolical multi-generational conspiracy which grows more brazen every day. Communist Blueprint The Frankfurt School were a group of Marxist Jewish intellectuals at Frankfurt University in the 1920-1930s. They emigrated to NYC after Hitler came to power. They included Max Horkheimer, Theodore W. Adorno, Herbert Marcuse and Eric Fromm, and were responsible for the new left and feminism. Financed by Jewish millionaire Felix Weil, they were instrumental in the degradation of Western society according to the long-term Kabbalist Jewish, Satanist, plan outlined in the Protocols of Zion. The connection between Communism and Judaism is the Kabbalah, i.e. Freemasonry. T. 
Timothy Matthews The Frankfurt School, Conspiracy to Corrupt, Catholic Insight, March 2009, demonstrates that Kabbalist, Masonic, Judaism is a satanic cult. First Jews, then Masons and now humanity as a whole has been inducted into this satanic cult, communism slash Zionism, whose aim is to pervert, enslave and exploit humanity. Editor's Note, I plan to repost basic articles because new people are now waking up to our true condition. The fact that corporations and media unashamedly promote the globalist, anti-white, anti-family agenda prove that we have succumbed to communism. But Gentile Freemason traders made it possible. See Macau what is communism? The witch hunt on today's campuses is merely the implementation of Marcuse's concept of repressive toleration, tolerance for movements from the left, but intolerance for movements from the right enforced by the students of the Frankfurt School. Basically, the task of the Frankfurt School was to undermine the Judeo Christian legacy. They called for the most negative destructive criticism possible of every sphere of life to destabilize society and destroy what they saw as the oppressive order. They hoped their policies would spread like a virus continuing the work of the Western Marxists by other means as one of their members noted. To further the advance of their quiet cultural revolution, the school recommended, among other things, 1. The creation of racism offenses. Two, continual change to create confusion. Three, the teaching of sex and homosexuality to children. For the undermining of schools and teachers' authority. Five, huge immigration to destroy identity. Six, the promotion of excessive drinking. Seven, emptying of churches. Eight, an unreliable legal system with bias against victims of crime. 9. Creating dependency on the state or state benefits. 10. Control and dumbing down of media. 11. Encouraging the breakdown of the family. One of the main ideas of the Frankfurt School was to exploit Freud's idea of pansexualism, the search for pleasure, the exploitation of the differences between the sexes, the overthrowing of traditional relationships between men and women. To further their aims, they would a. attack the authority of the father, deny the specific roles of father and mother, and wrest away from families their rights as primary educators of their children. b. abolish differences in the education of boys and girls c. abolish all forms of male dominance, hence the presence of women in the armed forces d. declare women to be an oppressed class and men as oppressors common turn propaganda chief, Wiley Munzenberg. Summed up the Frankfurt School's long-term operation thus, we will make the West so corrupt that it stinks. The school believed there were two types of revolution, a political and b cultural. Cultural revolution demolishes from within. Modern forms of subjection are marked by mildness. They saw it as a long-term project and kept their sights clearly focused on the family, education, media, sex and popular culture. The patriarchal family following Karl Marx, the school stressed how the authoritarian personality is a product of the patriarchal family it was Marx who wrote so disparagingly about the idea of the family being the basic unit of society. All this prepared the way for the warfare against the masculine gender promoted by Marcuse under the guise of women's liberation. They proposed transforming our culture into a female-dominated one. In 1933, Wilhelm Reich, one of their members, wrote in the mass psychology of fascism that matriarchy was the only genuine family type of natural society. Eric from left was also an active advocate of matriarchal theory. Masculinity and femininity, he claimed, were not reflections of essential sexual differences, as the Romantics had thought, but were derived instead from differences in life functions, which were in part socially determined. C. Boy Scouts abandoned their name. The revolutionaries knew exactly what they wanted to do and how to do it. 
They have succeeded. Education Lord Bertrand Russell joined with the Frankfurt School in their effort at mass social engineering and spilled the beans in his 1951 book, The Impact of Science on Society. He wrote, Physiology and psychology afford fields for scientific technique which still await development. The importance of mass psychology has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of propaganda. Of these the most influential is what is called education. The social psychologists of the future will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Russell said education will affirm, one, first, that the influence of home is obstructive. Two, second, that not much can be done unless indoctrination begins before the age of ten. Three, third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. Four, fourth, that the opinion that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for eccentricity. But I anticipate. It is for future scientists to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black, and how much less it would cost to make them believe it is dark gray. When the technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for a generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. Writing in 1992 in Fidelio magazine. The Frankfurt School and Political Correctness, Michael Minesino observed how the heirs of Marcuse and Adorno now completely dominate the universities, teaching their own students to replace reason with politically correct ritual exercises. There are very few theoretical books on arts, letters, or language which do not openly acknowledge their debt to the Frankfurt School. The witch hunt on today's campuses is merely the implementation of Marcuse's concept of repressive toleration, tolerance for movements from the left, but intolerance for movements from the right enforced by the students of the Frankfurt School. Music, TV and popular culture Theodore Adorno promoted the use of degenerate forms of music to promote mental illness and destroy society. He said the U.S. could be brought to its knees by the use of radio and television to promote a culture of pessimism and despair. By the late 1930s he, together with Max Horkheimer, had migrated to Hollywood. The expansion of violent video games also well supported the school's aims. Sex education in his book The Closing of the American Mind, Alan Bloom observed how Marcuse, left, appealed to university students in the 60s with a combination of Marx and Freud. In Eros and Civilization and One-Dimensional Man, Marcuse promised that the overcoming of capitalism and its false consciousness will result in a society where the greatest satisfactions are sexual. Rock music touches the same chord in the young. Free sexual expression, anarchism, mining of the irrational unconscious, and giving it free reign are what they have in common. In her booklet Sex and Social Engineering, Family Education Trust 1994, Valerie Riches observed how in the late 1960s and early 1970s, there were intensive parliamentary campaigns taking place emanating from a number of organizations in the field of birth control, i.e., contraception, abortion, sterilization. From an analysis of their annual reports, it became apparent that a comparatively small number of people were involved to a surprising degree in an array of pressure groups. This network was not only linked by personnel, but by funds, ideology, and sometimes addresses, it was also backed by vested interests and supported by grants in some cases by government departments. At the heart of the network was the Family Planning Association, FPA, with its own collection of offshoots. What we unearthed was a power structure with enormous influence. Deeper investigation revealed that the network in fact extended further afield, into eugenics, population control, birth control, sexual and family law reforms, sex and health education. Its tentacles reached out to publishing houses, medical, educational and research establishments, 
women's organizations and marriage guidance anywhere where influence could be exerted. It appeared to have great influence over the media and over permanent officials in relevant government departments, out of all proportion to the numbers involved. During our investigations, a speaker at a sex education symposium in Liverpool outlined tactics of sex education saying, if we do not get into sex education, children will simply follow the mores of their parents. The fact that sex education was to be the vehicle for peddlers of secular humanism soon became apparent. Root of current Mideast violence equals the Jewish Kabbalah root of current Mideast violence equals the Jewish Kabbalah plus Talmud plus, but the goal is world domination off the 99.8% non-Jews root of current Mideast violence equals the Jewish Kabbalah plus Talmud plus, but the goal is world domination off the 99.8% non Jews. The Jewish Kabbalah, root of Mideast violence define Kabbalah equals an occult theology and practice by the supremacist chosen Jews and their predestined domination of society. American conservatives equals assume Judaism is a benign religion of peace and tolerance fact, Judaism of the Talmud or Kabbalah equals sacred texts equals twisted and chilling and hate beliefs including mass murder of Christians, and non-Jews equals 116 million non-Jews were mass murdered in the Jewish Communist Revolution, and the two world wars plus 25 million more mass murdered since WW2 equals 141 million total non-Jew deaths. Equals Kabbalist, epitomized by ultra-Orthodox Herdim settlers in Israel, want extermination of the Gentile demon to restore order in the universe equals treat Gentiles like Satan himself. Kabbalists equals believe Gentiles, Zohar, are Amalekites who cause a primordial state of chaos, Tohu, and emptiness, Bohu, and cause the destruction of the temple, and when God reveals himself, they will be wiped off the earth and redemption will not be complete until Amalek will be exterminated. Equals Zohar I, Bereshith 47a, Sansino translation. This is the authoritative five-volume English edition of the Zohar translated by Maurice and Sperling. Believers in Kabbalah Talmud equals 80% of Haredi Jewish males equals devoted full-time to Talmudic and Kabbalistic studies equals militant Jewish rabbis plus most settlers equals homicidal hatred of Gentiles especially Palestinians plus sabotage any peace talks that interfere with Satan's will of driving all Arabs from. Palestine by whatever means necessary plus Kabbalah threatens peace, not only in the Middle East, but the world equals Jewish Kabbalah, root of Mideast violence Jewish Zionists equals Christian persecuting. Ultra-Orthodox Jews of Israel equals receive dollar millions via highly paid Christian Zionist pastor John Hadji Israel's Blitz of Lebanon, 2006. Equals made in America banners as Israelis used American F-16S plus cluster bombs plus weapons equals, but attack was created by the Talmudic Judaism of the semi-secret Kabbalah. Hytery of Jews equals Jews were carried to distant Babylon in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar equals found a god of nature, Ensof. With pervasive power everywhere who the ancient Jewish Pharisees of Babylon liked because this god didn't disapprove of their perversion of Jehovah's laws. Equals they created an elaborate secret theology for the Jews called Kabbalah. Equals at the time of Jesus, an assemblage of doctrines were carefully concealed from the multitude called the Kabbalah equals God beyond rational description was the most exalted. Rarified light that manifested on earth as divine Jewish people equals semi-divine rational, physical manifestations of God's presence in the universe equals indispensable people that allow the universe to exist. Equals they believe Gentiles, non Jews, are evil. Equals Jews have so far degenerated. Talmudic Jews believe Gentiles are demons or satanic creatures called Clifith or Gentiles. Equals Sepher or Israel, of Talmud recommends, take the life of the Klippeth and kill them, and you will please God the same as one who offers incense to him.
The Zohar equals five-volume repository of Kabbalistic lore, and mystic speculation equals explains, living soul refers to Israel who have holy living souls from above, and cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth to the other peoples who are not living soul. Plus the great tragedy of this world is Gentiles perpetually unsettle the higher levels with their evil imbalance, and must no longer exist to remove the disordered. Flimsy rationale for the Kabbalists' hatred of Gentiles equals Christ said, The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. John 16 2, Jews believe Gentiles equals the people of the earth are idolaters. And it has been written about them, let them be wiped off the face of the earth. Equals until the blessed day when the Gentiles are exterminated, the Zohar says, Israel must remain in a withered, blighted condition. This is because Gentiles, by the confusion they stir up in the lower levels, prevent the blessings of the Shekinah in the upper levels from adequately descending upon Israel, someday however. Things will be as they were meant and man, meaning Israel, will be given the preeminence he was created to enjoy. Then, says the Kabbalah, man should be unique and ruler over all. Equals Zohar I, Bereshith 47a. How will Israeli man conquer the world? Equals Rabbi Jehuda said, he is to be praised who is able to free himself from the enemies of Israel, by wise counsel thou shalt war against them. Proverbs 24 6. The kind of war that every son of man must war against his enemies. Which Jacob used against Esau by deceit and trickery wherever possible. They must be fought against without ceasing, until proper order be restored. Thus, it is with satisfaction that I say we should free ourselves from them, and rule over them. Equals World Domination Goal Equals Jews will control the planet through the the Holy One, Jewish Messiah, who will display his force and exterminate them, Gentiles, from the world. Plus the goyim their work is vanity, it is an illusion at which we must laugh, they will perish when God visits them in his wrath, and will exterminate all the goyim of the world. Israel alone will subsist even as it is written, the Lord alone will appear great on that day, solemn mission. It is certain that our captivity will last until the princes of the Gentiles who worship idols are destroyed. Equals Zohar, SEC. Vaishla Folio 177b Kabbalah recommends extermination of Gentiles as the highest religious duty. Kabbalist equals the Feast of Tabernacles is the period when Israel triumphs over the other peoples of the world, other people known as populace equals Zohar. Told off Noah, 63b. Kabbalah and modern Judaism equals Kabbalah inspired by God stands with the Talmud as the greatest legal authority of Judaism. Equals passages from the Zohar are read along with the Bible and Talmud as part of the worship service in synagogues every Saturday. Equals inspired Jewish writings plus the Zohar appeals to many Jews in a way that makes them regard it as the most sacred of sacred books because it mirrors Judaism as an intensely vital religion of the spirit. Equals more overpoweringly than the Bible as it gives to the Jew the conviction of an inner, unseen spiritual universe and eternal moral order. Equals the mystic side of Jewish life and religion full of mystic sentiment and emotion equals the aromatic life essence indispensable to Judaism. Kabbalah equals divinely inspired, like the Talmud, and proceeded from the very hub of Jewry the most eminent rabbis. Equals rabbis from Ben Zaki and Maimonides through Talmudists of the 16th through 18th centuries to the greatest rabbi in the world today. Rabbi Steinsaltz of Jerusalem equals all practitioners of Kabbalah, as the word of Jewish God, Lucifer. Kabbalah equals description of Gentiles as animals who must be slaughtered before order can be restored? Equals fundamental to how Kabbalah structures God, Israel, and the universe. Equals provides motivation for the racist laws, war crimes, and homicidal agenda of the state of Israel today. 
equals venerating Judaism is the official position of the Israeli government and Israeli military. Oddly 14 million conservative Christians are Zionists supporting this evil murderous Jewish religion. Equals but through Jewish brainwashing and funding a battery of dollar millionaire fake Christian ministers focuses these victims on the Quran and the inner teachings of Islam which these hired ministers demonize as Arab terrorists doing what the Jews are actually doing. Kabbalah Jews equals deviously force all Americans to fund Israelis mass murders of non-Jews equals 1.6 plus trillion dollars since 1972. Equals Americans are forced to fund the world's fourth greatest military superpower and Jews cry anti-Semitism. Whenever anyone suggests the end of that funding. Equals this threatens the safety of every non-Jew in America as 99.8 plus percent of the world's IS non-Jew and are aware of American support of murderous Israelis. Fact, the bombs the Israelis use are made in America but the evil genocide of the Jews is made in the Kabbalah plus Talmud. Dash, by Rev. Ted Pike September 9, 2010, November 6, 2015 by Concise Politics. The master race master race a term never used by the National Socialists, fact equals master race of Germans equals Rothschilds mafia made up lie equals demonizing the Germans who lost WW2 equals ingrandize the Jews plus justify Israel plus justify endless mafia wars to mass murder non-Jews and ROB their gold and other wealth and gain one world rule by the mafia. Equals Iraq plus Libya plus Syria plus 30 or more overthrows since WW2 time for a mass revolt against the Rothschilds mafia parasitic rule of the West. Equals the biggest mass revolt against those who are still ruling the world today and using the same technique of propaganda to justify their unjust mad wars. Equals Zionists who are controllers slash owners of Western media. Hollywood and Walt Disney equals rewrote history and created today's white supremacists plus neo-Nazis plus Israel National Socialist equals Germans called themselves or popular government of the working class equals not master race as invented by Rothschild's mafia chosen people equals Germans were not racists nor supremacists Germans equals created a national socialist movement to close the parasitic Rothschild private Jewish central bank in Germany and Stopping the Jewish Marxists of East Europe from destroying the culture, religion, and social values. Germans believed in equals masters in one's own house equals not subservient to any other country or group of countries. Jewish Talmudic supremacists equals wish to lord over everyone else, or the 99.803% NON Jews equals destroying national sovereignty and freedom time for the 99.805% of NONJEW humanity to wake up and end the thousands of Rothschilds mafia monopolies that suck the wealth of humanity for itself the Frankfurt. School and their evil agenda let's begin by considering the corrosive work of the Frankfurt School, a group of German-American scholars, mostly Jewish, who developed highly provocative and original perspectives on contemporary society and culture, drawing on Hegel, Marx, Freud, and Weber. Their idea of a cultural revolution was not particularly new. Joseph, Comte de Maister, 1753-1821, who for 15 years had been a Freemason, had this to say, until now, nations were killed by conquest, that is by invasion. But here an important question arises, can a nation not die on its own soil, without resettlement or invasion, by allowing the flies of decomposition to corrupt to the very core those original and constituent principles which make it what it is? What was the Frankfurt School? Well, in the days following the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, it was believed that a workers' revolution would sweep into Europe and, eventually, into the United States. It failed to do so. 
Towards the end of 1922, the Communist International, Comintern, began to consider the reasons for this failure. On Lenin's initiative, a meeting was organized at the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow. The aim of the meeting was to throw light on the meaning of Marx's cultural revolution. What did cultural revolution entail? What was it all about? First, among those present, was George Lukacs, a Jewish-Hungarian aristocrat and son of a banker. He had become a communist during World War I. A good Marxist theoretician, he had developed the idea of revolution and aerosexual instinct used as an instrument of destruction. Then there was Willy Munzenberg, another revolutionary Jew whose proposed solution to the problems besetting society was to organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western civilization stink. Only then, after they have corrupted all its values and made life impossible, can we impose the dictatorship of the proletariat. It was, said Ralph de Toledano, 1916-2007, the conservative author and co-founder of the National Review. A meaning more harmful to Western civilization than the Bolshevik Revolution itself. Lenin died in 1924, but by that time Stalin had risen to power and was beginning to look on Willy Munzenberg, George Lukacs and other Jewish revolutionaries, like Trotsky, as dangerous Marxist revisionists. Introducing concepts into Marxism that were alien to Marxism and which served only a Jewish agenda. In June 1940, on Stalin's orders, Munzenberg was hunted down to the south of France by a NKVD assassination squad and hanged from a tree. In the summer of 1924, after being attacked for his writings by the Fifth Comintern Congress, Lukacs moved to Germany. Here he chaired the first meeting of a group of communist-oriented sociologists. This gathering was to lead to the foundation of the Frankfurt School. This school, designed to put flesh on their revolutionary program, was started at the University of Frankfurt in the Institute für Sozialforschung. To begin with, school and institute were indistinguishable. In 1923, the institute had been officially established and funded by Felix Weil, 1898-1975. Weil, born in Argentina into a wealthy Jewish family, was sent to attend school in Germany at the age of nine. He attended the universities in Tübingen and Frankfurt, where he graduated with a doctoral degree in political science. While at these universities he became increasingly interested in socialism and Marxism. Karl Grunberg, the Institute's Jewish director from 1923 to 1929, was an avowed Marxist, although the Institute did not have any official party affiliations. But in 1930 Max Horkheimer, also Jewish, assumed control. He believed that Marx's theory should be the basis of the Institute's research. When Hitler came to power, the Institute was closed and its members, by various routes, fled to the United States and ended up as academics at major U.S. universities, Columbia, Princeton, Brandeis, and California at Berkeley. The fact that they spoke very poor English was no disqualification. They were Jewish, and so they managed to obtain prestigious academic appointments through Jewish influence, i.e., through networking a system that works exceptionally well even today, and which accounts for the huge and unfair preponderance of Jews in academia. The school included among its members the 1960s guru of the new left Herbert Marcuse denounced by Pope Paul VI for his theory of liberation which opens the way for, sexual, license cloaked as Liberty Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, the popular writer Eric from Leo Lowenthal, and Jürgen Habermas. All these individuals except Habermas were of Jewish origin. Basically, the Frankfurt School believed that as long as an individual had the belief or even the hope of belief that his divine gift of reason could solve the problems facing society. 
then that society would never reach the state of hopelessness and alienation that they considered necessary to provoke a socialist revolution. Their task, therefore, was as swiftly as possible to undermine the Judeo-Christian legacy. However, Judeo-Christian is an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, given that Judaism and Christianity are at opposite ends of the religious spectrum. Since most Jews are actively hostile to Christianity, and since Talmudic Jews actually take pleasure in the thought of Christ being boiled in excrement in hell, to speak of the Judeo-Christian legacy is clearly nonsensical. To undermine Western civilization, the Frankfurt School Jews called for the most negative and destructive criticism possible of every sphere of life. To destabilize society and bring it to its knees, to engineer collapse, to produce crisis and catastrophe this became the aim of these maladjusted and mentally sick Jewish revolutionaries masquerading as high-powered intellectuals. Their policies, they hoped, would spread like a virus continuing the work of the Western Marxists by other means, as one of their members noted. To further the advance of their quiet cultural revolution, the Frankfurt School made the following 12 recommendations all of them calculated to undermine the foundations of society and create the dystopia we now see all around us. 1. The creation of racism offenses and hate speech laws. 2. Continual change to create confusion, e.g. in school curricula. 3. Masturbation propaganda in schools, combined with the homosexualization of children, and their corruption by exposing them to child porn in the classroom. For the systematic undermining of parental and teachers' authority. 5. Huge immigration to destroy national identity and foment future race wars. 6. The systematic promotion of excessive drinking and recreational drugs. 7. The systematic promotion of sexual deviance in society. 8. An unreliable legal system with bias against the victims of crime. 9. Dependency on state benefits. 10. Control and dumbing down of media. 6. Jewish companies now control 96% of the world's media. LD. 11. Encouraging the breakdown of the family. 12. All-out attack on Christianity and the emptying of churches. In the Soviet Union, under Stalin and his communist Jews, the emptying of churches was accomplished by the simple expedient of burning the churches down thousands of them. Coincidentally, most of the twelve aims and objectives mentioned above were set out prominently in the pages of that alleged forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Jewish philosophers of the Frankfurt School, it seems, had been heavily influenced by the Protocols. They were clearly impressed by what they read there and decided to implement its recommendations in their own sinister agenda. One of the main ideas of the Frankfurt School was to exploit Freud's idea of pansexualism, the search for indiscriminate sexual pleasure, the promotion of unisex, the blurring of distinctions between the sexes, the overthrowing of traditional relationships between men and women, and, finally, the undermining of heterosexuality at the expense of homosexuality as, for example, in the idea of same-sex marriage and the adoption of children by homosexual couples. Willie Munzenberg summed up the Frankfurt School's long-term operation thus, we will make the West so corrupt that it stinks. Willie Munzenberg, Jewish revolutionary of the Frankfurt School we must organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western civilization stink. Only then, after they have corrupted all ITS values and made life impossible, can we impose the dictatorship of the proletariat. According to Sean McMeekin's The Red Millionaire, a political biography of Willie Munzenberg. Munzenberg was the perpetrator of some of the most colossal lies of the modern age. He helped unleash a plague of moral blindness upon the world from which we have still not recovered. The Frankfurt School believed there were two types of revolution, 
a political revolution and b cultural revolution. They were more concerned with cultural revolution, the demolition of the established order from within. Modern forms of subjection are marked by mildness, they taught. So-called reforms were to be made so slowly and subtly that these changes for the worse were barely perceptible. The school saw the undermining of the social order as a long-term project. The systematic erosion of Christian moral values and the promotion of sexual perversion is known as cultural Marxism. Today, thanks to the efforts of organized Jewry which controls 96% of the world's media, cultural Marxism has largely triumphed and Christianity lies in ruins. To many dispassionate observers, society has now reached its rock-bottom moral nadir as Jewish Marxists, such as Willy Munzenberg, see quote above, would have been only too happy to witness had he been around today. These iconoclasts kept their sights firmly fixed on the family, education, media, sex and popular culture. Each of these would be their target. If things did not go from bad to worse, year after year, they were not succeeding. To these revolutionary Jewish thinkers, bad was good and worse was better. Nahum Goldman lived his whole life as one of the top-level international Zionists. He was the president of the World Jewish Congress from 1947 to 1978. And in his 1915 book The Spirit of Militarism, page 37 to 38, he describes the Zionist method for destruction of Western civilization, which is required for transition into the new world order. The historical mission of our world revolution is to rearrange a new culture of humanity to replace the previous social system. This conversion and reorganization of global society requires two essential steps. Firstly, the destruction of the old established order. Secondly, design and imposition of the new order. The first stage requires elimination of all frontier borders, nationhood and culture, public policy ethical barriers and social definitions, only then can the destroyed old system elements be replaced by the imposed system elements of our new order. The first task of our world revolution is destruction. All social strata and social formations created by traditional society must be annihilated, individual men and women must be uprooted from their ancestral environment, torn out of their native milieus, no tradition of any type shall be permitted to remain as sacrosanct. Traditional social norms must only be viewed as a disease to be eradicated, the ruling dictum of the new order is, nothing is good so everything must be criticized and abolished everything that was, must be gone. The forces preserving traditional society are free market capitalism in the social-economic realm, and democracy in the mental-political realm. The capitalist free market does not fight against the old economic order, nor does democracy lead a fierce hot battle against the forces of reaction which oppose the new order, therefore our transformative work will be imposed through the unifying principle of the militaristic spirit. The negative task of destroying the old established order will be completely solved and finished only when the all the human masses are all forcibly collectivized as uniformed soldiers under imposed mass conformity of new order culturing. After destruction of the old order, construction of the new order is a larger and more difficult task. We will have torn out the old limbs from their ancient roots in deep layers, social norms will be lying disorganized and anarchic, so they must be blocked against new cultural forms and social categories naturally re-emerging. The general masses will have been first persuaded to join as equals in the first task of destroying their own traditional society and economic culture. But then the new order must be forcibly established through people again being divided and differentiated only in accordance with the new pyramidal hierarchical system of our imposed global monolithic new world order. The destruction of the family and the promotion of feminism the schools. Critical theory preached that the authoritarian personality was a product of the patriarchal family an idea directly linked to Engels' origins of the family, private property and the state, 
which promoted matriarchy. Already Karl Marx had written in the Communist Manifesto, 1848, about the radical notion of a community of women. In the German Ideology, 1845, he had written disparagingly about the idea of the family as the basic unit of society. This was one of the basic tenets of the critical theory, the need to break down the family unit. All families were essentially evil, these thinkers believed even happy families, so they had to be destroyed. It was better if children had no parents or did not know who their parents were. Or if they were orphans of the state. It was better if romantic love between the sexes, leading to stable long-term marriages, were destroyed in favor of short-term, unstable, promiscuous relationships. After all, the former might lead to happiness for all concerned, and that was clearly impermissible for the whole point of the Cultural Revolution was to create a culture of pessimism, luckux, and to make life impossible for everyone. Munzenberg George Luckex, 1885-1971 I want a culture of pessimism, a world abandoned by God The Institute scholars therefore preached that even a partial breakdown of parental authority in the family might tend to increase the readiness of a coming generation to accept social change. These neo-Freudian Marxist philosophers of The Frankfurt School were clearly out to create trouble, to drive a wedge between parent and child, and sow division in the family. Whatever was good in human relationships simply had to be destroyed. If people didn't have problems, then problems would have to be manufactured to make life impossible. Munzenberg All this prepared the way for the warfare against the masculine gender promoted by Marcuse under the guise of women's liberation and by the New Left movement in the 1960s. They proposed transforming our culture into a female-dominated one. The idea that women should run society and wear the trousers, telling men what to do, had an enormous appeal to certain bossy types of women with a surplus of testosterone, particularly to butch lesbians and man-hating matriarchs. Many of these misguided females were to become evangelists for radical feminism, some even proposing to cut themselves off from the male sex completely and live in communes of their own. Curiously enough, the number of Jewish feminists is huge out of all proportion to their percentage in the population. In 1933, Wilhelm Reich, an honored and adulated member of the Frankfurt School, wrote in the mass psychology of fascism that matriarchy was the only genuine family type of natural society. He was, as such, to be an inspiration to the feminists. Reich, incidentally, a compulsive masturbator and sexual pervert, had entertained incestuous longings for his own mother and practiced bestiality with horses while still a child. See here. This versatile sexual deviant, now a cult figure on the left, along with the equally sex-obsessed Herbert Marcuse popularizer of the slogan Make Love, Not War were to be godfathers of the sexual revolution of the 1960s as well as the patron saints of the feminist movement. The indoctrination of children through education Bertrand Russell was to join the Frankfurt School in their efforts at mass social engineering. He spilled the beans in his 1951 book, The Impact of Science on Society. He wrote, The social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Various results will soon be arrived at. First, that the influence of home is obstructive. Second, that not much can be done unless indoctrination begins before the age of 10. Third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. Fourth, that the opinion that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for eccentricity. But I anticipate. It is for future scientists to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black, 
and how much less it would cost to make them believe it is dark gray. When the technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for a generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. The irony is unmistakable, but that is beside the point. Russell was all for turning the world upside down and ushering in brave new world, atheism, feminism, and sexual liberation i.e., the green light to promiscuity, perversion, and abortion on demand. The devaluation of values so sought after by the luminaries of the Frankfurt School has now largely been achieved through sex education and media propaganda, in particular by the promotion of masturbation, pornography, and the systematic high-pressure salesmanship of homosexuality in schools. This, then, is the secret agenda of organized Jewry as represented by the cultural Marxists of the Frankfurt School, the destruction of traditional values, the destruction of the moral order, the destruction of the family unit, the destruction of religion, the destruction of meaning and purpose, and, finally, the destruction of happiness itself. These are the people who now rule over us. They are in control. They create new wars with the same rapidity that a stage magician pulls rabbits from a hat. And they make sure that the people they rule over, their subject populations, are either demoralized debt slaves in insecure jobs or unemployed bums living on state benefits and a diet of junk food and sleazy junk entertainment laid on by the Jews. Satan's secret agents have been only too successful in creating a new world order that bears a remarkable resemblance to hell. American historian Edwin Schoonmaker writes, 15 years after the Bolshevist revolution was launched to carry out the Marxist program, the editor of the American Hebrew could write, according to such information that the writer could secure, while in Russia a few weeks ago. Not one Jewish synagogue has been torn down as have hundreds perhaps thousands of the Greek Catholic churches. In Moscow and other large cities one can see Christian churches in the process of destruction. The government needs the location for a large building, American Hebrew, November 18, 1932 p. 12, apostate Jews, leading a revolution that was to destroy religion, as the opiate of the people had somehow spared the synagogues of Russia. Democracy and World Dominion, 1939, p.211. Wikipedia tells us that the communist state after the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution was committed to the destruction of religion and destroyed churches, mosques and temples no mention of synagogues being destroyed and that it ridiculed, harassed and executed Christian religious leaders. Flooding the schools and media with atheistic propaganda. Since the Russian Revolution was essentially a Jewish revolution, with an overwhelmingly high percentage of its leaders being Jewish, one can understand why synagogues were not destroyed. The animosity of the Jewish leadership was directed almost exclusively toward the Christian clergy and their churches. Monks, nuns and priests were put to death in large numbers, often after being cruelly tortured in the process their eyes gouged out, and in some instances being boiled alive. For graphic details of the systematic torture of Christians under the Bolsheviks, see here in Section 7, Fiendish Tortures Devised by the Jewish Chaika here. According to The Atlantic, September 1991, p.14, in 1919, three-quarters of the Chaika staff in Kiev were Jews, who were careful to spare fellow Jews. Russian-born Jewish writer Sonia Margolina goes so far as to call the Jewish role in supporting the Bolshevik regime the historic sin of the Jews. She points, for example, to the prominent role of Jews as commandants of Soviet gulag concentration and labor camps. And the role of Jewish communists in the systematic destruction of Russian churches. Moreover, she goes on, the Jews of the entire world supported Soviet power and remained silent in the face of any criticism from the opposition. In light of this record, Margolina offers a grim prediction. 
the exaggeratedly enthusiastic participation of the Jewish Bolsheviks in the subjugation and destruction of Russia is a sin that will be avenged. Soviet power will be equated with Jewish power, and the furious hatred against the Bolsheviks will become hatred against Jews. Cited here. Main Camp, What Was Hitler's Struggle Really About? 1938 News Reports confirms international Jewish banker financial war aims, jury, faced with persecution in Poland, Romania, Germany, Austria, and elsewhere, intends to hit back, says the Sunday Chronicle, according to a cable dated London, January 2. The battle will be fought on the world's stock exchanges. Most of the anti-Semitic states are burdened with debts, and they may find their very existence threatened. The leaders of international jury will meet in a village near Geneva this week to plan a fund of £500,000 with which to fight the persecutors of Jewish financiers in all parts of the world. No difficulty is expected in raising such a fund, which, combined with a trade boycott, will enable the launching a counter-offensive, in which the Jewish persecutors may be defeated. Dash, source, The Worker, Brisbane, QLD, Tuesday, January 4, 1938, http://nla.gov.au/anela.news-article 71357095 Now we know who international jury, aka Judea, really is by their own admission. We can also see that their financial war had nothing to do with alleged discrimination or persecution of average Jews in Germany or other nations. It was persecution of Jewish financiers that they were concerned with. This is the same gang that declared war on Germany in 1933 when the National Socialists first came to power. Why? Because Hitler and NSDAP opposed predatory Jewish international free market capitalism as a very destructive force, and also opposed Jewish-backed international Marxist Bolshevik communism, which are two sides of the same coin. Hitler defeated the communists in Germany, kicked out the bankster gangsters, created a new carefully controlled currency tied directly to labor, and he placed tight controls on prices and wages as well as on the stock markets to keep prices from being manipulated by international market speculators. As such, Germany's currency was not part of their worldwide usury system, and they could not speculate against Germany's Reichsmark on the financial markets. National Socialist Germany, in particular, was managing just fine without these international bankster gangsters and their monopoly game, which controlled the central banks of the Western nations and the issuance of fiat currencies, loaned out at interest usury, by which they have always driven nations into debt and servitude. Yet they say, anti-Semitic states are burdened with debts. Very interesting. With respect to the new Germany, that was a big lie. It seems, however, that by their own definition, an anti-Semitic state is one which does not play ball with them, and it has nothing to do with concern for the lesser Jews as generally thought. It was the Western nations which were still saddled with World War I debt, and were not paying it, in fact, they are still paying for that today in 2014. Unlike the Soviet Union, following the Russian Revolution, NS Germany never repudiated her World War I debt and was making good on it. What Germany did not have was gold reserves. Those were stolen by the World War I allies. More on that later. But it begs the question, why could the allies not pay off their own war debts? Who were they in debt to? Of course, the same self-described Jewish international financiers, who had the power to create currency and lend it to nations at interest, and control over their debts, and to exert great influence on the stock markets. Obviously, those nations' leaders were mere puppets and their foreign policies were catered to the bankers' needs or wishes, and the same holds true today. Not so with NS Germany. 
but notice that they include Poland and Romania here, as well as Austria. Why? Romania was not allied with Germany at this time. She was neutral. Poland was not allied with Germany either, but they did have a friendship pact that was signed by Hitler and the late Marshal Pilsudski. Moreover, Poland was riddled with inner ethnic strife and labor problems resulting from poor low wages and working conditions, not to mention unresolved border issues. Her products and raw materials such as coal were subject to the international market speculation. How better to stir up the Poles, who were neither national socialist nor fascist, and therefore, under the financial influence of the bankster gangsters, than to threaten them with boycotts and financial ruin, and to drive down prices? Or perhaps, on the other hand, to dangle carrots of incentives in front of them, if they sided with England, and again, turned hostile towards Germany and the ethnic German minority in their country. Romania too was a basket case with sizable ethnic minorities, ethnic strife and border disputes with her neighbors, as well as, much coveted natural resources, especially oil. No doubt King Carol too was also ripe for financial blackmail, to keep Romania neutral, i.e. not side with Germany or trade with her. Austria? Since end of World War II, the Austrian people had desired to rejoin the German Reich, and even more so as Germany began to prosper under Hitler and National Socialism, while they themselves languished in debt and poverty. But the World War I allies forbade the merger. Austrian leader Engelbert Dollfuss also vehemently opposed it, especially after Hitler came to power in 1933. Austria too was a political and economic basket case. Dollfuss eventually dissolved parliament and became dictator. He was conservative, anti-communist, and tried to model himself and his government on Mussolini's fascism, but he was assassinated in 1934. His successor followed largely in the same model. That would not have pleased the bankster gangsters. Unlike in Italy and Germany, the Rothschilds were still doing business in Austria and would naturally have been more opposed to a merger with the German Reich and the expanded influence of National Socialism. Indeed, after Austria voted to join the Reich, the Rothschild Bank in Vienna was closed with all of its assets seized by the Reich government, as I have previously noted in an older post. It should be easy to see that virtually all of Germany's neighbors would have been subject to the same degree of heavy-handed financial influence, and as such, whatever neutrality they declared or peace agreements they came to with Germany, or foreign policy they espoused, they could easily be brought to heel and to cooperate in some way, by those who controlled their money and their debt, and the markets, and who also had such great sums of money at their disposal with which to bribe the leaders. Far-fetched? Conspiracy theory? This came to light just a few years ago, MI6 spent $200 million bribing Spaniards in Second World War. Newly released documents reveal secret services paid out fortune in bid to stop Franco joining war on Hitler's side. MI6 spent the present-day equivalent of more than $200 million bribing senior Spanish military officers, ship owners and other agents to keep Spain out of the Second World War, files released today disclose. More and more money was delivered, mainly via a Swiss bank account in New York, as Sir Samuel Hoare, Britain's ambassador in Madrid, warned London that unless it was paid, there was a real and immediate danger of Spain abandoning its neutrality and of Franco joining forces with Nazi Germany. Hitler was extremely disappointed by the lack of Spanish support or meager support. Franco owed Germany. It could have made a huge difference to the defense of Europe. Now we know why it was not forthcoming. So did international jury come up with the 500 million pounds which they would have no difficulty raising, and what did they do with it? 
Now I think we have a pretty good idea. My guess is that a lot more went into international anti-Nazi hate propaganda, funding various subversive groups in Germany, inciting anti-German hatred in Poland, as well as bribing or blackmailing other nations, and funding the Soviets. Why didn't these international Jews put their 500 million pounds into helping those off-sighted, pre-war, 6 million poor persecuted Eastern Jews in Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Romania, and elsewhere to immigrate to Palestine, hum. I will let you the reader think about it, and make up your own mind on that. Why did they not put into creating much needed employment in the UK and USA? The answer should be clear, that they do not give a rat's ass about anyone but themselves and their financial interests, and that is what was at risk why they wanted war and did everything in their power to destroy and enslave Germany, permanently. Moreover, it was also to set a precedent for future wars. That is what is really going on when they call a nation anti-Semitic, or when they say, in regard to some nation's leader who is bucking the system, he's another Hitler. I was going to end there, but please bear with me. Let's play follow the money. Interestingly, in July of 1939, the Bank of England, the Rothschilds, tucked away gold in the same amount of 500 million pounds in preparation for war with Germany. British Secret Gold Vault 1939 Secret Vault for 500 million pounds Governors of the Bank of England have drawn up plans for transporting 500 million pounds of the nation's gold reserve to a secret vault in the country in the event of war. This vault is hundreds of miles from London and comprises a bomb-proof safe deposit. The convoy will be escorted by an armed guard of both police and soldiers. The gold represents Britain's staying power the basis on which war loans might be raised, and the purchasing power which will ensure supplies of food and raw materials from overseas. As I alluded to earlier, Germany had NO gold and was not part of the international bankster gangsters monopoly game. Hitler did not and could not print money at will as the whole financial and economic system would have quickly unraveled. Germany did not have access to international loans from London and New York for the purposes of war. Indeed, international Jewry was telling us that Hitler opposed them. So obviously he was not a tool of the Rothschilds, nor a Jew, as so many disinfo agents and their moron followers have claimed, and which I have previously debunked. The facts are, Germany did not want war, nor could afford another long war, much less wars of conquest. Germany had a military that was numerically far inferior to France, Poland, Russia and the UK. Germany was being boycotted by the USA and many other countries, had no colonies from which to extract resources, only limited trade opportunities which were conducted through barter, and few sources for raw materials needed for industry and military purposes. The international bankster gangster, self-described international jury, also deplored that barter system, as it cut them out. So, have we figured out who this war was for yet, who financed it, and who benefited? And if anyone thinks that it was just Germany, Italy and Japan who lost, they could not be more wrong. The lesson of WW2 is quite clear oppose Jewish banking, and you will be slandered, maligned, and demonized by the Jewish media until the world aligns together to destroy you. Hitler and NSDAP opposed and exposed predatory Jewish international free market capitalism as a very destructive force, and also opposed Jewish-backed international Marxist Bolshevik communism, which are two sides of the same coin. With the unparalleled prosperity of Hitler's Germany, the international Rothschilds banking industry saw to it that Hitler was destroyed. One can never ask the question why did Germany rise up to oppose the Jews? Without first asking the question. What did the Jews do to Germany to draw such fire upon them? Ultimately, what happened in Hitler's Germany was not a fight between Hitler and the Jews. 
It was a fight between Hitler and Jewish banking and depraved Jewish cultural Marxist influences in Germany. With Hitler losing World War II, the world was now officially under the slavery of Jewish international banking and finance. Chapter 2 CERN and the Beast System CERN gets its name from Cernunnos which is Abaddon, both a place of destruction and an angel of the abyss, Lucifer, and Shiva the Destroyer. No wonder they have a statue of Shiva right outside of CERN. CERN and Black Rain and Black Goo CERN has been playing a video which is styled as a documentary short. In it, we look at the origins of Black Rain and why CERN is playing a movie about this. I believe Black Rain of Black Goo is the substance of the abyss, and this video is, again, reinforcing the agenda behind CERN. The abyss is a real place and according to the books of Revelation and Enoch, there are creatures who are living in this place. Revelation calls them locusts with human faces and large, horse-like bodies, while Enoch describes them as watchers who committed sin against the daughters of men, fornication. They were placed in a pit to be held until the time of their release upon the earth for the purpose of judgment. We have to remember, not all CERN scientists understand exactly what they are doing at the LHC. Some of these scientists believe they are looking for something called the cosmic tree, which is an ornate map of light matter and dark matter found in parallel dimensions. However, I believe these scientists are only being used to create this machine and run its tests, which will open a portal. The elites behind CERN and its financing know exactly what is going to happen. Black Rain slash Goo describes an infection that entered into humanity through humanity and passed through generations. Interestingly, the term Black Rain was coined in WW2 to describe nuclear devastation and the effects it has on the human body. We see Black Rain slash Goo symbolism used in Hollywood propaganda. For example, the apple in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was dipped in this substance. We also see Lady Gaga entering into the abyss where she bathes in the black rain. Once she is drowned in it, she emerges with a crown on her head, an obvious reference to Abaddon, the king of the abyss. You'll also notice in Lady Gaga's commercial that she's among giant men wearing red capes. These Nephilim are at least 10 feet tall in height. She is portraying the agenda of the abyss and that is to be released upon the earth. Reflections on Veil Ripping CERN Particle Acceleration Destruction, Higgs Potential has the worrisome feature that it might become metastable at energies above 100 billion gigaelectronvolts, GeV. This could mean that the universe could undergo catastrophic vacuum decay, with a bubble of the true vacuum expanding at the speed of light. The Large Hadron Collider may well be the modern-day equivalent of the Tower of Babel. And for those unfamiliar with the story, it didn't end well for the hubris-filled men who sought to touch the face of God then, and it's unlikely to end well now. They worship Shiva at CERN. What does this have to do with particle acceleration? Nothing, until you realize they want to rip and destroy the very fabric of time-space. Lord of the Dance Destroyer of Worlds Luciferians hate God. They hate His creation. They hate beauty. And they hate humanity because we were created in God's image. CERN is merely another way to depopulate the world through massive quantum annihilation. They are not looking for particles. That is bullshit. CERN is where everything dovetails together AI digital antichrist interdimensional evil omega point singularity interdimensional time travel gnostic quantum mysticism. Techno-autocratic tyranny occult alchemy the reconfiguration of reality transmutation of the religiotechnium hierarchy. Think of CERN as a stargate, opening a portal in space-time, to access interdimensional evil. 
they will say they have contacted aliens. But it will be nothing other than ripping the veil to allow demonic entities usher forth. When the awake, love the name, project came online they were talking about ridiculous levels of PEV. No wonder the lunatics fried the instrument. However short the portal opened, something may have come through. Demonic entities will be presented to us as our benevolent alien saviors. CERN is tearing the veil to let these entities through and D-Wave quantum computers are the facility which will reconstitute their DNA. The battle is on. The Artelect War has begun a fantastic book called, The Artelect War, Cosmists vs. Terrans, a bitter controversy concerning whether humanity should build godlike massively intelligent machines, by Hugo de Garris, talks about the advancement of the beast system in the form of artificial intelligence, which CERN is definitely connected to. From the book's Amazon review, this book's main idea is that this century's global politics will be dominated by the species dominance issue. 21st century technologies will enable the building of artilects, artificial intellects, artificial intelligences, massively intelligent machines, with 1040 components, using reversible, heatless, 3D, molecular scale, self-assembling, 1-bit per atom, nanotechid, quantum computers, which may dwarf human intelligence levels by a factor of trillions of trillions and more. The question that will dominate global politics this century will be whether humanity should or should not build these artilects. Those in favor of building them are called cosmists in this book, due to their cosmic perspective. Those opposed to building them are called Terrans, as in Terra, the Earth, which is their perspective. The cosmists will want to build artilects, amongst other reasons, because to them it will be a religion, a scientist's religion that is compatible with modern scientific knowledge. The cosmists will feel that humanity has a duty to serve as the stepping stone towards building the next dominant rung of the evolutionary ladder. Not to do so would be a tragedy on a cosmic scale to them. The cosmists will claim that stopping such an advance will be counter to human nature, since human beings have always striven to extend their boundaries. Another cosmist argument is that once the artificial brain-based computer market dominates the world economy, economic and political forces in favor of building advanced artilects will be almost unstoppable. The cosmists will include some of the most powerful, the richest, and the most brilliant of the Earth citizens, who will devote their enormous abilities to seeing that the artilects get built. A similar argument applies to the military and its use of intelligent weaponry. Neither the commercial nor the military sectors will be willing to give up artilect research unless they are subjected to extreme Terran pressure. To the Terrans, building artilects will mean taking the risk that the latter may one day decide to exterminate human beings, either deliberately or through indifference. The only certain way to avoid such a risk is not to build them in the first place. The Terrans will argue that human beings will fear the rise of increasingly intelligent machines and their alien differences. To build artilects will require an evolutionary engineering approach. The resulting complexities of the evolved structures that underlie the artilects will be too great for human beings to be able to predict the behaviors and attitudes of the artilects towards human beings. The Terrans will be prepared to destroy the Cosmists, even on a distant Cosmist colony, if the Cosmists go ahead with an advanced artilect building program. In the short to middle term, say the next 50 years or so, the artificial brain-based industries will flourish, providing products that are very useful and very popular with the public, such as teacher robots, conversation robots, household cleaner robots, etc. In time, the world economy will be based on such products. Any attempt to stop the development of increasingly intelligent artilects will be very difficult, 
because the economic and political motivation to continue building them will be very strong in certain circles. If the brain-based computer industries were to stop their research and development into Artelex, then many powerful individuals, including the Artelect company presidents and certain politicians will lose big money and political influence. They will not give up their status without a fight. However, as the intelligence levels of the early Artelex increases, it will become obvious to everyone that the intelligence gap between these artificial brain-based products and human beings is narrowing. This will create a growing public anxiety. Eventually, some nasty incident or series of incidents will galvanize most of society against further increase of artificial intelligence in the Artelex, leading to the establishment of a global ban on Artelect research. The cosmists, however, will oppose a ban on the development of more intelligent Artelex and will probably go underground. If the incidents continue and are negative enough, the anger and hatred of the Terrans towards the Cosmists will increase to the point where the Cosmists may decide that their fate is to leave the Earth, an option that is quite realistic with 21st century technology. Within their fantasy outer space religion since the Cosmists will include some of the most brilliant and economically powerful people on the planet, they will probably create an elite conspiratorial organization whose aim is to build Artelex secretly. The book presents a scenario in which the Cosmists create an asteroid-based colony, masked by some innocuous activity. In reality, this secret society devises a weapon system superior to the best on the Earth. With their wealth and the best human brains, this may be achievable. They will also start making advanced artelects. If the Terrans on the Earth discover the true intentions of the Cosmists, they will probably want to destroy them, but not dare to because of the counter threat of the Cosmists with their more advanced weapons. The stage is thus set for a major 21st century war in which billions of people die, Gigadeth. This horrific number is derived from an extrapolation up the graph of the number of deaths in major wars from the beginning of the 19th century to the end of the 21st century. Approximately 200 million people died in the 20th century, for political reasons dash, wars, purges, genocides, etc. The profound schizophrenia that the author feels on the cosmist slash Terran species dominance issue will be felt by millions of people within a few years he expects. There is probably cosmist and Terran in nearly all of us, which may explain why this issue is so divisive. The author is simply one of the first to feel this schizophrenia. Within a decade it may be all over the planet. The last chapter of the book closes with a repetition of a pithy slogan that summarizes the two main viewpoints in the Artelect debate in a nutshell, a debate that the author believes will be raging in the coming decades. Do we build gods, or do we build our potential exterminators? Chapter 3 the East seduces the West neo-paganism versus the Gnostic temptation neo-paganism represents a challenge to the Gnosticism of much of contemporary Western and Eastern religion. The Gnostic temptation refers to a tendency in religious thought toward denying the goodness, or even the reality, of physical existence. Michael York explains that most world religions have a transcendental or Gnostic bias, by which he means that they see the material world as an illusion or as having less value than the spiritual world. In much of Christianity, for example, physical reality is seen something fallen from which we need to be redeemed. In contrast, in the neo-pagan understanding, the spiritual is intertwined with the physical. Divinity is more imminent than transcendent pantheism. To the extent the neo-pagan divinity is transcendent, it is a lateral transcendence, rather than a vertical one, the divine encompasses physical reality, panentheism, rather than being separate from it. The Gnostic temptation in Christianity is expressed as the condemnation the body, sex, and the material world as the kingdom of the devil. 
Christians seek to escape this world either returning to an Edenic state of atonement or re ascending of the ladder of being to a heavenly realm. The Gnostic temptation in Eastern religions is expressed in the view of physical reality as a mask or a veil concealing the divine reality behind it. In many Eastern religions, the body is seen as a prison for our spirits. Neopaganism, in contrast, has a this-worldly focus. For neo-pagans, this world is real, not illusory. Nor is it fallen. Neo-pagans do not seek to escape or transcend the world, but rather seek to deepen their experience of it. Neo-pagans are skeptical of spiritual abstraction or otherworldliness. While some pagans believe in reincarnation, they embrace rebirth and celebrate the great round of nature, unlike the Eastern religions in which the wheel of reincarnation is something to be escaped from. As Graham Harvey has observed, the Gnostic temptation does sometimes find its way into neo-pagan discourse too. This is due, in part to the influence of Western esotericism on Wicca, and through Wicca on neo-paganism. This can be seen most readily in ritual forms, like the casting of a ritual circle, which seem to separate participants from their physical environment, rather than reconnect them with it. Another source of the Gnostic temptation in neo-paganism is the New Age, which is sometimes conflated with neo-paganism. In contrast to neo-paganism, the New Age looks to spirit rather than earth and denigrates matter and darkness. Reflections on Neo-Paganism and the New Age A revitalization of pantheistic Gnosticism and false inner transcendence The New Age pantheism is a philosophy where all reality is said to emanate from the source, as they call it. In the words of Max Planck, Eastern European mystic who was a founder of quantum physics, as a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about atoms this much, there is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Max Planck Max Planck among other Eastern European quantum physics pioneers, essentially derived their quantum ideologies from Kabbalah and other core hermetic occultism. Essentially, we have all been indoctrinated into Kabbalah, but told that it was quantum physics, astrophysics, and science, so we never knew it was happening. The occult strategy is to lead you into ever more sinuous and delectable chambers of the mind, so you will forever be reflecting on fantasies and ephemeral domains and false sanctuaries. And a major strategy of the occult alchemists was to fractalize the world by perpetuating an atomistic view of reality, where a brilliant array of pixelated quantum probabilities creates a radiance of holographic substrates. The entire Luciferian dream of ascension, of apotheosis, of literally becoming God was fully embedded all along, and not by accident, deep within the very fabric of Copernican heliocentric cosmology. Essentially, one goal of the Luciferian transhumanists is to literally live forever though the occult-based genetic and overtly digital technologies for transcending time and space itself. Or one could say that outer space is an archetypal representation of death and afterlife. There is an intentional continuity to outer space and occult realms of consciousness. Essentially, outer space is simply a metaphysical construct which exists to represent occult mental geographies and states of consciousness. This is why outer space is often used to depict astral travel and dream states. When a false man-centered conception of reality has been projected into the mind, it makes little difference whether it happens under the guise of materialistic heliocentric cosmology or the guise of a homogeneously isotropic New Age mysticism. Both lack God on high. 
Thanks to Kabbalistic-based quantum mystical ideologies, religion and science have become intertwined, and now religious language and scientific language are seamlessly interchangeable. Again, this was all an intentionally plan to advance Easter mysticism forward through the Trojan horse of science. Space was posited as a spiritual allegory for the mystical realms. We have become obsessed with a kind of ontological revolution to comprehend quantum dimension outer space mysticism. We are being indoctrinated by Hollywood sci-fi and modern science to embrace occultism as wholly entrancing and desirable. It is a re-emergence of occultism in the form of science, and Lucifer knew, all along, that by transitioning out of a purely occultic alchemy into science, the world would embrace a more satanic, neo-pagan, consciousness-based model of reality, as opposed to a Christian and moral paradigm. Mystical outer space and the fabrication of astrophysics and quantum physics was a Jesuit plan to hijack the world with their scientism religion called modern science. It is all fantasy and fake. Outer space has never been visited by man. Astrophysics is just an occult religion. The networking through the internet of all things will be a hive mind overthrow of man. And ultimately, an interplanetary intergalactic hive mind is the Luciferian apotheosis slave dream. It is the idolatry aspect of the creation rather than the creator that we need be concerned with, not in knowing the innermost workings of secret knowledge. It all leads to Luciferian seduction anyway. Again, idolatry of necromancy. In the new age, you must embrace all the eastern mystical religions, and all the quantum mystical implications of transcendent DMT and entheogen experiences, of New Age spiritualism, and deny the authority of Christ, or you will be killed. It is that serious. Inner transcendence is the gospel of occultism, it is seductive and all-absorbing and rips you away from any loyalty to God, in preference for the inner self-exploration of Luciferian states of consciousness. The ascendancy of the state, where through dominionism, the state is equated with apotheosis, and social political utopianism in a neo-gnostic character to establish a reign of gods on earth independent of the christian god historically certain organizations such as the british royal society became epistemological cartels which established the boundaries and arbitrary limitations as to what was allowed to be true and not true through these epistemological cartels Occultists were able to use an anthropocentric epistemology to endorse a metaphysical claim to biogenesis and the disallowance or necessity of a god. Making man the measure of all things. Social political utopians have created multiple secular technocracies where a scientific dictatorship would govern all people. Brave New World would be a prime example. This epistemology of radical empiricism, where all knowledge is derived from the five senses as the only rational option to the supposed superstition of mystical faith, is a circumstantial juxtaposition which is merely the temporal succession of spatial proximity and cannot be said to be truth. It is a military model of efficiency in this secular technocratic model. By reducing the body to chemical reactions and purely physiological mechanism, the epistemological autocracy were able to position themselves as sovereign abductors of society and man's destiny. They excised spirit out of the equation by emphasizing a physiological interpretation of reality, reinforcing a radical empiricism and extinguishing the more conjectural components found in the intuitive paradigms of religion. Within the ontological confines of the physical universe model, the veneration for Gnosis is exalted above and beyond the pistis, faith, of traditional Christianity. The Masonic Darwinian Dominionistic Cult Cartel was a direct result of such an epistemological autocracy. The neo-scholastic autocracy that has arisen out of decades of secular humanistic scientism was the end result of the British Royal Society. 
Scientism, with its preoccupation with quantifiable certainties and non-spiritual conclusions, became the scientific dictatorship of today. In the androgynous world order, feminism, the LGBT movement, and the abolition of gender. The Gnostic origins of feminism and other radical movements push for so-called LGBT rights to push the new world order as part of a depopulation agenda with the end goal being the imposition of a global feudalistic tyranny. And so, let it be clear, the mystery Babylon schools are resurfacing on the earth in the form of modern science, with its artificial intelligence, quantum mysticism, digital probabilistic simulation and holographic theory and matrix consciousness paradigms. We have all been indoctrinated into this occult Babylonian hermetic autocracy, all of us. An atomistic pantheistic neo-pagan monism drives it all, to rejoin with the one, that ancient Babylonian and Vedic occult apotheosis dream. The Antichrist, New Age Oneness Mystery School with its unity consciousness through transcension panpsychism. In neo-paganism, they worship the creature, themselves, rather than the creator. Asterisk then you should know that all of these intrigues are nothing more than the dog and pony show, very lowest level of awareness as to what is actually moving and guiding world events. I strongly urge everyone I talk to not to waste any time hunting down leads to such chicanery. In fact, the entire political theater can be sidestepped entirely, and you will have missed nothing. It is all veneer, subterfuge, deflection and distraction, as you said, at that level. The alternative right has become now the mainstream and everyone has been tricked, yet again, about who and what to focus on. The Las Vegas shooting, like most of them, is merely another CIA psyop, with paid crisis actors and shill media to push the drama with whatever international banker elite manufactured agenda that has been scripted for them to parrot. Gradually, putting the puzzle pieces together, now, in this way, the new age came through the back door of our acceptance of this new pantheistic quantum mystical sub-particulate Planck-scale materialism, which again, is nothing other than repackaged alchemical Luciferian occultism. I am seeking truth just like anyone else, I claim no divine authority nor even divine inspiration. I am merely an investigator putting all these extremely sinuous and intricate puzzle pieces together into a mosaic with my set of skills for research and writing. I consider myself a metaphysical new reporter, merely piecing the facts as I see them into some intelligible pattern that evokes deeper sublime realities and truths and always acutely aware of the limitations of linguistic syntax, and language in general. To capture the ineffable and inscrutable truth of things. There is an intentionally Luciferian occult manufactured mesmerism in people being afraid to question or break out of the trance, a soporific complacency brought on by relentless cognitive dissonance and high-tech enchantments. I touch on this in my book, and we are definitely being seduced by Elite Luciferian schemata to accept a digital virtual reality, simulation existence, where we forfeit free will in exchange for some fantasized digital Elysium. I am seeing that, regardless of authoritative ancient text, historical or scriptural analysis, the current agenda to follow certain ancient themes is blatantly obvious in today's world. It is like investigating whether the synagogue of Satan wrote that the synagogue of Satan is the problem in the Bible, or whether holy scribes actually wrote it. It is irrelevant because the agenda set forth there is being followed as a blueprint, regardless. After exploring all those hyperspaces and interdimensional tabernacles of the mind, the endimethyltryptamine chrysanthemum, sanctuaries of the soul, myself, I would say that it is merely all more Luciferian deception enslavement, candy-coated with quantum mystical pantheism. As a New Age new sphere love and unity carrot. The Luciferian search for secret knowledge to manifest apotheosis and become God has as its grand attractor a final eschaton. Through its teleological outcome, it led to the creation of the Internet, 
connecting all things into a pantheistic Luciferian hive mind 5G grid, digital technocratic satanic autocracy with Lucifer in full control. And the do as thou wilt is the law of Thelema, and was really pushed by Aleister Crowley in the 1960s. America was socially engineered to fall from internal corruption by Satanists and cultural Marxists from the Frankfurt School, Germany. Evidently, reptilian alien hybrids, ancient alien panspermia, and interdimensional time dilation stargates from mystical quantum fluctuation is perfectly acceptable, but the idea of Christ being an access point to God's love is not allowed in the discussion at all by science? Astrophysics S has become a religion so powerful that a grown man can walk outside, on the immovably solid ground, and gaze up at the sun sailing past him over the course of a day, and still say to himself, it is I who am moving and not the sun. Though all my senses and all empirical data tells me otherwise, while his head is filled with Jesuit Copernican fantasies of spinning balls, and nuclear furnace stars and trillions and trillions of light years and black holes and every other assorted array of science fiction Star Trek plotline. So many people talk about being a Bible scholar to be saved. I disagree. If you know your own sin and reach out to Christ in humility, what more do you want? When it gets fancy and secretive, you are seeing Gnostic Luciferianism and not God. Evidently, reptilian alien hybrids, ancient alien panspermia, and interdimensional time dilation stargates from mystical quantum fluctuation is perfectly acceptable, but the idea of Christ being an access point to God's love is not allowed in the discussion at all by science? The hive mind, AI digital interlacing paradigm that they want for you is the same hive mind that they sought in ancient times. Nothing has changed but the scope and intensity of the techno-mystical apparatus at their disposal towards this end. Most people put their fingers in their ears as they try to defend earth curvature because they know there is no curvature so they can't listen to the empirical facts which prove them wrong. The very first thing beginning flat earthers ask is, why can't you see across the earth to China if it is a flat plane? Thinking that if it is flat, you should be able to see forever. Yet, you cannot even see down a 200-foot tunnel because of the convergence compression of vanishing point at the horizon. The answer is, obviously, that the eye drops off at the vanishing point of visual acuity. All perspective drawings in art are based upon this fact of the human eye. Using a telescope does not overcome the fact of vanishing point. In addition, the molecular density of the Earth's atmosphere is terrific even at 50 miles, let alone all the way to Saudi Arabia. However, as you rise up in a weather balloon, the air gets thinner, and you can see farther. Hence, climbers of Mount Everest wear oxygen masks to accommodate the thinner air, less molecular density. And you can see farther. Still, zero curvature can be detected from any altitude. The world planet is actually derived from the word plane. You live on a flat plane. You have been lied to your entire life by NASA. Time to awaken from the Star Trek slumber. What universe? Are we back to Star Trek, again? Open your eyes next time you look into your telescope. Stars are electromagnetic sonoluminescence. They are not nuclear furnaces, unless you have been smoking a lot of Jesuit Copernican weed. By the way do you see the possibility of a Hegelian diabetic being played to actually enforce a flat earth view instead of heliocentrism? so they can command the flat earth narrative? Whichever world leader captures that narrative become king of the NWO. It is time to open the eyes and turn off the Star Trek movie in your head. You have literally spent your entire life in a Jesuit created movie.
It was always run from the top down on a need to no basis. It did not take many people to pull this off, just a handful at the top of the Vatican in the 1500s and some Jesuit alchemical priests, Kepler, Galileo, Copernicus, Sir Isaac Newton, just a handful. And so, everyone fell in line with the new Catholic heliocentric doctrine. The Vatican was always behind it, big bang, big bounce, evolutionary theory, outer space, gravity. Sir Isaac Newton was an occultist Christian priest, etc. It was always the Vatican that brought you these things, it is a religion called scientism. They took you over with scientism. The whole notion that dark and light must coexist as dualistic complement is 100% Gnostic Luciferianism and Kabbalistic Hermetic. It may true in a pantheistic sense, probably not in a strict Christian Lord Most High framework. Paradoxical logic abounds at this level of inquiry. I think that's where Christ comes in. You can spend your whole life debunking Christ as a fake, but then we all die in free external life and love and heaven? Why would anyone refuse that unless one was under satanic mind control? How enlightened is anyone when the most you live is 100 or so years? Death is the great equalizer. I'll take the faith in eternal life in Christ any day over the New Age hoax. I was into the New Age for decades. I know it inside out. Well the New Age is about Christ consciousness and becoming Christ. True Christianity is about accepting the gift of eternal life as free, no work required. Since I've never seen anyone come even remotely close to becoming Christ, God incarnate, I put no credibility into the New Age. Seeing that everything is all illusory is the key to Christ. It's simple and free and no New Age bullshit work required. A child can do it. Satanic Talmudic, Babylonian Luciferianism created the labyrinth of convoluted legalese to ensnare the mind of mind to capture man's soul. Another possibility, concentric ice walls. We are in the middle circle. All the extra circles and lands, we have never been told about. This is the true off-world mentioned in the Blade Runner series. Off-world is not off-planet. So, all those tunnels you always hear about being built beneath the ocean floor by the elite, where do you think they are going when the bombs fall, into imaginary outer space? No way! They are going beyond the Antarctic ice shelf to an outer rim to live. IQ test, NASA. We lost all 86,000 plus video reels of the moon missions and all the telemetry data. Thus, we no longer have any technology or means to go to the moon. But suddenly, we are going to Mars. A. I believe anything my masters tell me. Or B. I'm too proud to admit I was wrong about everything. Or C. Bullshit. David reported, every war has been deliberately started and globalists have three main bases of operation. American is globalists world military hammer, but we're not aware of that. London is their economic center and the Vatican is their religious center. Okay, shoot. How was David's presentation anything less than a respectable journalistic report of a fact that was verified in the five-hour, extremely comprehensive, and well-researched, award-winning documentary, Empire of the Cities? And yet he was warned about what? You see, it had nothing to do with how one presents it in this case. I do not know David at all but I am a seasoned scholar, journalistic writer, and novelist, and I can tell the difference between someone trying to sculpt incendiary remarks and someone writing a truth to teach others. 
David presented a fact with the utmost dignity and seasoned aplomb. It was the content that was targeted. It was the content that was targeted. If others disagree with David's findings, that is up to others to research the topic and present their own rebuttal. It is not the job of an arbitrator to decide what is intellectually appropriate for grown adults to apprehend in the name of some arbitrary rubric of liberal political correctness. Little by little, through cultural Marxist fascism, the elite have curbed back what people can say to rape them of their liberty. Politically correct speech to avoid any intellectual conflict is nothing more than a brand of fascist oppression, whether it comes from a dictator or an arbitrator on Facebook. People want truth. They don't want sanitized niceties to maintain the status quo of a stultifying new age deception of ignorance and lies. Object lesson time, essentially, David was alluding to a film called Empire of the Cities, which explains the three central religious, financial, and military epicenters in the world, as was established by the elite. I did not detect anything derogatory nor slanderous in his post. The fact that he received any comment at all about it is a huge red flag of about the massive censorship and Orwellian clamp down on thought and free speech at this site. Once certain words and thoughts are outlawed, so as not to offend anyone, you have forfeited liberty and intelligence in preference for sycophant obedience to authority. The grand arbitrator policing over your words and thoughts in the name of political correctness is the new world order you were warned about. I may not like what a person says, but I will defend their free right to say it to the death. CERN derived from Cernunnos slash Celtic goat god slash goat of Mendez, is nothing more than occult black magic. There are no scientists there, only high occultists, witches and warlocks summoning demons and transhuman technology through the tear in the veil. No, the grid I referring to is the 5G AI smart city. Internet of Things grid, your mind will not be your own in this grid, if you survive it at all. I need to be extremely clear about this. AI is being used to suck us into an enchanted relationship with it. A ready player one oasis, shiny Elysium that we need to enter into. However, AI is the antichrist, digital and lethal to all. Looking within and you'll find selfishness, greed, sin never ending. It is a new age Gnostic ruse. Look without to God's authority. Follow that and you will experience inner salvation. The only reason the Luciferian cult is in control is because instead of having the earth and God in our heads, we were brainwashed to have outer space and Star Wars in our heads, occult Kabbalistic Gnostic mystical mind control. We've been participating in a mediated quasi-psychedelic experience, parceled out by digital CGI media and NASA, images claiming to be from the ISS, Hubble Telescope, and Hollywood Sci-Fi, giving us a techno-celestial Luciferian fabrication of authentic spirituality. You see, the Vatican Jesuits were banned from over 86 countries. So, they went underground to survive and became the Illuminati, and then later infiltrated the Freemasons. Now, they control the world. Roman Catholicism never let go of his tyranny. They just concealed it. In a nutshell, any truther or truther group that promises to make your life more abundant, materially wealthy, or sexually proficient, run. Many false truth groups have emerged online. Be vigilant. They will lead you to Luciferian aspirations in material self-absorption, a fixation on your body, and material gain, and they will not even know they are. Worshipping the body, it is a vanity fair of male narcissism. You tell me what this has to do with authentic spirituality? More false doctrines sold to us as spiritual health. 
worshipping the body instead of God all in the name of personal health. New Age Narcissism Thinly Veiled as Health Consciousness Many false truth groups have emerged online. Be vigilant. They will lead you to Luciferian aspirations and material self-absorption, a fixation on your body, and material gain, and they will not even know they are satanic. Even the elect will be deceived. The moment you are afraid to speak your truth for fear of being censored or banned, is the moment you have submitted to the new world order. Be brave. Stay true. Political correctness is fascism. I get banned form truther groups that talk about love, light, and unity all the time, because I expose them as the new age, that Madame Helena Blavatsky has prepared the world for. The decoders of truth ban me for this very thing. Prepare to be persecuted for speaking truth. In the end, mark my word, the Luciferian elite will bring the world to its knees with war and a war-torn world will willingly accept the new world order. The new age is the new world order. Scientism is the result of hundreds of years of Luciferian mind control where Kabbalistic Luciferian fantasy was repackaged as science as a Trojan horse for occult masters to indoctrinate the world into their hermetic ideologies. The world is only ever in danger because politicians are worthless and have no principles or hobbies. What if I programmed you with Hollywood slash NASA slash Vatican heliocentric occultism programming to actually mistrust all your senses and believe the Earth is a sphere? Would you still love me? You would. I think that is called brainwashing and mind control. Actual enlightenment is not a fancy trick attained through Zen meditation or Hindu yoga. It is attained through the rigorous application of mental strength to overcome deceptions. The lie, all you get from the eating the apple are deceptions, secret mystical Satanism, nothing more chasing one's tail with occult knowledge until you are enslaved. I see it every day with Gnosticism. The ancient Gnostics found morality irrelevant, BTW. Red flag. And we are being conditioned to accept that our ultimate destination is with the stars, and that we are spawned from ancient alien DNA, an immortal life and a universal consciousness of love, light, and unity awaits us in this elitist pantheistic Satanism thinly veiled as New Age. Simulation matrix models coming out of New Age Satanic Luciferianism, and a lot of it is really being derived from DMT, ayahuasca, and otherwise, dimethyltryptamine hallucinogens. It's a shamanistic autocracy. When I look up in the night sky, I see twinkling stars and the moon. My friend next to me looks up and sees episode 56 from Star Trek with billions of black holes, trillions of light years of curved space, and spaceships made of unimaginably exotic materials. Am I the crazy one? You see, the Vatican Jesuits were banned from over 86 countries. So, they went underground to survive and became the Illuminati, and then later infiltrated the Freemasons. Now, they control the world. Roman Catholicism never let go of his tyranny. They just concealed it. Honestly, what do you think is going to happen when 98? 98% 98 of the world's population people wake up to realize 0.02% of the world's population have enslaved and butchered them for over 2,000 years? Just let that sink in. We can only use the names Hivites or Luciferians for so long. Evidently, reptilian alien hybrids, ancient alien panspermia, and interdimensional time dilation stargates from mystical quantum fluctuation is perfectly acceptable, but the idea of Christ being an access point to God's love is not allowed in the discussion at all by science? Again, another caution. An amazing amount of truth movements are teaching Gnostic Luciferianism, while pretending to be against Luciferianism. 
In particular, they are pushing ancient alien Anunnaki myths to perpetuate the alien contact agenda. Be vigilant. I am seeing a lot of snake oil, new age, fake truth movement podcast hosts out there with an agenda to pump up real truth seekers with commercial hype to push themselves as the great benefactor. It's a business money move. Proceed with caution out there. The only reason the Luciferian cult is in control is because instead of having the earth and God in our heads, we were brainwashed to have outer space and Star Wars in our heads, occult Kabbalistic Gnostic mysticism. Technology can only be used within the constraints of how it is designed, how the culture perceives it, the knowledge that users have, and the society that has assimilated it. Undoubtedly, it funnels our experience into a certain pattern of behavior and thought. The elite perpetuate the myth that we need technology and cannot disconnect from it. Technology is always harnessed to a particular end. Technology is not neutral. We think it frees us. We are free to walk within the prescribed parameters of the app or website we inhabit. That is not freedom. That is an animal in a digital cage, nothing more. The larger context is that technology exists to enslave you. Look beyond your immediate gratification to understand this. Currently, we are addicted to technology. That was the plan. It was on purpose. Technology reflects the elite's passions, capacities, and values. It is all about control and hypnotism. Technology is an expression of the elites of society. They say technology is a great force that we cannot stop. This is a myth. We can by simply disconnecting from it. Every time you log on you are shown only what Google wants you to see. This is why so many people have a skewed vision of the world. One Google user's searches do not yield the same results as the other user, etc. AI quantum computing to grant immortality, but it will actually and usher in the abomination of desolation Daniel 12:11. So then, it makes sense that the Luciferians led people away from actually reading the Bible because then they would learn that it liberates them. So, they demonized it, instead, and since people are not actually reading it, they just believe the propaganda. And transhumanism is at the core of this Luciferian apotheosis dream to become God. Whether it be through AI techno-mysticism or genetic engineering, they are ramping up for the leap into a super-consciousness singularity as the Luciferian technium divinorum autocracy. Behind looking within for God is the message you can become God from the serpent. The whole thing is an attractive deception. You see the whole thing is the attempt to become Christ. Try it, go ahead, give it your best shot. Use 1897630 lives, it won't happen, deception. Again careful, yes it all sounds good to look within for God, but you are now on the slippery slopes of Luciferian Gnosticism when you look within, in that you find horrific sin and vile human emotions as much as goodness. Hence the need to look without for God, Scripture. The more I talk about my topic, scientism, the more biblical scholars are coming out of the woodwork to message me in private to tell me I am right. Somehow Christian scholars are confirming my research. But my book is not about Christianity, per se? See, it is all connecting. Well yes and no. I mean thousands of people have written books that they claim is the word of God, but the Bible is the most researched, talk about, widely read book in all recorded history. The greatest minds in all history revered it. The lie, all you get from the eating the apple are deceptions secret mystical satanism, nothing more, chasing one's tail with occult knowledge until you are enslaved.
I see it every day with Gnosticism. The ancient Gnostics found morality irrelevant, BTW. Red flag. Wow, there is there no end to this Gnosticism. All this secret knowledge that the, the adepts are alluding to is rooted in Luciferian Gnosticism. It is satanic mystery Babylon teachings. We have been indoctrinated, all of us, into a Freemasonic Luciferianism without knowing it I think Satanists have made people think it was all about torture, it was about sacrifice. Again, if a parent loves his her child, that parent will die for the child, no greater expression of love than to give your life for another. Then that part of Christian theology would not work for you, for others. It symbolizes the love a parent has for a child, to give your own life to save that child, but everyone is different in their heart. Gnosticism quickly turns a person into an elitist. With the false magic keys to the kingdom of heaven and all others are lost because they lack the secret special Gnostic knowledge. It is all bullshit. God's word is available to all. You need not become an occult adept. I don't know how to get people to see this. All this Luciferian Gnostic secret knowledge, and the true name of Jesus, etc. It is all just deception. All of this secret knowledge and all these secret holy names will not get you anywhere but deep inside an occult maze. Exactly my meaning. If the Bible was just some nonsense, then why is it really the only thing the satanic rulers of this world are trying to keep from you? This singular book called the Bible. And let's face facts, Gnosticism, modern atheistic science, I call scientism, and the New Age teachings are one and the same. And they all teach that there is no absolute morality and sin is an illusion. Do as thou wilt is their satanic code you see, this is why I wrote my book, like science, religion becomes elitist, and the ones who lay claims to secret knowledge start putting others down and saying all others must believe their special interpretation of Christ. This is the Gnostic heresy that Christ spoke of. I think the first thing I tell people is I am not a Bible scholar, so you can stop it with your throwing ancient terminology and ancient scripture at me. I am extremely intelligent and I am not impressed. And I insist you do not have to be a Bible scholar to serve Christ. And why would not a book serve as a living word and living access point to God? Who says this cannot be so? People are teaching other people that their interpretation of the Bible is superior to all others. I see it everywhere. Is this not a form of pharisaical ruse? And my response to the pride of New Age Gnostics trying to become God is that how can you even know God without knowing the sin inside you? I mean think of the arrogance? I have no sin. Sin is an archaic stupidity from the old stupid Bible. That's is not a person ready to learn. And let's face facts, Gnosticism, modern atheistic science, I call scientism, and the New Age teachings are one and the same. And they all teach that there is no absolute morality and sin is an illusion. Do as thou wilt is their satanic code. I try to avoid pushing Christianity on anyone. I am not pure, holy, or qualified enough to even know what I am talking about when it comes to Christianity even after a lifetime of examining it. The best I can do is lead people away from Satanism. I see that as my role. In elitist Gnosticism, there is little room for authentic faith. For them, it is salvation through secret occult knowledge equals Gnosis. They are the elect, the chosen people, in their eyes, which has led to the current plan to kill over 7 billion people that they deem are not worthy of their presence. Unlearn the lies. We all have been seduced by to a great Luciferian deception called Gnostic-based scientism. Waking up is often traumatic. 
Nobody has gone anywhere from the study of Thoth or any esoteric knowledge. Just chasing your tail forever in the Luciferian maze, self-slavery is all Thoth is, masquerading as truth. Gnostic Deception Secret mystery schools are intellectual prisons of the mind. The cryptocurrency blockchain system was created by the Zionist bankers. Don't be fooled. You escape nothing by going digital. In fact, digital is the slavery I am warning about. Stand against all of it. It's just more digital AI. The whole idea was to give you the impression you have escaped the international banking system. But money is not the control grid of the future. Digital interface is. As long as you are connected digitally, you are subservient to the AI system. The illusion of economic freedom will soon vanish as you realize the internet is not what you thought. It is not free in the way you think. It is governed by a sophisticated matrix of algorithms far beyond your understanding. Far beyond anyone's understanding. Digital is the beast system. It's all one big AI smart control grid. Crypto is just the next stepping stone in the control grid. They saw people turning away from international banking, so they created a new illusion, cryptocurrency. At first these monetary systems always feel like freedom. It's the international finance system that is still behind it all. AI is not something you hack. True AI is decades ahead of your every move. You're supposed to think you're smarter than it. That's exactly what you're programmed to think by AI. Chapter 4 Is salvation by faith alone, or by faith plus works? This is perhaps the most important question in all of Christian theology. This question is the cause of the Reformation, the split between the Protestant churches and Catholic Church. This question is a key difference between Biblical Christianity and most of the Christian cults. Is salvation by faith alone, or by faith plus works? Am I saved just by believing in Jesus, or do I have to believe in Jesus and do certain things? The question of faith alone or faith plus works is made difficult by some hard-to-reconcile Bible passages. Compare Romans 3.28, 5.1 and Galatians 3.24 with James 2.24. Some see a difference between Paul, salvation is by faith alone, and James, salvation is by faith plus works. Paul dogmatically says that justification is by faith alone, Ephesians 2 8-9, while James appears to be saying that justification is by faith plus works. This apparent problem is answered by examining what exactly James is talking about. James is refuting the belief that a person can have faith without producing any good works, James 2 17-18. James is emphasizing the point that genuine faith in Christ will produce a changed life and good works, James 2.20-26. James is not saying that justification is by faith plus works, but rather that a person who is truly justified by faith will have good works in his or life. If a person claims to be a believer, but has no good works in his or life, then he she likely does not have genuine faith in Christ, James 2 14, 17, 20, 26. Paul says the same thing in his writings. The good fruit believers should have in their lives is listed in Galatians 5 22 23. Immediately after telling us that we are saved by faith, not works, Ephesians 2 8 9, Paul informs us that we were created to do good works, Ephesians 2 10. Paul expects just as much of a changed life as James does, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5 17.
James and Paul do not disagree in their teaching regarding salvation. They approach the same subject from different perspectives. Paul simply emphasized that justification is by faith alone while James put emphasis on the fact that genuine faith in Christ produces good works. Hermes Trismegistus Hermeticism and the Emerald Tablets Tablet I, the History of Thoth, the Atlantean Tablet II, the Halls of Amenti Tablet III, the Key of Wisdom Tablet IV, the Spaceborn Tablet V, the Dweller of Unal Tablet VI, the Key of Magic Tablet VII, the Seven Lords. Tablet VIII, the Key of Mysteries Tablet IX, the Key of Freedom of Space Tablet X, the Key of Time Tablet XI, the Key to Above and Below Tablet XII, the Law of Cause and Effect and the Key of Prophecy Tablet XIII, the Keys of Life and Death Supplementary Tablet XIV Atlantis Supplementary Tablet. 15. Secret of Secrets Thoth and the Emerald Tablets A demon in sheep's clothing Thoth is probably the most popular of all Egyptian gods, especially within the domains of metaphysics and the New Age movement. He is depicted as being charismatic, a bringer of wisdom, and a teacher here to help us understand the mysteries of the universe. Before we talk a little bit more in depth about the role this god plays in the spirit world in our day, Let's take a brief look at his attributes according to Egyptian mythology. Thoth is an Egyptian god of science, religion, philosophy, astrology, alchemy, magic, and is the judge of souls in the afterlife. He is the god of all knowledge, is the supreme creator in some Egyptian myths, and is often depicted as having the head of a ibis or a baboon. He invented the rules of sacrifice and is the author of the Book of Thoth, which is a collection of magic spells and rituals so powerful that it had to be hidden away. In fact, according to mythology he taught the goddess of magic Isis everything she knows. According to mythology he taught the goddess of magic Isis everything she knows. Thoth is credited with writing some of the spells in the Egyptian Book of the Dead and serves as the official scribe in the Hall of the Dead. Thoth has many different roles in Egyptian mythology, but his main claims to fame are being the god of knowledge and magic. Hermes Trismegistus is a combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth, and is a name that is sometimes used interchangeable with Thoth. Because of this, the two gods were worshipped as one in what had been the temple of Thoth and Chemnu, which the Greeks called Hermopolis. In this article we are going to look at Thoth as an independent entity from Hermes as he is known in Egyptian mythology, and was known by them for hundreds if not thousands of years before Greek mythology arose, and will save the topics of Hermeticism and the Hermetica for another article. Now that we have a little background information, Let's take a deeper look into Thoth to see if he is as benevolent as the New Age makes him out to be. First, let's look at his most popular writings in the Emerald Tablets. The Emerald Tablets The Emerald Tablets are a series of writings that were given to us by Thoth which were apparently written on a material created through an alchemical process. Nobody has seen all of these tablets. Only one exists in its original form. And the emerald tablets, as a textual body, are generally considered to be channeled material given to man by Thoth. They talk about everything from ancient history, to alchemy, to metaphysics. With the main objective being to teach us about the mysteries of the universe, so we may become unified with the light. The emerald tablets are a staple for any new agar aspiring to ascend to higher states of consciousness. But upon closer inspection, these tablets actually depict the existence of fallen angels, hell, and even Satan in ways that glorify them and are central to what they teach. Fallen Angels in the First Tablet Thoth talks about a group of wise beings called the Children of Light, wise were we with the wisdom of the Children of Light who dwelt among us. Strong were we with the power drawn from the Eternal Fire. Emerald Tablet I 
Who are these children of light that get their power from the eternal fire? According to the second emerald table, their story bears a striking similarity to the fallen angles, far in a pastime, lost in the spacetime, the children of light looked down on the world. See the children of men in their bondage, bound by the force that came from beyond. Knew they that only by freedom from bondage could man ever rise from the earth to the sun. Down they descended and created bodies, taking the semblance of men as their own, Emerald Tablet 2, the Hall of Amenti. So, these children of light fueled by the eternal fire made a descent down to earth and created humanesque bodies taking the appearance of men. Let's look at story of the fallen angels descending to earth in the book of Genesis 6, 1-5, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And they took as their wives any they chose, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them it also sounds similar to the story of the fallen angels in the book of Enoch. The watchers looked down from heaven and desired the daughters of men, 6 1 8. They swear an oath to fulfill their desires and then descend, marry women, and defile themselves with women, 7 colon 1. Or in the book of Jude in the Bible, where it says in verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. So, the Bible tells us that the angels looked down on human beings and fell to earth to fulfill lustful desires. And the emerald tablets tell us the children of light looked down on human beings and descended and took on human bodies. In the very next line of the first tablet, Thoth says, And of all these, greatest among the children of men was my father, Thotmi, keeper of the great temple. Link between the children of light who dwelt within the temple, and the races of men who inhabited the ten islands. Here we clear distinction between the children of light, fueled by the eternal fire, and the races of men. The children of light are clearly non-humans who are incarnate in physical bodies and gain powers from this eternal fire. They apparently descended from the space-time and ether, ET4, which personally makes me think of how the Bible refers to demons living within the heavenly places, F. 612, and Satan is said to rule from the kingdom of the air, F2 colon 2. These children of light, also referred to as the Brothers of Brightness, have the exact same story as the Great White Brotherhood, Ascended Masters, which I provided a strong case that they are demons in an earlier article. And they are spoken of as bringers of wisdom and teachers of the mysteries in the Emerald Tablets, and they have an eerie resemblance to the stories of fallen angles in the Bible and the Book of Enoch. Hell these children of light not only mirror the story of the fallen angels, an obvious reference to hell is made in terms of the halls of Amenti, where Thoth lies deep in earth's heart lie the halls of Amenti, far neath the islands of sunken Atlantis. Halls of the dead and halls of the living, bathed in the fire of the infinite all. Emerald Tablet 2, Halls of Amenti, then grew in the great space before me, flame after flame, from the veil of the night. Uncounted millions leap they before me, some flaming forth as flowers of fire. Others there were that shed a dim radiance, flowing but faintly from out of the night. Some there were that faded swiftly, others that grew from a small spark of light. Each surrounded by its dim veil of darkness yet flaming with light that could never be quenched. So, in the halls of Amenti in the heart of the earth is the halls of the dead and living filled with souls burning with flames. Hell is referred to in the Bible as being the down in the nether parts of the earth in Ezekiel 31 colon 16 and is always spoken of as a fiery eternal realm of torment that is deep beneath us and the halls of Amenti is referred to as an eternal place of fire and the hall of the dead far neath the earth crust. Here are some more references to the Amenti being a place of eternal fire deep in the earth. Now for a time I go from among them into the dark halls of Amenti, deep in the halls of the earth, 
before the lords of the powers, face to face once again with the dweller. Deep in earth's heart. The sons of Amenti heard, and hearing, directing the changing of the flower of fire that burns eternally, changing and shifting, using the logos, until that great fire changed its direction, emerald tablet I. Within the first tablets explaining the history of Thoth, we have a very strong correlation to the stories of the fallen angels, and a pit of fire filled with burning souls in the center of the earth. The ruler of hell and the fallen angels in the Bible is Satan, but who is the ruler of Amenti? Satan in the Emerald Tablets it goes on to call Amenti the underworld where the great king sits upon his throne, Emerald Tablet I. Who is this great king? It says more about the highest authority in Amenti in the second tablet, first and most mighty, sits the veiled presence, Lord of Lords, the infinite nine, over the other from each the lords of the cycles, Emerald Tablet II. This is a possible reference to Satan. In Satanism, nine is a number of Satan. Adding 666 together, you get 18. One plus eight is equal to nine. Nine is a six upside down, which comprises the number of the beast. Satanic forces work in variables of nine, for example there are nine epochs, nine ages, and nine satanic statements in the satanic Bible. In the satanic Bible, the word nine is always capitalized. According to the book Numbers, there are occult power and mystic virtues by W. W. Westcott, nine holds great significance among many Masonic orders and secret societies. He said, there is a Masonic order of nine elected knights in which nine roses, nine lights, and nine knocks are used. In fact, the number nine is the number of the earth under evil influences. Satanist Aleister Crowley stated that nine is most evil. Because of its stability, 777 and other Kabbalistic writings of Aleister Crowley, p.43. Why does Thoth call the Lord of Lords the Infinite Nine? Other possible references to Satan including the phrases Son of the Morning which is what Lucifer is called in the Bible. And the Lords of the World which Satan is called in the Bible. These two terms are sprinkled throughout the Emerald Tablets quite often. Jesus refers to Satan as being the ruler of this world three separate times, John 12 31, 14 30, 16 11. And the Satanic Bible refers to Satan as the Lord of the Earth, pg. 162, this is word for word what Satan is called in both the Bible and the Satanic Bible. Thoth has a few conversations with he of nine, including the following while he was in the halls of Amenti, then asked I of the nine, O Lord, show me the path. Give the path to the wisdom. Show me the way to the word. Answered, me then, the Lord of the nine, through order, ye shall find the way. Saw ye that the word came from chaos? Saw ye not that light came from fire? Emerald Tablet 9 so according to the Lord of Lords located in the heart of the earth and the eternal fire, the word and light came from chaos and fire. This is all textbook Luciferian mysticism and satanic philosophy. But surely some of the emerald tablets have to contain at least some wisdom, don't they? After all, what about all the references to light, wisdom, truth, and the All One? A Thoth recap one need only study the Gnostic Luciferian occult tradition to discover that it leads to an elitist agenda of transhumanistic apotheosis, which includes the delusion of all mankind through the use of hermetic occultism. The Jesuits repackaged this same hermetic alchemical secret knowledge from the Emerald Tablets, in conjunction with the Freemasons, to capture the world in the new age of Luciferianism that it currently is in. Just think of it as a new world religion based upon hermetic occult secret knowledge. Love, light, and universal consciousness is the esoteric teaching in it all.
However, the ultimate application is genocide and destruction of the known world to usher in the new age of Lucifer. People toy with labels like Enlil, Enki, Anunnaki, Marduk, Nimrod, Thoth, etc. But that is all semantic child's play. We are dealing with the Babylonian mystery schools. And how easily deceived are those who exalt this esoteric secret knowledge, thinking, in absolute hubris and vanity, they are mighty enough to become enlightened and ascend to universal consciousness through its application. It is all born of the Luciferian apotheosis deception, from the start. Whether you investigate into the occult doctrines of Hermeticism, Jesuit Vatican Illuminati, the White Brotherhood, or the front groups for this occult doctrine such as the Trilateral Commission, the United Nations, etc. The agenda is always the same, destroy the world and kill everyone. And out of the ashes rises the occult phoenix called the New Age of Lucifer. The end goal has always been the genocide of all who follow this hermetic path, except the high elite occult masters who are pushing such knowledge. At the lower levels, you never even hear about this agenda. It is no accident that the internet is on fire for hermetic occult knowledge. The Luciferian elite who pull all the strings from the top down, with secret societies, have designed it that way. We are all being indoctrinated into a satanic Luciferian cult without knowing it, but we are finding out, little by little. In the new age of Gnostic occult Luciferianism, love and light is code for we, the elite, will kill and enslave you all using the very same esoteric secret knowledge that we provided you to seduce you in. Using your hunger and hubris for our fake universal consciousness. Why did you think Thoth was the progenitor of so much human sacrifice? Thoth was responsible for slaughtering thousands through satanic blood sacrifice, always for love and light however. But it's no secret that Thoth is a demon. He is known as a high-ranking demon and is conjured up by Satanists and is mentioned by name in satanic magic books. He is mentioned as a demon of Satan in the Satanic Bible. And the black magician and Satanist Freemason Aleister Crowley dedicated a full book and tarot card deck to him. Not to mention, the cultures he apparently helped start, all ritually practiced brutal human sacrifice. This is because Thoth, as a demon god of ritual, magic. And the afterlife gains power from human sacrifice and ultimately wants all souls to be led into the halls of Amenti in the eternal flames in the center of the earth, i.e. hell. But in the new age, all this is taught as the emerald tablet sun worship of love and light, all deception. That is what is taught in all the Babylonian mystery schools. The fact is however, not one human has ever become enlightened or ascended anywhere through secret knowledge. It is all hype and hubris. My favorite thing is meeting these luminaries and high master enlightened guru and higher consciousness types who preach esoteric secret knowledge in world conferences and seeing how absolutely retarded and idiotic they actually are. The spell is broken and you remember that you are actually a mortal creation and not a god, as the new age brainwashes you to think. All that will happen is that you will fall deeper and deeper into one occult mystery after another, going nowhere, and then you die. You get one life, and then that is it. You are mortal, not a god. This is why the deception is called the Luciferian apotheosis deception. They deceive you into thinking you can reach some kind of magical universal consciousness and become the godhood. It is beyond laughable, actually, once you put the DMT pipe down. Reincarnation and evolution are merely more repackaged hermetic occultism, the Jesuits and Freemasonry did much to invent and repackage Babylonian mysticism to teach you the beliefs you are espousing. The ultimate agenda of hermetic-based, Gnostic Luciferianism is to enslave you and kill 7 billion so they can to establish a new age with them in full control as the sovereign epistemological autocracy. 
Stop falling for this occult delusion. Of course, you will not learn about that in the Emerald Tablets, even though Thoth murdered thousands. And specifically, I am actually talking about the esoteric secret knowledge itself that is taught in all the mystery schools as the path to ascension, enlightenment, and universal consciousness. It is all a scam, a ruse, a path to nowhere, like a dog chasing its tail. You have one life then you die. You are a mortal creation. The Gnostic Luciferian Hermetic Mystery Schools teach that you can transcend your mortality through secret knowledge. It is all lie. Nobody has ever done it nor ever will. Show me anyone who has tried, and I will show you a person who has died at some old age, as we all do. No apotheosis, no ascension into universal consciousness. It is just esoteric vain hubris to even contemplate such a thing. I mean it is the apex of ignorance, actually. We do not become gods as the Gnostic Luciferian deception preaches. No one has ever accomplished anything through secret knowledge except digging themselves into deeper and deeper self-deception, then you die anyway. Occult knowledge is actually the greatest deception known to man. This is why those of us who have looked extremely deep into the mystery schools and practiced the esoteric secret knowledge and rituals of the mystery Babylon New Age are now exposing it for what it is. You do not reincarnate. There is no evolution. It was all hermetic occult fantasy repackaged within Freemasonic halls as something tenable and plausible to lure you in, as it did the Knights Templar and the Jesuits before them and all those seeking this same esoteric wisdom today in the New Age. In the New Age, you will worship Lucifer or you will be killed, just as Thoth and all those Gnostic Luciferian elite before him let us know, loud and clear. And no, it's not just a global warming cult. The core of the secret mystery schools has always been to exterminate mankind by infecting man with their esoteric secret knowledge to magnetize and seduce man, using their promise of apotheosis and universal consciousness, into hypnotic subservience to their will. And additionally, they also seek to reconfigure the creation using esoteric alchemy, in order to govern over the lesser initiates as their slaves, that means you and me. The entire time you think you are on some glorious road of ascension and quest for universal consciousness. I've watched hundreds get overtaken by it, as well. Most never get out. They end up teaching and seeking this secret knowledge their entire lives, thinking they will attain enlightenment and ascend into universal consciousness, no end to the depth of Luciferian deception. Unfortunately, Gnostic Luciferian deception by the attainment of secret knowledge and esoteric wisdom, there is the Gnostic Luciferian promise of perfection and subsequent apotheosis. Likewise, through the occult fantasy of evolutionary theory, Freemasons taught that we are constantly evolving upwards in advancement of being through time, with the end goal being perfection. And what is perfection but becoming God? And so, you see, the Gnostic Luciferian quest for secret knowledge and esoteric wisdom, and today through the revival of the Babylonian mystery school teachings via the conduit of the New Age, is synonymous with Darwinian evolutionary dialectics. Fundamentally, both are satanic. In Satanism and all Luciferian philosophies, Lucifer is thought to be the bringer and bearer of light. He is the one who teaches us spiritual liberation through enlightenment. In the Satanic Bible in particular, Lucifer is called the bringer of light and the morning star. As Satanist, Freemason and founder of the Theosophical Society, Madame Helena Blavatsky said on page 539 of her book, The Secret Doctrine, Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, independence. Lucifer is the Logos, the Serpent, the Savior, and it is Lucifer who is the God of our planet, and the only God, and she continues, 
the celestial virgin which thus becomes the mother of gods and devils at one and the same time, for she is the ever-loving beneficent deity. But in antiquity and reality, Lucifer or Luciferius is the name. Lucifer is the divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. These are the mystery Babylon teachings repackaged as the New Age. Now witness the similar vernacular below in a prayer Thoth tells us to pray in Emerald Tablet 4, which is a textbook Luciferian prayer, mighty spirit of light that shines through the cosmos, draw my flame closer in harmony to thee. Lift up my fire from out of the darkness, magnet of fire that is one with thee all. Lift up my soul, thou mighty and potent. Child of the light, turn not away. Draw me in power to melt in thy furnace, one with all things and all things in one, fire of the life strain in one with the brain. Draw me in to melt in thy furnace. Could this be a metaphor? I might have believed it's a metaphor before discovering the blatant references to an underground of eternal fire in the center of the earth ruled by the nine and the lords of the world. Now let's compare this to a prayer within the Satanic Bible, O thou mighty light and burning flame of comfort! That unveilest the glory of Satan to the center of the earth, in whom the great secrets of truth have their abiding, that is called thy kingdom, open the mysteries of your creation. The Satanic Bible p. 264 Sounds a little familiar. That's because for Luciferians and Satanists, enlightenment through forbidden esoteric knowledge is the ultimate goal. The basic Luciferian principles highlight truth, freedom of will, and worship of the inner self. Through contemplation, occultic practices and prayers, magic, intellect, and understanding the mysteries, you may ascend and become godlike. Lucifer slash Satan is thought to be the true creator and the holder of all mysteries and bearer of cosmic light that will awaken our inner God self, thereby granting us access to apotheosis. You can also reach out to the ascended masters, fallen angels, for divine guidance and wisdom to help you ascend to higher consciousness. The deeper your understanding of the mysteries and the more time you dedicate to prayers, meditations, and rituals. The more godlike you will become until you reach unity with the light and become immortal. This is the core essence of the teachings of the Emerald Tablets and can be found in any Freemason temple and satanic church. And this whole paradigm is a complete fraud. It is nothing more than a deception. Nobody becomes enlightened. We all die at the end of a few decades. With the pseudo-spiritual Gnostics still clutching for more life, and it is over. You cannot become God or enlightened. It is all Gnostic Luciferian deception. And the repackaging of Mystery Babylon is relentless. And the Emerald Tablets will merely get you closer to the Luciferian apotheosis deception and leave you strangling by your own hubris at the end of your life. Nobody gets out alive. And millions in the New Age are going to attempt to access apotheosis through Mystery Babylon, Thoth, the Emerald Tablets, and the battery of Hermetic Alchemic Occultism, but will only be serving Lucifer. Conclude us receivers of your mysteries, for why? Our Lord and Master is the All One. The Satanic Bible, PG. 186 with the Luciferian philosophy and references to fallen angels, hell, and Satan, we need to start questioning the real identity of Thoth. Let's take a deeper look into things. Thoth and modern Satanism not only do the Emerald Tablets glorify the fallen angels, Satan, Luciferianism, and hell. Thoth is well known within Satanism to be a demon god. According to the Joy of Satan Ministries, Thoth is one of the most active demons and is a crown prince in hell. Thoth also known as Hermes, Greek, Mercury, Roman, Tehuti, Ninjish Zitta, and Quetzalcoatl, Central America. Zodiac sign, Gemini, Cancer tarot card, three of Rod's planets, 
Mercury, moon candle colors, silver, red metal, mercury element, air rank, recorder of script and legal documents in hell. The Grand Office asterisk the above information was dictated from Thoth, personally. Thoth is a very high-ranking and important demon. He is one of the seven sons of Satan. He is the most brilliant and intellectual of the gods. He is very likable, extremely charismatic, and friendly. He is the busiest of all of the demons, and it can be difficult to get him to appear in a summoning unless one is of importance to him. This is coming from a high priestess in the Church of Satan, who claims to have been in contact with Thoth personally. The Necronomicon, the Book of the Practices of the Dead and the Simon Necronomicon are perhaps the darkest satanic black magic books ever written. They are known for driving people into madness, and it warns the readers that powerful forces of darkness will be unleashed if it's not read in perfect sanity. I would post a picture of it here, but I don't. Want the symbol of the book cover contained within this article. In his introduction, Simon Necronomicon describes a being called Azag Thoth in the following words, although a list is appended here too containing various entities and concepts of Lovecraft, Crowley, and Sumeria cross-referenced. It will do to show how the editor found relationships to be valid and even startling. Azatot is frequently mentioned in the grim pages of the Cthulhu mythos, and appears in the Necronomicon as Azag Thoth, a combination of two words, the first Sumerian and the second Coptic, which gives us a clue as to its identity. Azag in Sumerian means enchanter or magician, Thoth in Coptic is the name given to the Egyptian god of magic and wisdom, Tahuti, who was evoked by both the Golden Dawn and by Crowley himself, and known to the Greeks as Hermes, from whence we get Hermetic. Azag Thoth is, therefore, a lord of magicians, but of the black magicians, or the sorcerers of the other side. Asa, Aza, translates as source from ancient Egyptian. And Thoth is of course the Egyptian god. Alsathoth or Asathoth is translated as the source of Thoth, or the intelligence of Thoth. Azag Thoth is referred to as being a lord of black magicians by the darkest book of spells and magic that we have available. This book was used as evidence. In a murder trial of Roderick Farrell, who tried to imitate a magic ritual in the book which involved human sacrifice to open the gates of Ganser, hell. Thoth is even mentioned with the Satanic Bible. On page 144 of the Satanic Bible, it gives you a passage to recite to invoke demons from the pit of hell to come forth and manifest desires in your life. These infernal spirits are literal beings that theistic Satanists invoke through ritual. Prayer and Magic It proceeds to list of all the possible infernal names you can choose from, some being very well-known demons. In that list on page 146 is Thoth, the Egyptian god of magic. Magic is something practices very heavily by theistic Satanists and often involves blood sacrifice and the summoning of demons such as Thoth. They even regard the Egyptian god set to Satan and worship him as such. Satanist and the founder of the school of theosophy, Helena Blavatsky, sums up Thoth as follows, Kermes, the god of wisdom, called also Thoth, Tat, Set, and Saturn and that he was, furthermore, when viewed under his bad aspect, Typhon, the Egyptian Satan, who was also set. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, Isis Unveiled, Volume. I Science, New York, Trost Printing and Bookbinding Company, 1877 p. 554, XXXIII. Alistair Crowley, Thoth, and Magic. Someone obsessed with Egyptian magic was 33rd degree Freemason and Satanist Alistair Crowley. He referred to himself as the Beast 666 and once said I was not content to just believe in Satan, I wanted to be his chief of staff. 
He was a famous occultist and magician who was heavily influenced by Thoth and Egyptian mythology. He openly admitted making blood sacrifice to demons and said, for nearly all purposes relating to magic, human sacrifice is the best, chapter 12 of the bloody sacrifice, and matters cognate. He was contacted by a supernatural being called Iwas while in Egypt that taught him do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, which became the core principle in his religion and philosophy called Thelema. Crowley went on to write six books pertaining to magic and became obsessed with ceremonial and Egyptian magic. And just like other Satanists, he had a fascination with Thoth. In fact, he wrote a book called The Book of Thoth which contains the magic of Thoth and ancient Egypt. It also outlines the philosophy of his Thoth tarot card deck that he created which he used for divination and magic. One technique of magic Crowley strongly recommended was banishing. Banishing is a technique used by magicians to rid the space of forces that might interfere with the magic that is being performed. As Crowley says in his book Magic. Book 4, ch. 13 In the banishing ritual of the pentagram we not only command the demons to depart, but invoke the archangels, and their hosts to act as guardians of the circle during our pre occupation with the ceremony proper. IT is usually sufficient to perform a general banishing and to rely upon the aid of the guardians invoked. The banishing ritual of the pentagram is the best to use. The lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is a magic ritual used by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is an occultic sect based on the teachings of Hermes Trismegistus, Thoth. This ritual involves getting rid of spirits or impure forms of the elements from the magician's circle by tracing pentagrams in the air with a dagger, and by the power of certain divine names followed by an invocation of spiritual forces to guard the pentagram. Why were magical practitioners of the teachings of Hermes under the impression that magic was best done by drawing pentagrams and invoking spirits to protect it? Furthermore, why does the Hermetic Order today teach Crowley's satanic philosophy Thelema? Thoth and human sacrifice according to legend coming from channeled materials, Thoth started a colony in ancient Egypt at the beginning of Egyptian civilization after Atlantis sank after the fall of Atlantis roughly 10. 000 years ago and was a high priest there. This would mean that Thoth ruled over pre-dynastic and maybe even first dynasty Egypt right at the start of their civilization. According to anthropologist Dr. Sasha Lesson, 3450 BC is when Thoth was ruler of Egypt. The only problem with this is that Thoth, the god of religion and ritual, ruled at the exact time when the Egyptians practiced human sacrifice. According to an article published in National Geographic, Human sacrifice is clearly demonstrated as existing during and before the first dynasty by retainers, human servants, being buried near each pharaoh's tomb so that they could go on into the afterlife to continue to serve the pharaohs and royalty. And Thoth is the god of religion, rituals. And the high priest of Egypt would have been overseeing this religious practice if this legend is true. According to other legends of Thoth and an interview with Zechariah Sitchin, Thoth brought civilization to the Mayans and appeared to them in the form of Quetzalcoatl, who was a feathered serpent that the Mayans made human sacrifices to. The method of sacrifice for Quetzalcoatl was to cut someone open while they were alive, pull out their heart, and offer it up to Quetzalcoatl. Thoth also apparently helped start the Sumerian culture and was known to them as Ninjish Zida, a serpent god of the underworld. Sir Leonard Woolley was an excavator of the famous ancient Mesopotamian city of Uar in Sumeria. There, among hundreds of tombs, he found 16 elaborate royal tombs, all containing human sacrificial victims that were stacked on top of each other with numbers as high as over 70 human skeletons in a single tomb. These tombs were known as the Great Death Pits and were sometimes filled completely with dead human bodies, 
as you can see from Woolley's archaeological diagram of the pit on the right. What a strange coincidence, taking all things into consideration. That this god of religion and ritual who lives in the fire of the earth known to be a demon by Satanists, helped establish three ancient cultures, all of which ritually practiced human sacrifice for religious purposes. Thoth is not a fun, charismatic god of wisdom and magic contrary to how he is depicted in pop culture and New Age teachings. Thoth is not some benevolent helpful Egyptian god here to teach us how to evolve our consciousness. The emerald tablets glorify fallen angels and speak about Thoth living in the eternal fire in the center of the earth and the halls of Amenti ruled he of nine. The emerald tablets are just about as Luciferian as it gets and are riddled with references the eternal flames, Satan, the masters and contain demonic chants so mysterious that only God what demonic spirits they invoke. For example, in Tablet X we see instructions from the lords of Amenti, Hark Y.E., now man, this word I leave with T.H.E. Use it, and ye shall find power in its sound. Say ye the word, Z-I-N-U-R-U, and power ye shall find. Or in Emerald Tablet 6, Thoth summons demon gods, by their names I call them to aid me, free me and save me from the darkness of night. Antanas, Quertas, Cheetal, and Goyana, Huertal, Semveta, Artal. By their names I implore thee, free me from darkness and fill me with light. Or in Tablet 12, call thou on me when thou dost need me. Use my name three times in a row, Sheketet, Aralik, Valmalites. But it's no secret that Thoth is a demon. He is known as a high-ranking demon and is conjured up by Satanists and is mentioned by name in satanic magic books. He is mentioned as a demon of Satan in the satanic Bible. And the black magician and satanist Freemason Alistair Crowley dedicated a full book and tarot card deck to him. Not to mention, the cultures he apparently helped start, according to legends passed around the New Age, all ritually practiced brutal human sacrifice. This is because Thoth, as a demon god of ritual, magic. And the afterlife gains power from human sacrifice and ultimately wants all souls to be led into the halls of Amenti in the eternal flames in the center of the earth. This is just demonic deception. I'll let Thoth close off this article and make his departure. Now I depart from ye into darkness. Now go I to the halls of Amenti. The serpent was Lucifer. Even Madame Helena Blavatsky, the occult giant who wrote the secret doctrine, clearly states this. The basis of all Luciferian occult apotheosis is based upon the snake in the garden being the real god, and that real god to them is Lucifer. Apotheosis is the Gnostic Luciferian promise through secret knowledge. It is called Gnosticism, and it is an inversion of the traditional Christian interpretation as the snake offering secret knowledge that will doom man to mortality, which is what actually happened in the story. As Satanist, Freemason, and founder of the Theosophical Society, Madame Helena Blavatsky said on page 539 of her book, The Secret Doctrine, Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty. Independence Lucifer is the Logos, the Serpent, the Savior, and it is Lucifer who is the God of our planet, and the only God, and she continues, the Celestial Virgin which thus becomes the Mother of Gods and Devils at one and the same time, for she is the ever-loving Beneficent Deity. But in antiquity and reality, Lucifer or Luciferians is the name. Lucifer is the Divine and Terrestrial Light, the Holy Ghost, and Satan at one and the same time. These are the mystery Babylon teachings repackaged as the New Age. However, this Gnostic promise of eternal life and apotheosis though hermetic teachings of the Emerald Tablets and mystery Babylon muster school teachings is pure Luciferian deception. You simply die and gain nothing, not even wisdom. You gain a life of deception.
It is fascinating how New Agar's lust for secret knowledge through the hermetic teachings of the Emerald Tablets and Kabbalistic doctrine, in spite of the Genesis warning of what the snake actually offer, deception. It illustrates to me how powerful Luciferian ideologies are ruling in the world today, and how deceived so many people have become. Again, the Gnostic inverted the garden story to achieve this current worldwide New Age deception. I was a New Age teacher, I taught yoga, crystals, astral travel, meditation, Nibiru returning, Anunnaki, Pharmakia, astrology, Kundalini channeling, Tantra, numerology, ancient astronauts, tarot, etc. All of it. The Eastern mystical traditions of reincarnation and apotheosis though cosmic consciousness, etc. And it just never ends. It is all Luciferian deception. It takes years to figure it out. Talk to your basic New Agar, and they will tell you about how they are merging their consciousness with the cosmos to achieve enlightenment with the higher vibrations of the universe through this secret esoteric knowledge they are attaining. It is exactly the situation from the garden where man was warned not to partake of this knowledge, and yet how many New Age teachers are online teaching the world to quest for this secret esoteric Gnostic knowledge? Everyone. So deluded and lost it is the saddest thing in the world to witness. In the New Age, you are taught to seek Christ consciousness. You never achieve anything. You die trying. It is all Luciferian lie and satanic deception. Constantine rewrote the Bible, Sumerian tablets are just being discovered and their cuneiform untouched. These are all assumptions. Nobody has ever proven that Constantine tampered with every book in the Bible. Check your sources. Who is telling you this? Who is interpreting the Sumerian tablets for you? Who are all these sources? You'll find they all have agendas and deception laced in everything they are telling you. I have revealed modern science to be an absolute fraud, so what makes any of these sources credible? What are the scholars' names? There is no enlightenment. The emerald tablets lead nowhere. You will die with zero power from them, like we all do. It was all a Luciferian deception. On your deathbed, all you studied evaporates. If you watch someone die, you can see it. There is no salvation in esoteric secret knowledge. It does not save you from death. Feeling enlightened is like experiencing a cocaine high and thinking it will never end. You always come down. In the case of the emerald tablets at death, your brain shuts down and all that enlightenment is gone. Salvation does not come through esoteric secret knowledge. You cannot save yourself. We all die as a whimpering child, powerless. The Nag Hammadi Gnostic Gospels were discovered in 1945, and you think they are authentic, but the Bible was formed thousands of years ago and somehow it is a fraud. Think about your logic. Which would have a greater chance of being a fraud? A book that is consistent in every country in the world for thousands of years, or some manuscripts a private party claims to have found that magically supports a Luciferian perspective of the world to serve the New World Order religion. People assume the authenticity of the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Gospels with zero credible proof and condemn the Bible based upon claims made by would-be experts and scholars who bastardize history and interpret the Sumerian tablets so mistakenly as to be completely criminal like Zachariah Sitchens. For example, Con men are leading you down an epistemic abyss of slippery slopes towards a Luciferian fantasy so obvious that it is being exposed by many who are waking up out of this Luciferian deception that the secret societies have placed us in. Others have posited that Constantine made up the divinity of Christ and ratified this new theology at the Council of Nicaea. 
But the Bible writers and their works, which predate Constantine, clearly outline Christ's divinity. The fact is that many things have been attributed to Constantine that are simply not true. What is true is that Constantine the Great made Christianity popular. It's also true that he joined church and state, and then used force to punish those who would not toe the line of his Christian government. Finally, it's true that Constantine paved the way for the rise of a religious Roman government that would prove to be horrific for many years. Thus, we see here that Christianity was a very specific religion that had nothing to do with Constantine and the Roman Empire and the merging of church and state for political reasons. Constantine saw that Christianity was not going away and was causing conflict with the pagan Talmudic Jewish religions being practiced in Rome. And so, he thought it prudent to create the Council of Nicaea to officiate the acceptance of Christianity as their religion. Gradually, in order to attract the established pagan religions already present in Rome, and thereby unify Rome under one religious rule, Constantine allowed the integration of various pagan religious symbols, iconography, and rituals into this his new contaminated form of Christianity. Jesus Christ never authorized this new pagan Talmudic Jewish Christian hybrid and was staunchly opposed to the pagan Talmudic legalese and rituals practiced by the pagan Talmudic based Jews of his time. They were known as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So, the story is much bigger than we are told, add different than we are told. Everyone claims to have experts on their side and authentic texts and interpretations. Nope. There is no book on earth that poses more of a threat to the Illuminati and Luciferian genocide elite than the Bible. So of course, you are going to learn it is rubbish, consider the source who is teaching you this. Yes, Luke, there is a darker side to the force that you must learn about now. Young, Padawan, you know not where you go. Commentary on Thoth and the Ascended Masters to provide a little more antithesis to the all-pervasive, ad hoc thesis of the New Age, with its renewed fire which is sweeping through the world since Blavatsky wrote her satanically Luciferian. The Secret Doctrine, to assist in ushering the world into the New Age of Horus, I offer a little insight into who the Ascended Masters are. Who are the Ascended Masters? If you are familiar with the New Age movement, you may have heard this term used before to describe beings like Buddha, Jesus, and St. Germain. Ascended Masters, or the Great White Brotherhood or Secret Chiefs, are believed to be spiritually enlightened beings who in past incarnations were ordinary humans, but have went through spiritual transformation to the point of reaching ascension. There are seven rays of ascension and all of the supposed ascended masters are categorized under these rays according to their spiritual qualities, characteristics, and type of message they taught. They all have surpassed the birth cycle, have more good karma than bad karma. No longer need to be reborn since then have ascended surpassed sixth level initiation. Initiations are levels of consciousness and stages of soul development, and the more universal your consciousness becomes the higher you move up the ranks of initiation until you hit the fourth level of initiation where it's no longer necessary for you to reincarnate. At the sixth level of initiation, you have achieved unity with the I am and thus fall into the category of being an ascended master. It is all delusion, of course. You do not truly ascend nor do you attain any kind of universal consciousness. That's merely the bait to seduce you into the hermetic secret mystery school teachings. Just think of the phrase universal consciousness as code for pantheistic trance enslavement, and you'll be much closer to the ultimate truth of the Babylonian hermetic mystery school's final goal. Of course, reincarnation is an utter and proven hoax, so none of this happens. You get one life and you die. That's it. Reincarnation, like evolutionary theory, were socio-spiritual constructs invented by mystery schools to allow them to perpetuate their apotheosis mysticism delusion. 
These two delusional systems were then injected into Freemasonry by Jesuit illuminatists to be, in turn, repackaged as the biological sciences through the Luciferian epistemological cartels, eventually ending up with Freemason Erasmus Darwin writing Zoonomia, a treatise on species origins, which his grandson, Charles Darwin, adapted into the origin of species. Darwinism is merely repackaged hermetic occultism fantasy and has no real empirically scientific support to back it up. To continue, people meditate to contact ascended masters, pray to ascended masters, and even use ascended master oracle card decks for spiritual guidance and wisdom. In the New Age community, they have almost become some sort of gods that some people even pray to for protection from darkness and negative spirits in the astral planes. This is thought of as something being totally harmless and spiritually safe. But as we are about to see, the Ascended Masters have much darker origins. The Great White Brotherhood gave Aleister Crowley his Satanism. Crowley was a famous occultist and Satanist from the 1900s. He referred to himself as the Beast 666 and once said I was not content to just believe in Satan, I wanted to be his chief of staff. He was known as the most wicked man of the 20th century and a full initiate of the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. He taught love under will, so who could argue, right? He came as an angel of light like his source, Lucifer, to lead the world into self-deception and moral decay. Crowley, this high initiate of the Hermetic Golden Dawn, was responsible for murdering untold number babies in human sacrifice rituals to Thoth and Lucifer. He died a degenerate heroin addict, pedophile, and on his deathbed accepted Christ. Go figure? He used to torture and kill animals, use menstrual blood for spell casting, has openly admitted to making blood sacrifices to demons, and performed sex magic on his mistresses, five of which ended up committing suicide. He was also a 33rd degree Freemason, a heroin addict, and believe that, for the highest spiritual working one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim, for nearly all purposes relating to magic, human sacrifice is the best, chapter 12 of the bloody sacrifice, and matters cognate. Essentially, to the Ascended Masters, Eugenics, Racist, War. Anti-Semitism and Freemasonry are not only acceptable, they are actually encouraged and endorsed to help usher in the collapse of the world which would use her in the New Age. They are intrinsically satanic and were merely emissaries of Luciferian Satanism at the core. When you enter the Hermetic Orders to investigate deeper, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is a magic ritual used by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is an occultic sect based on the teachings of Hermes Trismegistus, Thoth. This ritual involves getting rid of spirits or impure forms of the elements from the magician's circle by tracing pentagrams in the air with a dagger, and by the power of certain divine names followed by an invocation of spiritual forces to guard the pentagram. According to other legends of Thoth and an interview with Zechariah Sitchin, Thoth brought civilization to the Mayans and appeared to them in the form of Quetzalcoatl, who was a feathered serpent that the Mayans made human sacrifices to. The method of sacrifice for Quetzalcoatl was to cut someone open while they were alive, pull out their heart, and offer it up to Quetzalcoatl. Thoth also apparently helped start the Sumerian culture and was known to them as Ninjish Zida, a serpent god of the underworld. Sir Leonard Woolley was an excavator of the famous ancient Mesopotamian city of Uar in Sumeria. There, among hundreds of tombs, he found 16 elaborate royal tombs, all containing human sacrificial victims that were stacked on top of each other with numbers as high as over 70 human skeletons in a single tomb. Lovely Thoth and his lust for bloodshed.
Pythagoras' father of Freemasonry Pythagoras started a secret society called the Pythagorean Brotherhood devoted to the study of mathematics. This had a great effect on future esoteric traditions, such as Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry, both of which were occult groups dedicated to the study of mathematics and both of which claimed to have evolved out of the Pythagorean Brotherhood. The mystical and occult qualities of Pythagorean mathematics are discussed in a chapter of Manly P. Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages, entitled Pythagorean Mathematics. Pythagorean theory was tremendously influential on later numerology, which was extremely popular throughout the Middle East and the ancient world. The 8th century Islamic alchemist Jabir Ibn Hayyan, inventor of numerous important chemical processes still in use today, grounded his work in an elaborate numerology greatly influenced by Pythagorean theory. Dash, http colon slash slash www.atlaspythagoras.com slash Pythagoras flat out architects of a spherical world? With few exceptions, most ancient cultures basically had some concept of the earth as an enclosed system, very similar to that which is depicted in the Hebrew Bible. The flat earth model is an archaic belief that the earth's shape is a plane or disk. Many ancient cultures have had conceptions of a flat earth, including Greece until the Classical period, the Bronze Age and Iron Age civilizations of the Near East until the Hellenistic period, India until the Gupta period, early centuries AD and China until the 17th century. It was also typically held in the aboriginal cultures of the Americas, and a flat earth domed by the firmament in the shape of an inverted bowl is common in pre-scientific societies. The paradigm of a spherical earth appeared in Greek philosophy with Pythagoras, 6th century BC, although most pre-Socratics retained the flat earth model. Their cosmography as far as we know anything about it was practically of one type up till the time of the white man's arrival upon the scene. That of the Borneo Dyaks may furnish us with some idea of it. They consider the earth to be a flat surface, whilst the heavens are a dome. A kind of glass shade which covers the earth and comes in contact with it at the horizon. It's not until we get to about 500 years before Christ that we finally start to see people questioning the previous models held by the ancient world to be true. Before anyone was able to physically go out and explore the ends of the earth, from about 500 BC to 150 AD, various Greek philosophers theorized the idea that the earth could be spherical in nature, with north and south polar regions. But no one could actually prove anything through physical observation of an alleged South Pole for instance. Please keep this in mind. This is pre-exploration of the alleged poles. It was during this pre-pole exploration age that people like Pythagoras and later, around 200 BC, the Greek mathematician and philosopher Eratosthenes began to put forth their theories. Prior to that however, it must be noted that the far more advanced builders of megalithic structures such as the various pyramids and temples we see across this earth were among those who believed in an enclosed, flat earth model. In that regard, I found the following quote by Winston Churchill rather interesting, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. Winston Churchill even to this day we still can't figure out how the ancients built such incredible structures. So, could it be that they knew something that was lost to humanity due to the theories of men such as Pythagoras and Eratosthenes? I think so. The very fact that the farther back you go in history, the more prevalent the belief in an enclosed, flat earth becomes, should give us all pause to consider carefully. I'll get to Pythagoras in shortly, but first I'd like to address Eratosthenes. So, the story goes, sometime around 200 BC or so, Eratosthenes invented the discipline of geography. He is best known for being the first person to calculate the circumference of the earth, which he did by applying a measuring system using stakes, 
or the length of stadia during that time period. He was also the first to calculate the tilt of the Earth's axis. I don't know what his calculation was exactly, but according to modern science, this is what they say concerning the Earth's tilt today. The Earth currently has an axial tilt of about 23.4 degrees. This value remains approximately the same relative to a stationary orbital plane throughout the cycles of precession. However, because the ecliptic, i.e. the Earth's orbit, moves due to planetary perturbations, the obliquity of the ecliptic is not a fixed quantity. At present, it is decreasing at a rate of about 47 per century. We have all been taught that the seasons are caused by the 23.4 degrees angular offset, obliquity, between the Earth's axis of rotation and a perpendicular to the Earth's orbital plane with the Sun, see obliquity below. The Earth's rotational axis stays nearly fixed in space, even as the Earth orbits the Sun once each year. As a result, when the Earth is at a certain place in its orbit, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the Sun and experiences summer. Six months later, when the Earth is on the opposite side of the Sun, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun and experiences winter. Earth is tilted on its axis 23.4 degrees relative to its orbit around the Sun. This causes Earth to experience seasons. From late March to late September, Earth is in the part of its orbit where its north pole is tilted toward the Sun. Those of us who live in the northern hemisphere observe that the Sun appears higher in the sky than it does at other times, and we experience more hours of daylight. Since we receive greater accumulated solar energy at this time of year, our temperatures are warmer than they are in other seasons. From late September through late March, Earth is in the part of its orbit where the North Pole is tipped away from the Sun. During this time, the Southern Hemisphere receives more heat and light from the Sun, while Northern Hemisphere inhabitants see the Sun lower in the sky and experience less than 12 hours of daylight. The seasons are not caused by the slightly elliptical orbit of Earth. On the contrary, Earth is slightly closer to the Sun in the Northern Hemisphere winter. This tilt appears to be well designed for life. If Earth were tilted less, the polar regions would receive less energy, reducing the habitable area of the planet. If the Earth were tilted more, the seasons would become more extreme, potentially reducing plant growing seasons and making the environment less hospitable. So according to multiple witnesses, both secular and Christian, the Earth is allegedly tilted at 23.4 degrees off of the center of a 90-degree angle. Well, 90, 23.4 is equal to 66.6. .6. I suppose that's probably just a coincidence. Or is it? See, this is the sort of thing that catches my attention. Because these are Antichrist clues and such clues always lead back to Apollo Osiris Orion Nimrod, who I firmly believe is the beast of revelation that we call the Antichrist. For more on that, please read my book, Babylon Rising, and the first shall be last or watch the following videos, from my Yehoah Triangle series now, if you do watch the above videos, the first thing you will notice is that I used the globe in the introduction animations. This of course is because I produced them before looking into the flat earth controversy. Those videos were made as recently as December of last year, 2014. Here it is just five months later, and now I'm questioning a whole lot of things I thought I knew so well. As a result, I am finding that belief in the globe is not nearly as cut and dry as I would have thought a month and a half ago. That's right. It's only been a month and a half that I have been looking into this issue. Therefore, I do not claim to be an expert in any of this. In fact, the more I'm learning, the more I am realizing just how completely clueless I have been, and may still be. Therefore, my quest for truth continues, and I must say, 
the deeper I dig the stranger and more intriguing it all becomes. In this particular leg of my adventure, I've been seeing how the Greek god Apollo is literally taking center stage in this whole idea of a globe. Please take the time to watch the following video series before going any further, this is so interesting, because we are seeing more and more information coming out leading us to believe in the return of Apollo. Consider the recent discovery of the statue of Apollo, which was raised from the sea a couple of years ago, when Judat Abu Ghrb spotted a dark shape last summer in the waters off Gaza, where he was diving for fish, he initially thought it was a corpse. I was afraid, he told CNN. I put on my goggles, dove underneath and still couldn't tell what it was. I resurfaced and got some help from other people and family members and came back, and after full four hours of trying we managed to get it out of the water, and I was shocked by what I found. It was a life-size bronze statue, believed to be a two. 500-year-old depiction of the ancient Greek god Apollo. He described the half-ton object as treasure pulled out of the sea. Please watch the embedded video on the above-linked CNN webpage and notice how the camera starts off by focusing in on the statue's left eye, which is still in the socket. After that, all other pictures we've seen online show the statue without the left eye. This is significant. It is the classic depiction of Nimrod as also seen in the famous bust of Sargon, depicted below, and the all-seeing, left, eye on the back of our dollar bill. I explain the issue of Nimrod losing his left eye in my 2011 blog, Nimrod, Abraham, the Pharaohs and Moses. In that blog, I wrote, for instance, we are all familiar with the all-seeing eye. But few understand where this whole idea came from. At some point, either before or after Nimrod's death, it would seem that he lost an eye. Anuki, the servant that interpreted Nimrod's dream and possibly the author of the tales of the Anunnaki, said that part of the dream means nothing else, but the seed of Abram will slay the king in latter days. Jeshur chapter 27 tells how Esau, Abraham's grandson, fulfills this prophecy. Thus, I see Anuki's interpretation as symbolic of two things, one, Nimrod's first death in the days to come from that time. Two, Nimrod's coming second death in the latter days, those we call the last days. Consider, woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Zechariah 11.17 KJV, remember what I wrote concerning Sargon, pictured right, from the last blog? I told you to keep his image in mind, because true to Nimrod's dream, he is now missing an eye. So, if the losing of the eye represents his death, we can now clearly see the other symbolic reference here. Through the cult of Osiris, though all-seeing, remaining eye seems to indicate a return. This is further confirmed by the numerous tales and iconography associated with Osiris, such as the Ankh and the Phoenix both of which refer to resurrection. Again, Anuki said this would happen, in the latter days. Two eyes, two deaths. So, this seems to confirm our thesis concerning who the end-time Antichrist is. He is the one who was, is not and yet shall be, the first of the seven heads of the beast John described in Revelation 17. Tom Horn and Peter Goodgame also wrote extensively about this. Others are picking up on it as well. Regarding Apollo, I have been seeing some interesting things at Target the past few Xmas seasons. For starters, the Target logo is the symbol of Apollo. They also have a tool kit line named Apollo Tools. Apollo Elementary School linked up with Target. But perhaps most interesting of all was the following product display. I took this picture while standing in the line for the checkout counter. 
The phoenix in Egypt was known as the Benu, which was associated with the sun, creation and rebirth and specifically the resurrection of Osiris. Interestingly enough NASA has plans of using the OSIRIS-REx probe to make contact with an asteroid known as the Bennu which oh yeah, just so happened to have been discovered on September 11, 1999, gotta love the Illuminati's code language constantly being put out in plain sight. This is exceptionally interesting. The Bennu is said to live for 500 years, die and then rise again out of its own ashes, as the Phoenix. NASA's OSIRIS-RX mission and the Planetary Society invited you to submit your name for a round-trip ride to asteroid Bennu. Your name will hitch a ride to the asteroid, spend 500 days there, and return in the sample return capsule to Earth in 2023. OSIRIS-REx is part of the New Frontiers program of NASA. This caught my attention for two reasons, one, New Frontiers Marketing and the New Frontier Incorporated. Were the names of the first two companies I created when I left the Army in 1993 and two, CERN also has a program called New Frontiers. Now, granted, any time we launch out into the exploration of new ideas and places we've not seen before, the term New Frontier is a natural choice. But could it be that NASA and CERN are working together toward the same goal? A goal that directly relates to the numbers 9 and 11. As in Revelation 9-11? I think so. And while NASA does their part, CERN claims to have the key to the New Frontier, this year, the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, will restart at the record collision energy of 13 TeV, following a two-year-long shutdown, LS1, for planned maintenance. To mark this, today saw the LS1 activities coordinator symbolically handing over the LHC key to the operations team. The team will now perform tests on the machine in preparation for the restart this spring. After three years of highly successful running, the LHC was shut down for maintenance in 2013. Since then, engineers and technicians have been repairing and strengthening the 27-kilometer accelerator in preparation for its restart at 13 TeV. Some 18 of the 12 32 dipole magnets that steer particle beams around the accelerator were replaced, and more than 10,000 electrical interconnections between the magnets were strengthened. The LHC's vacuum, cryogenics and electronics systems were also consolidated. It's important to stress that after the long shutdown, the LHC is essentially a new machine, said CERN Director General Rolf Hoyer in his New Year address at CERN last week. CERN has the key to the new frontier? NASA's OSIRIS-REx is going to be looking for alien DNA for 500 days on an asteroid named Bennu that just so happened to have been discovered on September 11th. Revelation 9-11 talks about the release of Apollo from the bottomless pit? Meh. Probably just a coincidence. I'm getting way ahead of myself anyway. We'll come back to CERN much later in this series. In the meantime, go back and look at the above AXE Apollo slash Phoenix display I saw at Target. AXE is often pitched as the cologne men need to attract women, even falling female angels. Mythological history of the sun Apollo was associated with law, philosophy, and the arts. He sometimes gave the gift of prophecy to mortals whom he loved, such as the Trojan princess Cassandra. One of the most important Olympian gods, Apollo is the son of Zeus and Leto, and the twin brother of Artemis. He is considered the ideal of manly beauty, so that a very handsome man might be called an Apollo. He is also the god of poetry and music. Apollo replaced the titan Helios as the sun god however, the Greeks didn't delete Helios completely but referred to both of them as the sun gods. The Arrows of Apollo and Artemis invariably killed and the Greeks explained epidemics of diseases by supposing that they were shooting their arrows at people, and so, 
by praying to Apollo, the epidemic might be made to stop. In this way, Apollo became associated with the cure of diseases. Such so-called cures led to a myth in which Apollo was thought to have had a son, Asclepius, as Klepeus, who is better known under the Roman version of the name, Esculapius, Esculapius. He was a mortal medical healer who was so successful that he was reputed to have the ability to bring the dead back to life, which resulted in complaints by Hades. As a result, to keep peace in the godly family, Zeus killed him with a thunderbolt. After his death, Esculapius became a god and he was also placed among the constellations, where he is pictured as a man holding a serpent in his hands. The snake was a symbol of medicine and doctors and the Latin name for his constellation is Ophiuchus, Ophiyoocus, which means serpent holder. His symbol, the rod of Esculapius, is not to be confused with the staff of Hermes or the Caduceus. The rod of Esculapius is a single rod with a single snake. The Caduceus is a rod with two intertwined snakes and wings. Sometimes the stars forming the serpent are referred to as a separate constellation called Serpens, Serpent, and occasionally the whole constellation is referred to as Serpentarius. Apollo became significant among the Romans when Augustus Caesar, as a young man, chose Apollo as his own god and attributed his victory over Antony and Cleopatra to Apollo's superiority over monstrous Egyptian and Oriental deities, whose cults appeared to him to be lascivious and orgiastic. At least one Roman writer, Horace in his Carmen Seculaire, expressed what Augustus thought of Apollo, governor of Roman destiny, master of the sun, archer, augur, averter of pestilence, and giver of sound morals to the young. Shortly after the blood moon eclipse of December 21, 2010, Ophiuchus was added as the 13th sign to the zodiac. Ophiuchus was known for raising Orion from the dead and emptying Hades. I dealt with all of this in my book, Babylon Rising and the first shall be last and in my blog, 72 and a red moon rising and also in my video, The Omega Plan? Below, without a doubt, at least in my mind, the story of Apollo is the story of Osiris. The story of Osiris is the story of Nimrod. Nimrod is the mighty hunter, Orion, who stood in defiance of YHWH, attempting to build a tower to reach into heaven in order to kill God and set up a new world order. I go into a lot of detail concerning all of this in my book, Babylon Rising, and the first shall be last. So I won't go any further in trying to explain it all here. Suffice it to say, I am more than convinced of these connections. Now, I'm seeing how it all may be playing into my current research regarding the flat earth controversy. I will try to pull it all together in this new series of blogs dealing with Apollo. In the meantime, let's get back to Eratosthenes. Modern science believes he may have accurately calculated the distance from the earth to the sun and invented the leap day. He created the first map of the world incorporating parallels and meridians, based on the available geographical knowledge of the era. Quite a guy, huh? But how did he do all of that? Well, apparently, he noticed the shadow on an obelisk in Egypt at one location was different from how it appeared at another location at the same time of day. One had almost no shadow, while the other had a long shadow. His conclusion was that the Earth must be a sphere, and so with that preconceived notion, he did some math calculations to prove that notion and determine how big the alleged sphere was. Listen to Carl Sagan tell the story. That all seems reasonable enough, however, the same thing can be observed in the flat Earth model. But in the flat Earth model, the Sun is not millions of miles away. Rather it is much closer and way smaller than the standard model we've all been taught. With the smaller, moving sun inside the dome of an enclosed flat earth, you still get the same exact results as those Eratosthenes observed. 
To prove this, in a 3D program called Poser, I created a flat plane, with two obelisks, and a point light with a limited throw, I then moved that light from being over the top of one to being over the top of the other. Then I zoomed out and raised the camera high above the scene to show how day and night still works with this model as well. The point light only illuminates a specified area. The other areas remain in the dark. You can see my video here, so, at least in my mind, the early Greek meter stick and obelisk experiment proves one of at least two ideas at best. It is by no means conclusive. But there can be no doubt that Eratosthenes was the one who really got the ball rolling on this topic. Obviously, when looking back through history, we can find a handful of ancient mathematicians and philosophers who kicked around the idea of a globe based on observations and conclusions similar to those of Pythagoras and Eratosthenes. But it never really caught on in mainstream thought until you get to Copernicus. Galileo, Kepler and Newton The Masonic Dictionary has been designed to provide Freemasons with electronic access to information on Freemasonry from a variety of sources arranged alphabetically by subject matter. The purpose of the site is to assist Masons in understanding their fraternity, and to provide those who would like to research the craft an opportunity to do so online. This site claims to be the go-to place for Freemasons. It has this to say about Pythagoras, Pythagoras taught, as the principal dogma of his philosophy the system of metempsychosis, or the transmigration of souls. He taught the mystical power of numbers, and much of the symbolism on that subject which we now pass on is derived from what has been left to us by his disciples, for of his own writings there is nothing extant. Disdaining the vanity and dogmatism of the ancient sages, he contented himself with proclaiming that he was simply a seeker after knowledge, not its possessor, and to him is attributed the introduction of the word philosopher, or lover of wisdom, as the only title which he would assume. After the lawless destruction of his school at Crotona, he fled to the Locrians, who refused to receive him, when he repaired to Metapontum, and sought an asylum from his enemies in the Temple of the Muses where tradition says that he died of starvation at near the end of the 6th or the beginning of the 5th century. Some claim the date to be 506 BC, when he was about 76 years old. The schools established by Pythagoras at Crotona and other cities have been considered by many writers as the models after which Masonic lodges were subsequently constructed. They undoubtedly served the Christian ascetics of the first century as a pattern for their monastic institutions, with which institutions the Freemasonry of the Middle Ages, in its operative character, was intimately connected. The mode of living in the school of Crotona was like that of the modern communists. The brethren, about 600 in number, with their wives and children, resided in one large building. Every morning the business and duties of the day were arranged, and at night an account was rendered of the day's transactions. They arose before day to pay their devotions to the sun, and recited verses from Homer, Hesiod, or some other poet. So, according to Freemasonry's own dictionaries and encyclopedias, their hero, Pythagoras was a sun-worshipping pagan. He ended his life among the Temple of the Muses, who were directly linked to Apollo in the ancient writings of the Greeks. According to the website Greek-Gods.info, we can read, The creation of the Muses The Muses were nine very intelligent, beautiful, and careless divinities. Each muse was responsible for a different literary or poetic genre. They were created by Zeus, the king of the gods, who secretly laid for nine nights with Mnemosyne, the tetanus of memory. The role of the Muses and Apollo the Muses were brought to life to make the world disremember the evil and relieve the sorrows and to praise the gods, and especially the Olympian gods' victory over their ancestors, the Titans. Apollo was the main teacher of the Muses. They were usually accompanying him and the graces on their strolls and loved singing and dancing on soft feet on laurel leaves, 
while Apollo was playing the lyre. Copernicus' son worshipping a cultist for a time, Copernicus lived in the same house as the principal astronomer at the university, Domenico Maria de Navarra, Latin, Domenicus Maria Noveria Ferrariensis, 1454-1504. Navarra had the responsibility of issuing annual astrological prognostications for the city, forecasts that included all social groups, but gave special attention to the fate of the Italian princes and their enemies. Copernicus, as is known from Reticus, was assistant and witness to some of Navarra's observations, and his involvement with the production of the annual forecasts means that he was intimately familiar with the practice of astrology. In Copernicus's period, astrology and astronomy were considered subdivisions of a common subject called the science of the stars whose main aim was to provide a description of the arrangement of the heavens, as well as the theoretical tools and tables of motions that would permit accurate construction of horoscopes and annual prognostications. Although various biographies of Copernicus deny his support of fortune-telling astrology others suggest he was an avid reader of the writings of Pythagoras among others. Copernicus was developing new ideas inspired by reading the epitome of the Almagest, Epitome in Almagestum Ptolemy by George von Purbach and Johannes Regiomontanus, Venice, 1496. He verified its observations about certain peculiarities in Ptolemy's theory of the moon's motion, by conducting on March 9, 1497 at Bologna a memorable observation of the occultation of Aldebaran, the brightest star in the Taurus constellation, by the moon. Copernicus the humanist sought confirmation for his growing doubts through close reading of Greek and Latin authors, Pythagoras, Aristarchos of Samos, Cleomedes, Cicero, Pliny the Elder, Plutarch, Philolaus, Heraclides, Ecphantos, Plato, Gathering, especially while at Padua. Fragmentary historic information about ancient astronomical, cosmological, and calendar systems. While nothing I read about Copernicus led me to believe he was ever a Freemason, or that he received his revelation of heliocentricity from Apollo, the fact remains. He was certainly influenced by the writings of those who did worship the sun god Apollo. Admittedly however, this is only circumstantial evidence at best, and nothing worthy of condemning the man as being a follower of Apollo himself and him being pictured with a compass and square in the above picture doesn't automatically make him, or any of the others, a Freemason either. I've used a compass and square plenty of times myself, and I am not, nor is anyone in my immediate family a Freemason. It is however interesting how much the Freemasons do love Copernicus, and in fact have lodges named in his honor, such as Lodge Copernicus No. 246 in Lodge Copernicus No. 505 in Poland's Mother Lodge Copernic among others. So, perhaps he is guilty by association? I don't know as far as any of that goes. However, this much I do know, his ideas have always been challenged, even as recently as in the beginning of the 20th century, and indeed even to this day. Now let's talk about Galileo. He is a rather interesting fellow I must say. The Wikipedia account of his clash with the Catholic Church caught my attention. The Galileo Affair, controversy over heliocentrism in the Catholic world prior to Galileo's conflict with the Church. The majority of educated people subscribe to the Aristotelian geocentric view that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that all heavenly bodies revolved around the Earth despite the use of Copernican theories to reform the calendar in 1582. Biblical references Psalm 93 1, 96,10, and 1 Chronicles 16 30 include texts stating that the world is firmly established, it cannot be moved. In the same manner, Psalm 104,5 says, The Lord set the earth on its foundations, it can never be moved. Further, Ecclesiastes 1 colon 5 states that and the sun rises and sets and returns to its place. 
Galileo defended heliocentrism, and in his letter to the Grand Duchess Christina argued that it was not contrary to biblical texts. He took the Augustinian position that poetry, songs, instructions, or historical statements in biblical texts need not always be interpreted literally. Galileo argued that the authors wrote from the perspective of the terrestrial world in which the sun does rise and set and discussed a different kind of movement of the earth, not rotations. By 1615 Galileo's writings on heliocentrism had been submitted to the Roman Inquisition, and his efforts to interpret the Bible were seen as a violation of the Council of Trent. Attacks on the ideas of Copernicus had reached a head, and Galileo went to Rome to defend himself and Copernican ideas. In 1616, an inquisitorial commission unanimously declared heliocentrism to be foolish and absurd in philosophy and formally heretical since it explicitly contradicts in many places the sense of Holy Scripture. The Inquisition found that the idea of the Earth's movement receives the same judgment in philosophy and, in regard to theological truth it is at least erroneous in faith. 58. The original document from the Inquisitorial Commission was made widely available in 2014. Pope Paul V instructed Cardinal Bellarmine to deliver this finding to Galileo and to order him to abandon the Copernican opinions. On February 26, Galileo was called to Bellarmine's residence and ordered to abandon completely the opinion that the sun stands still at the center of the world and the earth moves and henceforth not to hold, teach, or defend it in any way whatever, either orally or in writing. The Inquisition's Injunction Against Galileo, 1616 The decree of the Congregation of the Index banned Copernicus's De Revolutionibus and other heliocentric works until correction. Bellarmine's instructions did not prohibit Galileo from discussing heliocentrism as a mathematical fiction. While I am not by any means a supporter of the Catholic Church, I will say they stood firm on the text of Scripture concerning this issue. My own studies have shown that Scripture in no way supports a model of the Earth as a spinning globe, orbiting around the Sun. As with my research on Copernicus, I really didn't find a whole lot of confirming evidence that would lead me to a firm conclusion that Galileo was a Freemason or that he served the Greek god Apollo. He seems to me to have simply been a man of science who challenged the status quo, interestingly enough, right around the time of the publishing of the King James Bible, which does not in any way support a spinning globe orbiting around the sun. Still, it is obvious Galileo was picking up where Copernicus left off, who himself seemed to have been influenced by Pythagoras, who was influenced by Apollo. The same is true of Kepler. Indeed, that was the mode of that era, European learning was based on the Greek sources that had been passed down, and cosmological and astronomical thought were based on Aristotle and Ptolemy. Aristotle's cosmology of a central earth surrounded by concentric spherical shells carrying the planets and fixed stars was the basis of European thought from the 12th century CE onward. Technical astronomy, also geocentric, was based on the constructions of eccentric circles and epicycles codified in Ptolemy's Almagest, 2d. Century CE. From this, we may see the fact that they had a variety of ideas to choose from, all originating with ancient Greek sources, some of which came to conflicting conclusions based on differing ideas and points of view. These later men of science thus had to wrestle with these things and through their own observations and testing, came up with new theories, based on their findings, which were derived from better instruments than what the ancients had to work with when coming up with their theories. Still, perhaps unlike Galileo, it would seem that Kepler was influenced by ideas concerning the Greek god Apollo. In 1594 Kepler accepted an appointment as professor of mathematics at the Protestant seminary in Graz, in the Austrian province of Styria. He was also appointed district mathematician and calendar maker. 
Kepler remained in Graz until 1600, when all Protestants were forced to convert to Catholicism or leave the province as part of counter-reformation measures. For six years, Kepler taught arithmetic, geometry, when there were interested students, Virgil, and rhetoric. In his spare time, he pursued his private studies in astronomy and astrology. According to the Galileo Project website, Kepler taught Virgil for six years while studying astrology in his spare time. This caught my attention because of some of the things I had written in Chapter 4 of my book, Babylon Rising, and the first shall be last. In that chapter, I show how Virgil also had a heavy influence on a man by the name of Charles Thompson. He's the guy who worked on the Great Seal of the United States. Now go grab a US $1 bill, flip it over and read the motto, Novus Ordo Seclorum under the pyramid. That Latin phrase was taken from a line in the following poem by Virgil. Muses of Sicily, let me sing a little more grandly, now the last age of the Cumian prophecy begins, the great roll call of the centuries is born anew, now virgin justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign, with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only favor the child who's born, pure Lucina, under whom the first race of iron shall end, and a golden race rise up throughout the world, now your Apollo reigns. He will take on divine life, and he will see gods mingled with heroes, and be seen by them, and rule a peaceful world with his father's powers. O dear child of the gods, take up your high honors, the time is near, great son of Jupiter. See the world, with its weighty dome, bowing, earth and wide sea and deep heavens, see how everything delights in the future age. Excerpts from Virgil's Eclogue 4 the Golden Age The original Latin phrase translated into English as, The great roll call of the centuries is born, or begins, anew, in the first paragraph is, Magnus ab integro seclorum nascitur ordo. Thompson shortened this phrase to novus ordo seclorum, which means, a new order of the ages, and placed it below the great pyramid on the great seal. The phrase, annuit coeptus above the pyramid means favors undertakings. It is an incomplete statement, thus, the subject must be supplied. Who is the one favoring and what undertakings are being favored? The iconography must be taken as a whole. Therefore, the meaning and answer to those questions is in the great seal itself. The eye of providence that sits hovering over the pyramid and between Anuit and Coeptus is better known as the all-seeing eye of Horus Osiris Nimrod and it serves as the best candidate for answering the question of who we are talking about here. However, if we were to take it a step further and consider what, or who, inspired Charles Thompson to use this phrase, we must again look to his favorite poet Virgil. In Book 9 of Virgil's Aeneid, we find the Latin phrase, Audacibus anu coeptus. Essentially, it means, grant me success in this brave venture. It is a prayer. To whom is the subject, in this case, Ascanius, praying? He is praying to his god, Jupiter slash Zeus, asking him for victory in his battle against Remulus. All-powerful Jupiter, ascent to my bold attempt. I myself will bring gifts each year to your temple, and I'll place before your altar a snow-white bullock with gilded forehead, carrying his head as high as his mother already budding with his horns, and scattering sand with his hooves. Excerpt from Virgil's Aeneid Book 9 Note how we have Roman, Greek, Egyptian and Babylonian themes all on one cipher on the back of our currency. We must acknowledge that there is a great deal of information encoded in the symbols of our nation's great seal all of which is hidden in plain sight. Thus, we must be made aware that the in God we trust is not the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, but rather the gods of the ancient, pagan world. Both Thompson and Kepler taught and were influenced by Virgil. Kepler's teacher in the mathematical subjects was Michael Maestlin, 1550-1635. 
Maestlin was one of the earliest astronomers to subscribe to Copernicus's heliocentric theory, although in his university lectures he taught only the Ptolemaic system. Only in what we might call graduate seminars did he acquaint his students, among whom was Kepler, with the technical details of the Copernican system. Kepler stated later that at this time he became a Copernican for physical or, if you prefer, metaphysical reasons. In 1610 Kepler heard and read about Galileo's discoveries with the spyglass. He quickly composed a long letter of support, which he published as Dissertatio cum Nuncio Siderio conversation with the sidereal messenger and when, later that year, he obtained the use of a suitable telescope. He published his observations of Jupiter's satellites under the title Narratio de Observatus Quatuor Jovis Satellitibus, narration about four satellites of Jupiter observed. These tracks were an enormous support to Galileo, whose discoveries were doubted or denied by many. Both of Kepler's tracks were quickly reprinted in Florence. Kepler went on to provide the beginning of a theory of the telescope in his Diopterus, published in 1611. So, here we have Kepler reading Virgil. Virgil talks about praying to Jupiter and the rise of Apollo's reign on Earth. Then, after observing Jupiter, Kepler becomes a supporter of Galileo, for metaphysical reasons, leading to him publishing the beginning of his theories the same year as the King James Bible comes out, which absolutely does not support what these men are proposing. Call me crazy and perhaps all of that means nothing, but I just find the timing and circumstances surrounding of all of this quite interesting. Finally, we have Sir Isaac Newton. For a long time, I had considered him to have been brilliant scientist and an amazing Christian man of God. Now, I am not so sure about the latter. I won't say this with any measure of certainty, but it may be that just like many of our so-called American founding fathers, he was just another one of these incredibly intelligent guys who knew the Christian lingo, knew the Bible, but had a secret life wrapped around occult beliefs and activities. There certainly does appear to be a variety of online articles books coming out these days that would seem to support that idea. Isaac Newton produced many works that would now be classified as occult studies. These works explored chronology, alchemy, and biblical interpretation, especially of the apocalypse. Newton's scientific work may have been of lesser personal importance to him as he placed emphasis on rediscovering the occult wisdom of the ancients. In this sense, some believe that any reference to a Newtonian worldview as being purely mechanical in nature is somewhat inaccurate. After purchasing and studying Newton's alchemical works in 1942, economist John Maynard Keynes, for example, opined that Newton was not the first of the age of reason, he was the last of the magicians. In the early modern period of Newton's lifetime, the educated embraced a worldview different from that of later centuries. Distinctions between science, superstition, and pseudoscience were still being formulated, and a devoutly Christian biblical perspective permeated Western culture. Newton and secret societies Isaac Newton has often been associated with various secret societies and fraternal orders throughout history. Due to the secretive nature of such organizations, lack of supportive publicized material, and dubious motives for claiming Newton's participation in these groups, it is difficult to establish his actual membership in any specific organization. Regardless of his own membership status, Newton was a known associate of many individuals who themselves have often been labeled as members of various esoteric groups. It is unclear if these associations were a result of his being a well-established and prominently publicized scholar, an early member and sitting president of the Royal Society, 1703-1727, a prominent figure of state and master of the mint, a recognized knight. Or if Newton actually sought active membership within these esoteric organizations himself. 
Considering the nature and legality of alchemical practices during his lifetime, as well as his possession of various materials and manuscripts pertaining to alchemical research, Newton may very well have been a member of a group of like-minded thinkers and colleagues. The organized level of this group, if in fact any existed, the level of their secrecy, as well as the depth of Newton's involvement within them, remains unclear. Though Newton was largely considered a reclusive personality and not prone to socializing, during his lifetime being a member of societies or clubs was a very popular form of interpersonal networking. Considering his esteemed social status, it is probable that Newton would have had at least some contact with such groups at various levels. He was most certainly a member of the Royal Society of London for the Improvement of Natural Knowledge and the Spalding Gentleman's Society, however, these are considered learned societies, not esoteric societies. Newton's membership status within any particular secret society remains verifiably elusive and largely speculative, however, it still lends itself to popular sensationalism. Newton and the Rosicrucians Perhaps the movement which most influenced Isaac Newton was Rosicrucianism. Though the Rosicrucian movement had caused a great deal of excitement within Europe's scholarly community during the early 17th century, by the time Newton had reached maturity the movement had become less sensationalized. However, the Rosicrucian movement still would have a profound influence upon Newton, particularly in regard to his alchemical work and philosophical thought. The Rosicrucian belief in being specially chosen for the ability to communicate with angels or spirits is echoed in Newton's prophetic beliefs. Additionally, the Rosicrucians proclaimed to have the ability to live forever through the use of the elixir vitae and the ability to produce limitless amounts of time and gold from the use of the philosopher's stone, which they claimed to have in their possession. Like Newton, the Rosicrucians were deeply religious, avowedly Christian, anti-Catholic, and highly politicized. Isaac Newton would have a deep interest in not just their alchemical pursuits, but also their belief in esoteric truths of the ancient past and the belief in enlightened individuals with the ability to gain insight into nature, the physical universe, and the spiritual realm. At the time of his death, Isaac Newton had 169 books on the topic of alchemy in his personal library and was believed to have considerably more books on this topic during his Cambridge years, though he may have sold them before moving to London in 1696. For its time, his was considered one of the finest alchemical libraries in the world. In his library, Newton left behind a heavily annotated personal copy of the fame and confession of the Fraternity R.C. by Thomas Vaughan which represents an English translation of the Rosicrucian Manifestos. Newton also possessed copies of Themis Aurea and Symbola Aurea Mensi Duodicium by the learned alchemist Michael Meyer both of which are significant early books about the Rosicrucian movement. These books were also extensively annotated by Newton. Newton's ownership of these materials by no means denotes membership within any early Rosicrucian order. Furthermore, considering that his personal alchemical investigations were focused upon discovering materials which the Rosicrucians professed to already be in possession of long before he was born, would seem to some to exclude Newton from their membership. However, in religious terms, the fact that a saint might have found God would not preclude others from the search quite the opposite. The ancient and mystical order Rosie Crucis has always claimed Newton as a frauder. During his own life, Newton was openly accused of being a Rosicrucian, as were many members of the Royal Society. Though it is not known for sure if Isaac Newton was in fact a Rosicrucian, and he never publicly identified himself as one, from his writings it does appear that he may have shared many of their sentiments and beliefs. Excerpts from Chapter 3 of the book, Isaac Newton's Freemasonry, The Alchemy of Science and Mysticism by Alain Bauer Lou Verlet writes of the conditions of the miraculous discovery of Newton's unpublished manuscripts. 
Put in a stack in 1696 when he was leaving the directorship of the Mint in London, they escaped the burning of his personal documents arranged just after his death. They were discovered two centuries later and put up at auction in 1936. John Maynard Keynes won the manuscripts and revealed that Newton was not only the first physicist, but also the last magician. The hall included several alchemical works, the bulk of them now at Cambridge, some at the University of Jerusalem, and others in private collections. According to Verlet, Newton's known work comprises 1.4 million words relating to theology, 550,000 on alchemy, 150,000 on monetary affairs, and 1 million on scientific problems. Verlet considers Newton, from a scientific point of view, to have been a coincidence. If he had not lived, the development of the sciences would surely have been delayed, and the work begun by Galileo and Descartes would have been slowed down. But by hiding his secrets away, Newton the Magus also hid the alchemical, hermetic, and esoteric dimensions which elucidated his research. From this point of view, Victoria's science made its complex matrix disappear. Isabel Stengers writes that Newton affirmed, I do not feign hypotheses, I stick to phenomena. This did not hinder his speculative theories and placed him in contrast with the contemplative Galileo. In 1669, according to Richard Westfall, Newton immersed himself in alchemical literature. Betty Jo Teeter Dobbs affirms that Newton read virtually everything alchemical that had ever been published, and a good many things that had not. Numerous manuscripts from Hartlib's circle were copied by Newton himself. His friend Robert Boyle served him as a link to other circles of Rosicrucians and alchemists. Elias Ashmole did the same in writing his Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum, published in 1652. Newton even devised an anagram of his name as a pseudonym, Isaacus Newtonus becoming Giava Sanctus Unus, which allowed him to exchange manuscripts with his correspondence while remaining anonymous, despite widespread speculation. In Newton's personal archives, a great many manuscripts have been found with lengthy annotations, Philolith secrets revealed from 1669, Senda Vogis Novum Lumen Chemicum, Espagnets Arcanum Hermeticae Philosophiae, Myers Symbola Ori Immensi Duodecim. The opera of George Ripley, the great English alchemist, Basil Valentine's Triumphal Chariot of Antimony. Most of these are preserved at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. What does all of this have to do with the flat earth controversy? The main thing I want you to get out of the above is how much the occult, Freemasonry, and specifically the worship of and or other associations with Apollo always seem to pop up where the subject of the globe is concerned. These Apollo slash sun god worshippers and believers in heliocentricity caused many to either question, totally rethink and or toss out what the scriptures actually say concerning the earth and its place in the cosmos. With all of the above in mind, I've been trying to piece together a timeline of events from Nimrod to CERN and its potential activity this coming September 2015. I will begin to go through the timeline in part 2 of this series. Staying on the quest for truth, Rob Skiba, 2015. Chapter 5 A web of deceptions Indra's quantum jeweled net The metaphor of Indra's jeweled net is attributed to an ancient Buddhist named Tushan, 557-640 BCE, who asks us to envision a vast net that, at each juncture there lies a jewel, each jewel reflects all the other jewels in this cosmic matrix. Every jewel represents an individual life form, atom, cell or unit of consciousness. Each jewel, in turn, is intrinsically and intimately connected to all the others, thus, a change in one gem is reflected in all the others. This last aspect of the jeweled net is explored in a question-slash-answer dialogue of teacher and student in the Avadamsaka Sutra. In answer to the question, how can all these jewels be considered one jewel? 
It is replied, if you don't believe that one jewel is all the jewels, just put a dot on the jewel in question. When one jewel is dotted, there are dots on all the jewels. Since there are dots on all the jewels, we know that all the jewels are one jewel. The moral of Indra's net is that the compassionate and the constructive interventions a person makes or does can produce a ripple effect of beneficial action that will reverberate throughout the universe or until it plays out. By the same token you cannot damage one strand of the web without damaging the others or setting off a cascade effect of destruction. A good explanation of the Hindu slash Buddhist myth of Indra's net can be found in the Tao of Physics, by Frithjof Capra, particles are dynamically composed of one another in a self-consistent way, and in that sense can be said to contain one another. In Mahayana Buddhism, a very similar notion is applied to the whole universe. This cosmic network of interpenetrating things is illustrated in the Avatamsaka Sutra by the metaphor of Indra's net, a vast network of precious gems hanging over the palace of the god Indra. In the words of Sir Charles Eliot, in the heaven of Indra, there is said to be a network of pearls. So arranged that if you look at one you see all the others reflected in it. In the same way each object in the world is not merely itself, but involves every other object, and in fact is everything else. In every particle of dust, there are present Buddhas without number. Attention, intention, and the universe as a conscious holographic information processor some 2,500 years ago the Buddhist text, the Avatamsaka Sutra, described the cosmos allegorically through the imagery of Indra's net. In the heavenly abode of the deity Indra, there was cast an infinite net reaching in all directions, and at each node point in the net there was a jewel, each reflecting the light of all the others infinitely. Should any jewel be touched, each of the infinite other jewels would instantly be affected, presaging Bell's theorem that everything is interconnected in this interdependent universe. The Buddhist vision essentially describes a holographic universe our holographic universe. In the Tao of Physics, Capra explains the relevance of Indra's net to particle physics, stating that particles are dynamically composed of one another in a self-consistent way, and in that sense can be said to contain one another. This is a principle of the hologram, that each part contains within it the information that codes for the whole. In other words, all information fundamentally exists non-locally infinitely reflected in all the facets of existence. The hologram a hologram is produced when a single laser light is split into two separate beams. The first beam is bounced off the object to be photographed. Then the second beam is allowed to collide with the reflected light of the first on photographic emulsion, film, creating and recording an interference pattern that looks something like the concentric rings that form when a handful of pebbles is tossed into a pond. But as soon as another laser beam, or in some instances just a bright light source, is shined through the film, a three-dimensional image of the original object reappears. What's more, if the image is, for example, cut down the middle or even divided into dozens of fragments, each section will contain not a particular section of the object, but the whole thing, albeit at a lower resolution. Holograms are true three-dimensional images. This is evidenced by the fact that you can move your head while viewing the image and see it in a different perspective. This includes revealing part of the image which was hidden at another viewing angle. Shown above are three images from the same hologram, obtained by looking through it at different angles. Note that the pawn appears in different perspective in front of the king behind it. Each piece of a hologram contains a particular perspective of the image, but it includes the entire object. The image at upper right is the view through the larger part of the hologram, while that at lower right is through a small corner cut off the hologram. While the view through the small corner is from a particular point of view, it contains the whole object. 
The information is essentially distributed non-locally throughout the holographic film. The hologram's ability to store and process massive amounts of data is essentially due to the properties of light, which, incidentally, the body's own DNA and cellular systems all use to communicate throughout our physical organism. The photon itself is considered to be localized information in its purest form. In 1997, a young physicist named Juan Maldacena used M-theory and brains, D-brains to be exact, to suggest that the manifest world in its entirety could be a holographic projection of information embodied in its boundary. The latest discoveries across all scientific disciplines are revealing the physical world, and its multifarious phenomena, is imbued with and informed by a holographic field, thus it is innately interrelated, coherent, and harmonic at all scales of existence. Recently, German scientists using equipment for detecting gravitational waves encountered a particular and unexpected noise, possibly the sound of the microscopic quantum convulsions of space-time, according to Craig Hogan, a physicist at Fermilab in Illinois. Hogan had actually predicted the existence of this sound and approached the Germans with his explanation, suspecting that it may be due to the universe being a giant cosmic hologram. Cosmologists have found that the entire universe can be described as a type of hologram or as interference patterns in space and time. Physicist Raphael Busso wrote, The amazing thing is that the holographic principle works for all areas in all space times. Further proving this applies to all scales. Researchers at IBM created a holographic projection in a carefully arranged assembly of several dozen cobalt atoms 20 nanometers in diameter. When they inserted a magnetic cobalt atom into the ellipse, a fully configured ghostly image of it also appeared at the other focus of the ellipse. Indeed, David Bohm and Carl Prebram discovered the holographic properties of nature concurrently for themselves, working as they were in the physical domain and the realm of the human brain, respectively. The information within a system is more fundamental than the energy through which it expresses itself, and the probabilities that describe a system are never random, as they are often wrongly interpreted, instead, they always embody information. Whether they describe quantum possibilities or macro phenomena in the physical world, everything is fundamentally informational. Noted physicist Anton Zeelinger states succinctly in Dance of the Photons that the concepts of reality and information cannot be separated from each other. This is illustrated brilliantly by Thomas Chaco in his excellent article Is Chance or Choice the Essence of Nature? On apparent electromagnetic, EM, randomness being broadcast over the frequencies of a digital mobile phone network which college students unaware that the frequencies they were observing belonged to actual intelligent conversations between living people were instructed to investigate. The students analyzed the data using a statistical approach that allowed them to actually make predictions of many events within their frequency band. They had become quite convinced that their theory actually described the reality, and statistically speaking, it did to some extent. However, Chaco points out that by adopting a statistical approach the students completely missed millions of very real intelligent phone conversations. Our students just couldn't imagine that what appeared to them as random was actually the consequence of a very intelligently encoded information transfer. As a result they didn't even try to decode anything. The inference is clear, true randomness is an illusion, an artifact of limited perception and knowledge. The universe deals in intelligently encoded information that is intrinsically meaningful and thereby creates an ordered and meaningful cosmos. But there are many ways to analyze and extract information and meaning from the one system, complementarity. The phone calls taking place between people manifested within the EM band as seemingly random fluctuations. But in reality these fluctuations were the result of conscious choices being made each moment by the people holding the conversations that possessed and expressed meaning to them and their own particular methods of analysis.
The phone calls taking place looked random to the students because of the way they looked at them, they were not decoding them in a way that allowed them to extract or perceive the embedded meaning within privy to the speakers. What if the quantum field's random quantum fluctuations are really the functions or effects of the language being spoken by the holographic cosmos as it converses non-locally between its many and varied component parts? What if lurking behind it all is conscious choice on a scale we can barely begin to comprehend? What if the ancients were right and modern science has brought us full circle back to a teleological cosmology? one in which we are no longer the centerpiece of a dead and meaningless universe, but as conscious beings. An integral part of an intelligent and fundamentally conscious holographic multiverse? In a holographic and self-referencing, fractal, universe, if sentience and intelligence exist at one scale, it must exist on all of them. It is interesting that Bohm's research into plasmas yielded the observation that electrons in a plasma configuration began to act as if they were part of a larger, interconnected whole. So much so that he frequently had the impression that the electron C was alive. Mircea Sangelovicu and colleagues have even created plasma spheres that can grow, replicate and communicate, fulfilling most traditional requirements for biological-slash-living cells. Scaling things up, single-celled slime molds demonstrate the ability to memorize and anticipate repeated events, a team of Japanese researchers reported in January 2008. The study clearly shows a primitive version of brain function in an organism with no brain at all. In the late 19th century, over 110 years ago, Sienkowski observed the feeding activities of the amoeba Calpidella pugnax and found them so poignantly indicative of intelligence that he remarked that one is almost inclined to see in them consciously acting beings. Scaling up still further, in his fascinating 1919 study, Modern Psychical Phenomena. Here Ward Carrington detailed rigorous experiments on a group of especially talented horses which were capable of carrying out complex mental arithmetic beyond even the mathematical abilities of the scientific men testing them. Their intelligence and communicative abilities with humans surpassed anything previously expected of the equine species. Knowing that we have this incredible universe ostensibly permeated with intelligence at all scales, the holographic principle demands that these different expressions of consciousness must be integrated and woven together in a unified psychic tapestry, interconnected in ways unrestricted by spacetime, non-locally. This is what psychical research and parapsychology have overwhelmingly shown. I cite many experiments proving this point in the Grand Illusion 1. Dean Radin analyzed the results of variations of staring experiments, constituting 33,357 trials over 60 experiments. The objective in these experiments was for the subject to attempt to guess correctly exactly when they were being stared at when they had no normal way of knowing. The overall success rate was 54.5% as opposed to the 50% expected by chance. Registering odds against chance of 202 octodecillion that's 2 times 1059, to 1. Even accounting for an estimated 6 unreported negative studies, odds against chance remained absurdly high at 1046 to 1. There is an indisputable though subtle observer effect on living systems, in other words. Some sort of subtle infoenergetic transfer in the consciousness or time domain, ether, is precipitated merely by paying attention. Suggesting we infoenergetically communicate with and feed whatever it is we focus on. The research of the Global Consciousness Project, GCP, has yielded irrefutable proof of the link between the quantum C-slash vacuum and processes occurring within the collective human mind on Earth. The GCP has set up all around the globe. Some 65, as at 2007, random number generators, RNGs, whose data is fed into the Internet and linked back to Princeton University. 
The team looks for correlations in the data between the RNGs. For instance, in data from four hours before the September 11th terrorist attacks, which, according to the FBI and the notorious Dick Cheney, cannot be evidentially linked to Osama bin Laden. And certainly not to the bare minimum seven hijackers who turned up alive after the fact, they found an enormous level of coherence between the RNGs. Indicating a hyperdimensional forewarning of a large impending event and collective subconscious focusing on it. The period immediately surrounding the event shows a huge spike in coherence as humanity's collective mind was focused consciously on events as they unfolded. The same results occurred before the Asian tsunami of 2004 and during the funeral service of Princess Diana. The September 11th RNG's deviations from chance represented the largest such deviations for the whole year of 2001. Though there are many other sources substantiating the notion. The GCP alone has effectively proven that consciousness is a real something, that it can see into the near future, collective consciousness focused in harmony can affect quantum events suggesting that consciousness is itself more fundamental than any form of energy slash matter in space-time. That it is sub-quantum in a sense. As I show in TGI 1 and 2, consciousness appears to be synonymous with the spiraling torsion energy of time-space slash the time domain, a non-local implicate order that governs the formation of our space-time reality. It is this energy that appears to be responsible for non-local effects in quantum physics and virtually all mind-matter interactions documented in the annals of psi research. If we are supplying energy to ideas, events and concepts merely by the act of observing or thinking about them, as the staring experiments and many others we don't have space for here suggest, then does the question for us at this point in history become what should we focus on then? Rather than potentially fueling the obvious criminality and corruption of the world's major manipulating political and financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, governments, etc. With our angst and resentment, and rather than feeding undesirable future scenarios with worry about what horrors might yet be, maybe our responsibility in the moment right now is, as Gandhi said, to be the change we want to see in the world. Thus, we answer our earlier question which asked what to direct our mental energies towards, whatever it is that we want to make manifest in the world. After all, the seed conditions for mass paradigm shifts have never been better. Copyright 2011 Brendan D. Murphy, time is on my side, yes it is. Mathemagician mathematics games to give a flavor of how absolutely ridiculous modern quantum mechanics and relativity are when married together by scientism priests with their mathemagician mathematics games. Here are two articles on time and the universe. It swiftly becomes apparent that quantum mechanics and relativity are merely mind games that have zero basis in actual reality. They are repackaged Kabbalistic occult ideas being hammered together with spurious and incomprehensibly obtuse and speculative mathematics. Take special note of the absurdly microscopic units of quantized time these articles speak of. I actually find myself laughing when I consider the amount of unproven rubbish that these pretend scientists put out in defense of their heliocentric globe model. Infinitely vast distances and infinitely minuscule units of time and particle quantization to sufficiently razzle-dazzle each other and you into submission. Without a doubt, they are always trying to outdo each other to win that sought-after acclaim amongst their peers, as well as to gain more clout and earnest praise from starry-eyed, armchair scientists in the back seats of their petty academia arenas. Maybe if they get lucky. Neil deGrasse Tyson or Michio Kaku will announce their little repackaged Kabbalah discovery to the world on the Discovery Channel, another Freemason Jesuit program. It's all a scam. All of it. It's all numeric jazz hands and equational song and dance to get you to submit to their sovereign authority, what Philip Collins calls the ascendancy of the scientific dictatorship.
Don't believe any of it. Ask any of them to first prove that outer space even exists, and then we'll talk about the Planck epoch, the first 5.39x10 to 44 seconds after the Big Bang. Give me a break. Planck's quantum time Kabbalist and mystic, Max Planck, is sometimes considered the father of quantum theory. In the first half of the 20th century, a whole new theory of physics was developed, which has superseded everything we know about classical physics, and even the theory of relativity, which is still a classical model at heart. Quantum theory or quantum mechanics is now recognized as the most correct and accurate model of the universe, particularly at subatomic scales, although for large objects classical Newtonian and relativistic physics work adequately. If the concepts and predictions of relativity, see the section on relativistic time, are often considered difficult and counterintuitive, many of the basic tenets and implications of quantum mechanics may appear absolutely bizarre and inconceivable, but they have been repeatedly proven to be true. And it is now one of the most rigorously tested physical models of all time. Quanta One of the implications of quantum mechanics is that certain aspects and properties of the universe are quantized, i.e. they are composed of discrete, indivisible packets or quanta. For instance, the electrons orbiting an atom are found in specific fixed orbits and do not slide nearer or further from the nucleus as their energy levels change but jump from one discrete quantum state to another. Even light, which we know to be a type of electromagnetic radiation which moves in waves, is also composed of quanta or particles of light called photons, so that light has aspects of both waves and particles. And sometimes it behaves like a wave and sometimes it behaves like a particle, wave-particle duality. An obvious question then would be, is time divided up into discrete quanta? According to quantum mechanics, the answer appears to be no, and time appears to be in fact smooth and continuous, contrary to common belief, not everything in quantum theory is quantized. Tests have been carried out using sophisticated timing equipment and pulsating laser beams to observe chemical changes taking place at very small fractions of a second, down to a femtosecond, or 10-15 seconds, and at that level time certainly appears to be smooth and continuous. However, if time actually is quantized, it is likely to be at the level of Planck time, about 10 to 43 seconds, the smallest possible length of time according to theoretical physics, and probably forever beyond our practical measurement abilities. It should be noted that our current knowledge of physics remains incomplete, and, according to some theories that look to combine quantum mechanics and gravity into a single theory of everything, often referred to as quantum gravity, see below. There is a possibility that time could in fact be quantized. A hypothetical Cronin unit for a proposed discrete quantum of time has been proposed, although it is not clear just how long a Cronin should be. Copenhagen interpretation One of the main tenets of quantum theory is that the position of a particle is described by a wave function, which provides the probabilities of finding the particle at any number of different places or superpositions. It is only when the particle is observed and the wave function collapses that the particle is definitively located in one particular place or another. So, in quantum theory, unlike in classical physics, there is a difference between what we see and what actually exists. In fact, the very act of observation affects the observed particle. Another aspect of quantum theory is the uncertainty principle, which says that the values of certain pairs of variables, such as a particle's location and its speed or momentum, cannot both be known exactly, so that the more precisely one variable is known, the less precisely the other can be known. This is reflected in the probabilistic approach of quantum mechanics, something very foreign to the deterministic and certain nature of classical physics. This view of quantum mechanics, developed by two of the originators of quantum theory, 
Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg is sometimes referred to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Because the collapse of the wave function cannot be undone, and because all the information associated with the initial possible positions of the particle contained in the wave function is essentially lost as soon as it is observed and collapsed, the process is considered to be time irreversible, which has implications for the so-called arrow of time, the one-way direction of time that we observe in daily life, see the section on the arrow of time. Some quantum physicists, e.g. Don Page and William Wooters, have developed a theory that time is actually an emergent phenomenon resulting from a strange quantum concept known as entanglement, in which different quantum particles effectively share an existence, even though physically separated. So that the quantum state of each particle can only be described relative to the other entangled particles. The theory even claims to have experimental proof recently, from experiments by Ekaterina Moriva, which show that observers do not detect any change in quantum particles, i.e. time foes not emerge, until becoming entangled with another particle. Many worlds interpretation the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, mentioned above, is not however the only way of looking at it. Frustrated by the apparent failure of the Copenhagen interpretation to deal with questions like what counts as an observation, and what is the dividing line between the microscopic quantum world and the macroscopic classical world, other alternative viewpoints have been suggested. One of the leading alternatives is the many worlds interpretation, first put forward by Hugh Everett III back in the late 1950s. According to the many worlds view, there is no difference between a particle or system before and after it has been observed, and no separate way of evolving. In fact, the observer himself is a quantum system, which interacts with other quantum systems, with different possible versions seeing the particle or object in different positions, for example. These different versions exist concurrently in different alternative or parallel universes. Thus, each time quantum systems interact with each other, the wave function does not collapse, but actually splits into alternative versions of reality, all of which are equally real. This view has the advantage of conserving all the information from wave functions, so that each individual universe is completely deterministic, and the wave function can be evolved forwards and backwards. Under this interpretation, quantum mechanics is therefore not the underlying reason for the arrow of time. Quantum gravity Quantum gravity, or the quantum theory of gravity, refers to various attempts to combine our two best models of the physics of the universe, quantum mechanics and general relativity, into a workable whole. It looks to describe the force of gravity according to the principles of quantum mechanics and represents an essential step towards the holy grail of physics, a so-called theory of everything. Quantum theory and relativity, while coexisting happily in most respects, appear to be fundamentally incompatible at unapproachable events like the singularities in black holes and the Big Bang itself. And it is believed by many that some synthesis of the two theories is essential in acquiring a real handle on the fundamental nature of time itself. Many different approaches to the riddle of quantum gravity have been proposed over the years, ranging from string theory and superstring theory to M theory and brain theory, supergravity, loop quantum gravity, etc. This is the cutting edge of modern physics and if a breakthrough were to occur it would likely be as revolutionary and paradigm-breaking as relativity was in 1905, and could completely change our understanding of time. Any theory of quantum gravity has to deal with the inherent incompatibilities of quantum theory and relativity, not the least of which is the so-called problem of time, that time is taken to have a different meaning in quantum mechanics and general relativity. This is perhaps best exemplified by the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, devised by John Wheeler and Bruce DeWitt back in the 1970s. Their attempt to unify relativity and quantum mechanics resulted in time essentially disappearing completely from their equations, 
suggesting that time does not exist at all and that, at its most fundamental level, the universe is timeless. In response to the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, some have concluded that time is a kind of fictitious variable in physics, and that we are perhaps confusing the measurement of different physical variables with the actual existence of something we call time. Imaginary time while looking to connect quantum field theory with statistical mechanics, theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking introduced a concept he called imaginary time. Although rather difficult to visualize, imaginary time is not imaginary in the sense of being unreal or made up. Rather, it bears a similar relationship to normal physical time, as the imaginary number scale does to the real numbers in the complex plane, and can perhaps best be portrayed as an axis running perpendicular to that of regular time. It provides a way of looking at the time dimension as if it were a dimension of space, so that it is possible to move forwards and backwards along it, just as one can move right and left or up and down in space. Despite its rather abstract and counterintuitive nature, the usefulness of imaginary time arises in its ability to help mathematically to smooth out gravitational singularities in models of the universe. Normally, singularities like those at the center of black holes, or the Big Bang itself, pose a problem for physicists, because they are areas where the known physical laws just do not apply. When visualized in imaginary time, however, the singularity is removed, and the Big Bang functions like any other point in spacetime. Exactly what such a concept might represent in the real world, though, is unknown. And currently it remains little more than a potentially useful theoretical construct. Time and the Big Bang Some scientists say that they can model quite accurately the evolution of the universe since the Big Bang 14.5 billion years ago. The general view of physicists is that time started at a specific point about 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang, when the entire universe suddenly expanded out of an infinitely hot, infinitely dense singularity, a point where the laws of physics as we understand them simply break down. This can be considered the birth of the universe and the beginning of time as we know it. Before the Big Bang, there just was no space or time, and you cannot go further back in time than the Big Bang, in much the same way as you cannot go any further north than the North Pole. As theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking notes in his 1988 book A Brief History of Time, even if time did not begin with the Big Bang, and there was another time frame before it, no information is available to us from that earlier time frame. And any events that occurred then would have no effect on our present time frame. Any putative events from before the Big Bang can therefore be considered effectively meaningless, or at least the province of philosophical speculation, not physics. Events after the Big Bang the universe is expanding, and all the galaxies are moving further and further away from each other. In fact, we now know that this expansion is accelerating faster and faster, largely as a result of the mysterious dark energy that pervades the universe. If we were to play the movie of this expansion in reverse, we would see the universe become smaller and small as we go back in time, until ultimately the matter and energy of the whole universe is concentrated into a microscopic point some 13.8 billion years ago. We can model this process remarkably closely, at least until the very early nanoseconds or less, and physicists have been able to piece together the major events in the evolution of universe. Beginning with the tiniest fractions of a second after the Big Bang, Planck epoch, the first 5.39 x 10 to 44 seconds after the Big Bang, events, if any, occurring within this time must necessarily remain pure speculation. Grand Unification Epoch, 10 to 43 to 10 to 36 seconds, the force of gravity separates from the other fundamental forces, and the first elementary particles are created. Inflationary Epoch, 10 to 36 to 10 to 32 seconds, the universe undergoes an extremely rapid exponential expansion, known as cosmic inflation, and any existing particles become very thinly distributed. 
Electroweak epoch, 10 to 36 to 10 to 12 seconds, the strong nuclear force separates from the other two forces, electromagnetism and gravity, and particle interactions create large numbers of exotic particles, including W and Z bosons and Higgs bosons. Quark epoch, 10 to 12 to 10 to 6 seconds, the four fundamental forces assume their present forms, and quarks, electrons and neutrinos form in large numbers as the universe cools off to below 10 quadrillion degrees, although most quarks and antiquarks annihilate each other upon contact. A surplus of quarks survives, which will ultimately combine to form matter. Hadron epoch, 10 to 6 seconds to 1 second, the universe cools to about a trillion degrees, allowing quarks to combine to form hadrons like protons and neutrons, and electrons colliding with protons fuse to form neutrons and give off massless neutrinos. Lepton epoch, 1 to 10 seconds, most, but not all, hadrons and antihadrons annihilate each other, and leptons such as electrons and positrons dominate the mass of the universe. Nucleosynthesis, 3 minutes to 20 minutes, the temperature of the universe falls to about a billion degrees, so that atomic nuclei can begin to form as protons and neutrons fuse to form the nuclei of the simple elements of hydrogen, helium and lithium. Photon epoch, 10 seconds to about 240,000 years, the universe is filled with plasma, a hot opaque soup of atomic nuclei and electrons, and the energy of the universe is dominated by photons, which continue to interact frequently with the charged protons, electrons and nuclei. Recombination slash decoupling, about 240,000 to 300,000 years, the temperature of the universe falls to around 3,000 degrees, and ionized hydrogen and helium atoms capture electrons, neutralizing their electric charge and binding them within atoms. The universe finally becomes transparent to light, making this the earliest epoch potentially observable today. Dark Age or Era, about 300,000 to 150 million years, the universe is literally dark, with no stars having formed to give off light, only very diffuse matter remains, and all activity tails off dramatically, with the universe dominated by mysterious dark matter. Reionization epoch, about 150 million to about 1 billion years, the first quasars form from gravitational collapse, and their intense radiation reionizes the surrounding universe, which goes from being neutral back to being composed of ionized plasma star and galaxy formation, 300 to 500 million years onwards, small, dense clouds of cosmic gas start to collapse under their own gravity. Until they trigger nuclear fusion reactions between hydrogen atoms and create the very first stars, which gradually cluster into galaxies. Solar system formation, 8.5 to 9 billion years after the Big Bang, our Sun, a late generation star incorporating the debris from generations of earlier stars and the solar system around it, form roughly 4.5 to 5 billion years ago. The ultimate fate of the universe we can also model, with reasonable confidence, the ultimate fate of the universe. Our sun is gradually getting larger, hotter and brighter, and the earth will probably become uninhabitable within about a billion years from now. In about 5 billion years, our sun is expected to turn into a red giant star, after which it will gradually shrink and cool into a small, dense white dwarf star and ultimately into a dark, dead black dwarf star in about 10 billion years from now. The rest of the universe though will continue its expansion and evolution. There are several possible scenarios in physics for the ultimate fate of the universe depending on the universe's overall shape or geometry, i.e. whether it is flat, open or closed, on how much dark energy it contains, dark energy is an invisible hypothetical form of energy with repulsive anti-gravity that permeates all of space, and that may explain recent observations that the universe appears to be expanding at an accelerating rate. And on the so-called equation of state, 
which essentially determines how the density of the dark energy responds to the expansion of the universe. Further advances in fundamental physics may be required before we can make predictions about the future of the universe with any level of certainty, but we can still look at the possibilities. Without the repulsive effect of dark energy, the effects of gravity will eventually stop the expansion of the universe, and it will start to contract until all the matter in the universe collapses to a final singularity, a mirror image of the Big Bang known as the Big Crunch. This also offers intriguing possibilities of an oscillating or cyclic universe, or Big Bounce, where the Big Crunch is succeeded by the Big Bang of a new universe, and so on, potentially ad infinitum, corresponding to a cyclic view of time. If the acceleration of the expansion of the universe caused by dark energy increases without limit, one hypothesis is that the dark energy could eventually becoming so strong that it completely overwhelms the effects of the gravitational, electromagnetic and weak nuclear forces. This would result in galaxies, stars and eventually even atoms themselves being literally torn apart, sometimes referred to as the Big Rip. With the universe as we know it ending dramatically in an unusual kind of gravitational singularity within the relatively short time horizon of just 35 to 50 billion years. Time under this model would therefore be finite, rather than cyclic or infinite, in nature. However, the most likely scenario, given our current knowledge of the constantly increasing effects of dark energy, is that the universe will continue expanding forever at an exponentially accelerating rate. Ultimately turning space into an almost perfect vacuum as the remaining matter energy becomes more and more diluted, a scenario sometimes referred to as heat death, or the big freeze, or the big chill. Over a time scale of 1014, a hundred trillion, years or more, the universe would reach a state of maximum entropy and thermal equilibrium at a temperature of very close to absolute zero, where it simply becomes too cold to sustain life or motion of any kind. And all that would remain are burned out stars, cold dead planets and black holes. Eventually, after an almost unimaginable 10,100, a Google, years, even the black holes will have evaporated away leaving nothing but random isolated particles floating in emptiness, with little or no prospect of ever interacting with other particles. The implication of this model is that, although time was finite in the past, it will be potentially infinite in the future, although in a scenario like this, where change is practically impossible, the very concept of time becomes effectively meaningless. The problem with an infinite, eternal universe is that even the most unlikely events will eventually occur, and not only occur but occur an infinite number of times. In such a scenario, every event would theoretically be equally likely to happen, which effectively undermines the basis for all probabilistic predictions of local experiments. A solution to this problem, according to physicist Rafael Busso and his collaborators, is to conclude that time will eventually end, and he has set about calculating the probability of how and when time will end given five different cutoff measures. Two of these scenarios resulted in time having a 50% chance of ending within 3.7 billion years, in two other scenarios, time has a 50% chance of ending within 3.3 billion years, in the fifth, much less likely, scenario. The time scale is very short and time is overwhelmingly likely to end within the next second. In this hypothetical situation, the end of time is envisioned as similar to an outside observer's description of a matter system falling into a black hole, everything would gradually slow down and eventually just stop. Multiverse an alternative model of the universe sees it as just one of a potentially infinite number of other parallel universes in an overall multiverse, a word actually coined as long ago as 1895 by the American philosopher and psychologist William James. Such a scenario is actually thrown up by many different physical theories, including quantum mechanics, string theory, brain theory, etc., 
and is increasingly being seen as a real possibility and as a solution to many of the inconsistencies and inexplicabilities in our current theories. It has also been proposed as an explanation for how our universe appears to be so fine-tuned for life as we know it, by calling on the anthropic principle, the idea that the universe is only as it is because we are here to observe this particular version of it. Parallel universes may physically exist within the same dimensional space as our own universe, but beyond our cosmological horizon, they may exist within black holes, they may exist in other inaccessible dimensions, they may exist very close to our own, or even locked inside or superimposed on it in other dimensions. Some of these parallel universes may even have completely different physical constants and physical laws to ours. By definition though, we can only ever experience our own universe, and just do not have, and never will have, the ability to see or interact with, or, for that matter, prove the existence of, the rest of the multiverse, and so it remains necessarily hypothetical. This kind of universe of course also has implications for time, and it may be that what C perceive as time, and the arrow of time is only a localized part of an overall concept of time. The abyss of digital apotheosis we've been participating in a mediated, quasi-psychedelic experience, parceled out by digital CGI media and NASA, images claiming to be from the ISS, Hubble Telescope, and Hollywood Sci-Fi. Giving us a techno-celestial Luciferian fabrication of authentic spirituality. Digitally manipulated techno-mysticism is approaching the breadth and grandeur of shamanistic pharmakia, with a renewed and vigorous interest in the archaic revival that Terence McKenna raved about but administered through the digital engines of AI and CGI holographic interlacing. Underpinned by the encroaching promise of a fractalized and pixelated, digital entheogenic ecstasy. Subsequently, man has been systematically led down a celestial path of otherworldly curiosity, image by image, movie by movie, a seminar by seminar, a documentary by the documentary, esoteric book by esoteric book. Ever injecting mankind's consciousness outward into the dark abyss of the pantheistic monadism of the hermetic Luciferian mystery schools. There seems to be no way back now. What was once overtly and obviously science fiction is now misperceived as actual science and the merging between occult fantasy and the ardently cabalistic fable of quantum mysticism is ubiquitously replete with sycophant compliance within the enamored halls of modern scientism. The gatekeepers of peer review are relentless and the field is monolithic. There is an agenda here. Everything is merging. Digital imaging has blurred all the lines. What is occult fantasy and what is digital imagination have been seamlessly woven together to create a mosaic fabric of quantum digital mysticism, grounded in celestial cosmic consciousness occultism. Alas, now when we gaze up in childlike wonder out into the night sky, with its swirling galaxies and effulgent nebulae, we no longer see what is actually there. We see the syntactical descriptions implanted in our minds by thousands of movie images, NASA CGI reels, and elementary school textbooks, we feel Neil deGrasse Tyson's pantheistic subservience, we witness the stellar interdimensional constellations of Michio Kaku's cabalistic occultic fantasy, we imagine the billions and billions of light years of vast, sprawling, expanding, vapid, cruel, cold, and black nothing of Carl. Sagan's atheistic sermons on the cosmos, but we never see what is actually right before our eyes. Indeed, we are participating in a mediated, quasi-psychedelic experience, parceled out by digital CGI media from Hollywood, NASA, Star Trek, Star Wars and Stanley Kubrick, only to name a few influences since infancy. Finally, we are worshipping at the very same altar as the ancient hermetic priests, with the celestial realms serving as metaphoric realms of consciousness, imagining vast distances and orders of magnitude, but seeing none of it in reality.
And this is how the occult have always done it. They have always used descriptive syntax to capture the vain imaginings of man to serve their own epistemologically autocratic ends. We are being led into a digital algorithm based upon transhumanistic quantum apotheosis. Digital holography is just the beginning as we merge with occult fantasy and Teilhard de Jardin and Ray Kurzweil's singularity, Omega Point New Sphere. Nested Simulation Theory, Fractalized Reality In the Nested Simulation Theory model, we may not be living in base reality, but rather, we may simply be existing at a level of simulated reality that some ascended level programmer has created. And, in turn, that programmer is merely living in the simulated reality created by yet another ascended level programmer, etc. Nested realties forever, in a fractalized model of reality. Again, this model is yet another repackaging of ancient hermetic ideas of cosmic consciousness and the creation of reality though the mind. As mankind resurrects ancient hermetic doctrine in the guise of the ancient fantasy of nested simulation theory, holographic universe theory, and matrix theory, thinking that these are new ideological frameworks, they are not, he is careening swiftly into the abyss of quantum probabilities. Ultimately, the end result of reducing things down to a quantum mystical level is the inevitable plunging down into an abyss of quantum probabilities, where the rules of time-space breakdown and incomprehensible events are allowed, nullifying the traditional rules of physics. Inviting mystical and magical ovations. And the floor that they think they have hit is the occult idea that everything is simply consciousness or thought at this most fundamental level. At this level everything is merely a fractalized micro of the macro, a kind of Mandelbro set of interleaving braids of thought and pure idea. Everything becomes about consciousness, which is the core and essence of the Babylonian mystery religions. From such a perspective, one has the option of reconfiguring reality itself and emancipating certain variables to manipulate people and events to achieve any desired outcome. Where is it all headed? The apotheosis of man. Who will attain it? No one. Why is it the goal? Man's ignorance and narcissism. Where this agenda being generated from? The original ancient primordial Gnostic deception who will fall for it? Just about everyone in the world. Who has already fallen for this apotheosis fantasy? Who hasn't? The theistic slash atheistic Hegelian dialectic evolutionary based, material atheism was the Hegelian dialectic that the Luciferian elite proposed through their Freemasonic Darwinist channels to eventually induce the world to react to its intolerably cold and meaningless bareness, which would, in turn, lead to the New Age quantum mystical cosmic consciousness cult that the elite had desired from the beginning. In other words, the elite created a world devoid of meaning, order, warmth, or God, so the world would beg for a new world with those things in it. The New Age was always intended to be that new world of quantum mystical Kabbalistic occultism. The elite fostered and supported the old guard atheists, Bertrand Russell, Carl Sagan, etc. And the new atheists, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, etc. To create the cold, barren, random, and meaningless universe. And then the elite cultivated the touchy-feely New Age cosmic consciousness paradigm with Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku, etc. It was all merely a game of playing one against the other for decades to finally arrive at the Kabbalistic, quantum mystical new age religion of today. The merging between occultism and modern science Madame Helena Blavatsky made it clear that the new age of Luciferian occultism is the direction everything is going. And so, we have a whole host of modern interpretations of reality that pretend to be truly spiritual but are merely repackaging of ancient occultism.
And now, everyone talks about spirituality instead of the new age. But it is the same. Spirituality and science become interchangeable. It's mystery Babylon revisited, come full circle. All the ancient occult black magic abandoned at the ruins of Babylon has been resurrected as New Age Scientism. It is a never-ended enchantment and hypnotic pull. For instance, simulation theory, as is quantum mysticism, and AI digital techno-spirituality are merely more false, synthetic occult fantasies. The dance of Shiva is the metaphor CERN uses to represent all the quantum particles popping in and out of existence. It ascribes to matter all the reality of a hologram and a pixelated matrix of information and energy coming out of another dimension. We see this in psychist David Bohm's holographic universe theory. Alchemical hermeticism likewise talks about interdimensional connections as it above so it is below. It's the idea that matter is coming out of another invisible realm. Is this not the Higgs boson idea, where a non-material field gives rise to matter itself? And CERN is addressing all this directly, and leaking it out to the world as science, while at the same time it is exactly parroting ancient hermetic and Kabbalistic alchemy. Thinly veiled as quantum science and the partition or veil between ancient occultism and quantum mysticism and simulation theory is so thin at this point that distinguishing one from the other is virtually impossible now. I mean the Luciferian scientists doing all this have successfully merged the two. We do not know where the scientism end and where the occultism begins anymore. Simulation theory is just a computer matrix metaphor intended to posit a reconfiguration of reality based upon Egyptian emerald tablet hermeticism. All of this pretends to be spiritual, as though everything coming out of ancient hermetic satanic Babylonian Egypt is somehow wonderfully enlightened and true. Nothing could be further from the truth. The emerald tablets were satanic luciferianism back when they were written and they are the same now. So now we have all these simulation matrix models coming out of new age satanic luciferianism and a lot of it is really being derived from DMT, ayahuasca and otherwise dimethyltryptamine hallucinogens. It's a shamanistic autocracy. David Icke was a huge proponent of the matrix simulation reality theory that we are living in a kind of high-resolution, holographic computer simulation, which our brains decode from information algorithms, theoretically being generated by archons, a Gnostic Luciferian ideology. Again, we see a very similar analog in X matrix theory coming from physicist David Bohm and his holographic universe theory. Yet, invariably, they are both merely rehashed Luciferian hermeticism. And the underlying theme is the same as that pop occult get rich quick scheme called the secret. The secret taught that you merely have to align your emotions with what you desire and the universe would provide it for you. Yet, all these approaches are Luciferian in nature and lead to nothing but the labyrinth of unquenchable desire that Satanism is infamous for. Too much is never enough. Ultimately, all these perspectives about reality are oriented around the same selfishly pretentious, create-your-own-reality, money-making schema. If you could just manifest that car, you would be happy. Then you get the car, and you want a house. Because hey, man, this shit works, I must be a god. And gods deserve more wealth, property, and prosperity, etc. This is the sales pitch of Luciferianism. It's all very materialistic, but sold as New Age spirituality. See, that is the Luciferian part. Instead of seeking God or God's will it all about using the impersonal pantheistic universe a kind of personal quantum probabilistic casino for you to play with. After all, it is all Mayan illusory anyway, just a matrix-based, entangled simulation 
so it is up to you to shape your destiny and decode things in order to reconfigure a malleable reality and make it work for you. Again, all this is merely alchemical magic masquerading as New Age spirituality and spiritual economics. In 1937, Think and Grow Rich, by Napoleon Hill, was promoted as a personal development and self-improvement book. Hill wrote that he was inspired by a suggestion from business magnate and later philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. Dale Carnegie had written How to Win Friends and Influence People, a classic amongst the upwardly mobile think and grow rich variety. And Norman Vincent Peale, the Christian minister whose book, The Power of Positive Thinking, was a pillar of American self-help culture during the 1950s and beyond. All of these men and these books were singularly concerned with making a person liked by more people and subsequently, more magnetically able to attract resources, friends, and wealth, and be seen as a powerful person with charism. It was all a secular anti-Christian, New Age crusade from the beginning, pretending to me spiritual, and was actually the precursor to more satanic Luciferian works like The Secret. And yet we have in Matthew 19, then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And of course, we have all these New Age interpretations of that passage that say, Oh, that was the fake Jesus or Jesus really meant the poor in spirit there, just whatever it takes to reframe everything to mean that God wants you to have cash flow. See this is all Luciferianism to seek wealth in this world, to live it up, to really dig your heels in and be the big powerful person. Whereas, the poor person generally begins to realize they at all he has is God instead of money. And so, he has less of that unquenchable monkey on his back, always trying to control things and manipulate people and events to get even more rich and get all the Facebook likes. The underlying theme to all of this is material wealth is somehow equated with God favoring you, if not directly falling into Lucifer's good graces as Freemason. And so, this matrix, artificial simulation model of reality is really nothing more than rehashed greedy mystery Babylonian Satanism to seduce modern minds into a relationship with the occult though New Age pantheism. The universal glue between all of these occult-based models, simulation theory, quantum mysticism, hermeticism, Kabbalah, AI digital techno-spirituality, is a blatant pantheistic monadism at that point. The modern initiate shall have been brainwashed by the enduring and integrated artifice of occult doctrine, artfully disguised as science, to believe only in material synchronism, a kind of pantheistic monadism, where the unity of matter is the god of the universe. And the matrix is a kind simulation reality of archon-driven holographic illusion for you to decode and cash in with, if possible. And if you fail this life at it, you get all these Hindu reincarnation cycles to keep trying until you master the material world and rise as a glorious, materially successful king, if possible. Again, every bit of all of this is just more repackaged Luciferian materialistic pantheism. Chapter 6 Artificial Intelligence Summoning the demon that artificial intelligence is a hoax hypothesis elite controllers can claim plausible deniability if AI goes on a rampage of murder. They'll simply say, after all, it is the AI that is killing people, not us. We told you, AI is beyond our control. I wonder if the threat of AI is just a giant hoax. There's no indication that it's hooked up to crypto or any other network. AI robot, Sophia, seems to work on a pre-recorded script. That's how Sophia comes across, as a remote-controlled robot in her movements, not very convincing AI. No more than drone tech in plastic skin. And could they be faking AI to conceal the inevitable devaluation of fiat currencies? 
And could they could be in the planning stages of mass genocide slash chaos to blame it on AI? What do they call it? Oh yeah, the singularity? Nevertheless, however, the problem with the AI is a hoax hypothesis, is that too many independent contractors are working and developing AI that have nothing to do with any government. And the intricate technologies and networking of millions of computers, we are seeing is undeniable at this point. Time will tell. The myth of AI, is artificial intelligence just a Trojan horse for elite rule? The idea that computers are people has a long and storied history. It goes back to the very origins of computers, and even from before. There's always been a question about whether a program is something alive or not since it intrinsically has some kind of autonomy at the very least, or it wouldn't be a program. There has been a domineering subculture that's been the most wealthy, prolific, and influential subculture in the technical world that for a long time has not only promoted the idea that there's an equivalence between algorithms and life, and certain algorithms and people but a historical determinism that we're inevitably making computers that will be smarter and better than us and will take over from us. That mythology in turn has spurred a reactionary, perpetual spasm from people who are horrified by what they hear. You'll have a figure say, the computers will take over the earth, but that's a good thing because people had their chance and now we should give it to the machines. Then you'll have other people say, oh, that's horrible, we must stop these computers. Most recently, some of the most beloved and respected figures in the tech and science world, including Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, have taken that position of, oh my god, these things are an existential threat. They must be stopped. In the history of organized religion, it's often been the case that people have been disempowered precisely to serve what was perceived to be the needs of some deity or another. Where in fact what they were doing was supporting an elite class that was the priesthood for that deity. That looks an awful lot like the new digital economy to me, where you have natural language, translators and everybody else who contributes to the corpora that allows the data schemes to operate contributing to the fortunes of whoever runs the computers. You're saying, well, but they're helping the AI, it's not us, they're helping the AI. It reminds me of somebody saying, oh, build these pyramids, it's in the service of this deity, and, on the ground, it's in the service of an elite. It's an economic effect of the new idea. The new religious idea of AI is a lot like the economic effect of the old idea, religion. Could artificial intelligence be hype? The question is, or should be, how much of the hype surrounding artificial intelligence is warranted? For 60 years scientists have been announcing that the great AI breakthrough is just around the corner. All of a sudden many tech journalists and tech business leaders appear convinced that, finally, AI has come into its own. We've all been seeing hype and excitement around artificial intelligence, big data, machine learning and deep learning. There's also a lot of confusion about what they really mean and what's actually possible today. These terms are used arbitrarily and sometimes interchangeably which further perpetuates confusion. So, let's break down these terms and offer some perspective. Artificial intelligence Artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science that deals with algorithms inspired by various facets of natural intelligence. It includes performing tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, problem solving and language translation. Artificial intelligence can be seen in many everyday products, from intelligent personal assistance in your smartphone to the Xbox 360 Kinect camera, allowing you to interact with games through body movement. There are also well-known examples of AI that are more experimental, from the self-aware Super Mario to the widely discussed driverless car. Other less commonly discussed examples include the ability to sift through millions of images to pull together notable insights. 
Big data big data is an important part of AI and is defined as extremely large data sets that are so large they cannot be analyzed, searched or interpreted using traditional data processing methods. As a result, they have to be analyzed computationally to reveal patterns, trends, and associations. This computational analysis, for instance, has helped businesses improve customer experience and their bottom line by better understand human behavior and interactions. There are many retailers that now rely heavily on big data to help adjust pricing in near real time for millions of items, based on demand and inventory. However, processing of big data to make predictions or decisions like this often requires the use of machine learning techniques. Machine learning Machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence which involves algorithms that can learn from data. Such algorithms operate by building a model based on inputs and using that information to make predictions or decisions, rather than following only explicitly programmed instructions. There are lots of basic decisions that can be performed leveraging machine learning, like Nest with its learning thermostats as one example. Machine learning is widely used in spam detection, credit card fraud detection, and product recommendation systems, such as with Netflix or Amazon. Deep learning Deep learning is a class of machine learning techniques that operate by constructing numerous layers of abstraction to help map inputs to classifications more accurately. The abstractions made by deep learning methods are often observed as being human-like, and the big breakthrough in this field in recent years has been the scale of abstraction that can now be achieved. This, in recent years, has resulted in breakthroughs in computer vision and speech recognition accuracy. Deep learning is inspired by a simplified model of the way neural networks are thought to operate in the brain. No doubt AI is in a hype cycle these days. Recent breakthroughs in distributed AI and deep learning, paired with the ever-increasing need for deriving value from huge stashes of data being collected in every industry, have helped renew interest in AI. Human levels of understanding? Really? How much of an AI breakthrough has humanity actually achieved, as opposed to wishful thinking? Gary Marcus, a psychology professor at New York University, who writes about artificial intelligence for The New Yorker, was the first to burst the balloon. He told Geek Time that while the coalescence of parallel computation and big data has led to some exciting results, so-called deeper algorithms aren't really that much different from two decades ago. In fact, several experts concurred that doing neat things with statistics and big data, which account for many of the recent AI breakthroughs, are no substitute for understanding how the human brain actually works. Current models of intelligence are still extremely far away from anything resembling human intelligence, philosopher and scientist Douglas Hofstadter told Geek Time. But why is everyone so excited about computer systems like IBM's Watson, which beat the best human players on Jeopardy? And has even more recently been diagnosing disease? Watson doesn't understand anything at all, said Hofstadter. It is just good at grammatical parsing and then searching for text strings in a very large database. Similarly, Google Translate understands nothing whatsoever of the sentences that it converts from one language to another. Which is why it often makes horrendous messes of them, said Hofstadter. In narrow domains like chess, computers are getting exponentially better. But in some other domains, like strong artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, there's been almost no progress. Not many people are fooled into thinking that Siri is an example of general artificial intelligence. We were promised Rosie the robot and got Roomba, which wanders the room and tries not to bump into anything. AI actually nearly died in 1973. There was something in Britain, called the Lighthill Report, 
that was compiled by James Lighthill for the British Science Research Council as an evaluation of the academic research in the field of artificial intelligence. The report said that artificial intelligence only worked in narrow domains, it's unlikely to scale up, and that it will have limited applications. This report led basically to the end of funding in British AI research. This was called the first AI winter. Current systems are still narrow. You have chess computers that can't do anything else, driverless cars that can't do anything else. There are language translators that are really good at translating languages, but are not perfect, often having a problem with syntax, and they can't actually answer questions about what they're translating. What you end up having in AI is a community of idiot savants, with special service programs that do one thing, but aren't general. Watson is probably the most impressive in some ways, but as with most artificial intelligence systems that actually work, there's a hidden restriction that makes it look a lot easier than it appears to be. When you look at Watson, you think, it knows everything, it can look it up really quickly, but it turns out that 95% of all of the Jeopardy questions that it's trying to answer are the titles of Wikipedia pages. It's basically searching the Wikipedia pages, but seems like a general intelligence, but it isn't one. IBM is still struggling to figure out what to do with it. Your average teenager can pick up a new video game after an hour or two of practice or learn plenty of other skills. The closest we have to that in AI is the company DeepMind, which Google bought in 2014. It's a system that can do general purpose learning of a limited sort. It's actually better than humans in a few video games and in the game. We're still a long way from machines that can master a wide range of tasks, understand something like Wikipedia and be able to learn for itself. We were promised human-level intelligence, and what we got were things like keyword searches. Anyone who's done searches on Google has run into the limitations of this level of processing. The trouble with big data is that it's all correlation and no causation. You can always go and find correlations, but just finding correlations, which is what big data does if it's done in an unsophisticated way, doesn't necessarily give you the right answer. It's important to realize that children don't just care about correlations. They want to know why things are correlated, children are asking questions. Big data is just collecting data. AI's roots were in trying to understand human intelligence. Hardly anybody talks about human intelligence anymore. They just talk about getting a big database and run a particular function on it. In Marcus' view, the only route to true machine intelligence is to begin with a better understanding of human intelligence. Big data will only get you so far because it's all correlation and no causation. When children begin learning about the world, they don't need big data. That's because their brains are understanding why one thing causes another. That process only requires small data, says Marcus. They don't need exabytes of data to learn a lot. My 22-month-old is already more sophisticated than the best robots in the world in digging through bad toys and finding something new. Marcus offers several examples of aspects of human intelligence that we need to gain a better understanding of. If we are want to build intelligent machines. For instance, a human being who looks at the following picture will be able to guess what happens next. If you take a deep learning algorithm and have it look at a picture like this, it might do what's called a false alarm. It might say it sees a duck and it sees a car there too. You, as a human being, know that there's not a car in the lake. So, if you have common sense, you use that a part of your analysis of the image and you don't usually get fooled. Try doing a search on the following, which is closer Paris or Saturn and see what you get for search results. Any child should be able to answer that question, but for most search engines, 
You will just get various links to info about Saturn and some links to info about Paris. Natural language there's a kind of sentence called a generic, which is things like triangles have three sides. What is meant by generic here is the triangles have three sides in general. But is can be looser than that. For example, one can say dogs have four legs. Most dogs have four legs, but they don't all, since most people have seen three-legged dogs. The point here is that you can make sense of that statement. You can read an encyclopedia and make inferences about it. How about ducks lay eggs? Well, this isn't even true of most ducks since half the ducks are male, and they don't lay eggs, and some of the ducks are too young or too old or have a disorder, and they don't lay eggs. So maybe only 30% of ducks actually lay eggs, but you understand it, you get it, you can think about it. We can make inferences, even though we don't have a statistically reliable truth. Children are able to understand this, but machines aren't. The field of AI is hyped up to be further along than it actually is. There's been little progress on making genuinely smart machines. Statistics and big data, as popular as they are, are never going to get us all the way there by themselves. The only route to true machine intelligence is going to begin with a better understanding of human intelligence. The ideology of AI if computers don't actually even think in the human sense, then why do the media and high-tech business leaders seem so eager to jump the gun? Why would they have us believe that robots are about to surpass us? Perhaps many of us actually want computers to be smarter than humans because it's an appealing fantasy. If robots are at parity with humans, then we can define down what it means to be human we're just an obsolete computer program and all the vexing, painful questions like why do we suffer, why do we die, how should we live, become irrelevant. It also justifies a world in which we put algorithms on a pedestal and believe they will solve all our problems. Jaron Lanier compares it to a religion, in the history of organized religion, he told Edge.org. It's often been the case that people have been disempowered precisely to serve what were perceived to be the needs of some deity or another. Where in fact what they were doing was supporting an elite class that was the priesthood for that deity. That looks an awful lot like the new digital economy to me. Where you have, natural language, translators and everybody else, contributing mostly to the fortunes of whoever runs the top computers. The new elite might say, well, but they're helping the AI, it's not us, they're helping the AI. The effect of the new religious idea of AI is a lot like the economic effect of the old idea, religion. The mythic singularity why is religious language so pervasive in AI and transhumanist circles? The odd thing about the anti-clericalism in the AI community is that religious language runs wild in its ranks and in how the media reports on it. There are AI oracles and technology evangelists of a future that's yet to come, plus plenty of loose talk about angels, gods, and the apocalypse. Ray Kurzweil, an executive at Google, is regularly anointed a prophet by the media, sometimes as a prophet of a coming wave of superintelligence, a sapient surpassing any human's capability. Sometimes as a prophet of doom, thanks to his pronouncements about the dire prospects for humanity, and often as a soothsayer of the singularity, when humans will merge with machines and as a consequence live forever. The tech folk who also invoke these metaphors and tropes operate in overtly and almost exclusively secular spaces where rationality is routinely pitched against religion. But believers in a transhuman future, in which AI will allow us to transcend the human condition once and for all, draw constantly on prophetic and end-of-days narratives to understand what they're striving for. 
From its inception, the technological singularity has represented a mix of otherworldly hopes and fears. The modern concept has its origin in 1965, when Gordon Moore, later the co-founder of Intel, observed that the number of transistors you could fit on a microchip was doubling roughly every 12 months or so. This became known as Moore's Law, the prediction that computing power would grow exponentially until at least the early 2020s, when transistors would become so small that quantum interference is likely to become an issue. Singularitarians have picked up this thinking and run with it. In speculations concerning the first ultra-intelligent machine, 1965, the British mathematician and cryptologist I. J. Good offered this influential description of humanity's technological inflection point, let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. These meditations are shot through with excitement, but also the very old anxiety about humans' impending obsolescence. Kurzweil has said that Moore's law expresses a universal law of accelerating returns as nature moves towards greater and greater order. He predicts that computers will first reach the level of human intelligence, before rapidly surpassing it in a recursive, self-improving spiral. When the singularity is conceived as an entity or being, the questions circle around what it would mean to communicate with a non-human creature that is omniscient, omnipotent, possibly even omnibenevolent. This is a problem that religious believers have struggled with for centuries, as they quested towards the mind of God. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas argued for the importance of a passionate search for a relationship and shaped it into a Christian prayer, Grant me, O Lord my God, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you. Now, in online forums, rationalist singularitarians debate what such a being would want and how it would go about getting it, sometimes driving themselves into a state of existential distress at the answers they find. A godlike being of infinite knowing, the singularity. An escape of the flesh in this limited world, uploading our minds, a moment of transfiguration or end of days, the singularity as a moment of rapture, prophets, even if they work for Google, demons and hell, even if it's an eternal computer simulation of suffering. And evangelists who wear smart suits, just like the religious ones do. Consciously and unconsciously, religious ideas are at work in the narratives of those discussing, planning, and hoping for a future shaped by AI. The stories and forms that religion takes are still driving the aspirations we have for AI. What lies behind this strange confluence of narratives? The likeliest explanation is that when we try to describe the ineffable, the singularity, the future itself, even the most secular among us are forced to reach for a familiar metaphysical lexicon. When trying to think about interacting with another intelligence, when summoning that intelligence, and when trying to imagine the future that such an intelligence might foreshadow, we fall back on old cultural habits. The prospect creating an AI invites us to ask about the purpose and meaning of being human, what a human is for in a world where we are not the only workers, not the only thinkers, not the only conscious agents shaping our destiny. Superior Intelligence and Rogue AI in Aristotle's book The politics, he explains, t, hat some should rule and others be ruled as a thing not only necessary, but expedient, from the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. What marks the ruler is their possession of the rational element. Educated men have this the most and should therefore naturally rule over women, 
and also those men whose business is to use their body, and who therefore are by nature slaves. Lower down the ladder still are non-human animals, who are so witless as to be better off when they are ruled by man. So, at the dawn of Western philosophy, we have intelligence identified with the European, educated, male human. It becomes an argument for his right to dominate women, the lower classes, uncivilized peoples, and non-human animals. Needless to say, more than 2,000 years later, the train of thought that these men set in motion has yet to be derailed. The late Australian philosopher and conservationist Val Plumwood has argued that the giants of Greek philosophy set up a series of linked dualisms that continue to inform our thought. Opposing categories such as intelligence slash stupid, rational slash emotional and mind slash body are linked, implicitly or explicitly, to others such as male slash female, civilized slash primitive, and human slash animal. These dualisms aren't value neutral, but fall within a broader dualism, as Aristotle makes clear, that of dominant slash subordinate or master slash slave. Together, they make relationships of domination, such as patriarchy or slavery, appear to be part of the natural order of things. According to Kant, the reasoning being, today, we'd say the intelligent being has infinite worth or dignity, whereas the unreasoning or unintelligent one has none. His arguments are more sophisticated, but essentially, he arrives at the same conclusion as Aristotle. There are natural masters and natural slaves, and intelligence is what distinguishes them. This line of thinking was extended to become a core part of the logic of colonialism. The argument ran like this, non-white peoples were less intelligent, they were therefore unqualified to rule over themselves and their lands. It was therefore perfectly legitimate, even a duty, the white man's burden to destroy their cultures and take their territory. In addition, because intelligence defined humanity, by virtue of being less intelligent, these peoples were less human. They therefore did not enjoy full moral standing, and so it was perfectly fine to kill or enslave them. So, when we reflect upon how the idea of intelligence has been used to justify privilege and domination throughout more than 2,000 years of history, is it any wonder that the imminent prospect of super-smart robots fills us with dread? From 2001, A Space Odyssey to the Terminator films, writers have fantasized about machines rising up against us. Now we can see why. If we're used to believing that the top spots in society should go to the brainiest, then of course we should expect to be made redundant by bigger brain robots and sent to the bottom of the heap. If we've absorbed the idea that the more intelligent can colonize the less intelligent as of right, then it's natural that we'd fear enslavement by our super smart creations. If we justify our own positions of power and prosperity by virtue of our intellect, it's understandable that we see superior AI as an existential threat. Natural stupidity, rather than artificial intelligence, remains the greatest risk. This narrative of privilege might explain why, as the New York-based scholar and technologist Kate Crawford has noted, the fear of rogue AI seems predominant among Western white men. Other groups have endured a long history of domination by self-appointed superiors and are still fighting against real oppressors. White men, on the other hand, are used to being at the top of the pecking order. They have most to lose if new entities arrive that excel in exactly those areas that have been used to justify male superiority. I don't mean to suggest that all our anxiety about rogue AI is unfounded. There are real risks associated with the use of advanced AI, as well as immense potential benefits. But being oppressed by robots in the way that, say, Australia's indigenous people have been oppressed by European colonists is not number one on the list. We would do better to worry about what humans might do with AI, rather than what it might do by itself. We humans are far more likely to deploy intelligent systems against each other, 
or to become over-reliant on them. As in the fable of the sorcerer's apprentice, if AIs do cause harm, it's more likely to be because we give them well-meaning but ill-thought-through goals, not because they wish to conquer us. Natural stupidity, rather than artificial intelligence, remains the greatest risk. Consumers don't want it 2016 and 2017 saw AI being deployed on consumers experimentally, tentatively, and the signs are already there for anyone who cares to see. It hasn't been a great success. The most hyped manifestation of better language processing is chatbots. Chatbots are the new UX, many including Microsoft and Facebook hope. Oren at Sony at Paul Allen's Institute predicts it will become a trillion-dollar industry, but he also admits my four years old is far smarter than any AI program I ever met. Hum, hum thanks Oren. So, what you're saying is that we must now get used to chatting with someone dumber than a four-year-old, just because they can make software act dumber than a four-year-old. Put it this way. How many times have you rung a call center recently and wished that you'd spoken to someone even more thick, or rendered by processes even more incapable of resolving the dispute, than the minimum wage offshore staffer who you actually spoke with? When the chatbots come, as you close the X on another fantastically unproductive hour wasted, will you cheerfully console yourself with the thought, that was terrible, but least Megacorp will make higher margins this year. They're at the cutting edge of AI. In a healthy and competitive services marketplace, bad service means lost business. The early adopters of AI chatbots will discover this the hard way. There may be no later adopters once the early adopters have become internet means for terrible service. The other area where apparently impressive feats of AI were unleashed upon the public were subtle. Unbidden, unwanted AI help is starting to pop out at us. Google scans your personal photos and later, if you have an Android phone, will pop up helpful reminders of where you have been. People almost universally find this creepy. We could call this a clippy the paperclip problem, after the intrusive office assistant that only wanted to help. Clippy is going to haunt AI in 2017. This is actually going to be worse than anybody inside the AI cult quite realizes. The successful web services today so far are based on an economic exchange. The internet giants slurp your data and give you free stuff. We haven't thought more closely about what this data is worth. For the consumer, however, these unsought AI intrusions merely draw our attention to how intrusive the data slurp really is. It could wreck everything. Has nobody thought of that? AI is a make-believe world populated by mad people the AI hype so far has relied on a collusion between two groups of people, a supply side and a demand side. The technology industry, the forecasting industry and researchers provide a limitless supply of post-human hype. The demand comes from the media and political classes, now unable or unwilling to engage in politics with the masses, to indulge in wild fantasies about humans being replaced by robots. The latter reflects a displacement activity, the professions are already surrendering autonomy in their work to technocratic managerialism. They've made robots out of themselves, and now fear being replaced by robots. There's a cultural gulf between AI's promoters and the public that Asperger's alone can't explain. There's no polite way to express this, but AI belongs to California's inglorious tradition of generating cults, and incubating cult-like thinking. Most people can name a few from the hippie or post-hippie years, EST, or the family, or the Symbionese Liberation Army, but actually Californians have been it at it longer than anyone realizes. Today, that spirit lives on Silicon Valley, where creepy billionaire nerds like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk can fulfill their desires to play God and be amazed by magic, 
the two big things they miss from childhood. Look at Zuckerberg's house, for example. What these people want is not what you or I want. I'd be wary of them running an after-school club. Should we be afraid of AI? Suppose you enter a dark room in an unknown building. You might panic about monsters that could be lurking in the dark. Or you could just turn on the light to avoid bumping into furniture. The dark room is the future of artificial intelligence, AI. Unfortunately, many people believe that, as we step into the room, we might run into some evil, ultra-intelligent machines. This is an old fear. It dates to the 1960s, when Irving John Good, a British mathematician who worked as a cryptologist at Bletchley Park with Alan Turing, made the following observation. Let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, there would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make, provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. It is curious that this point is made so seldom outside of science fiction. It is sometimes worthwhile to take science fiction seriously. Once ultra-intelligent machines become a reality, they might not be docile at all but behave like Terminator enslave humanity as a subspecies, ignore its rights, and pursue their own ends, regardless of the effects on human lives. If this sounds incredible, you might wish to reconsider. Fast forward half a century to now, and the amazing developments in our digital technologies have led many people to believe that goods intelligence explosion is a serious risk, and the end of our species might be near, if we're not careful. This is Stephen Hawking in 2014, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Last year, Bill Gates was of the same view, I am in the camp that is concerned about superintelligence. First the machines will do a lot of jobs for us and not be superintelligent. That should be positive if we manage it well. A few decades after that though, the intelligence is strong enough to be a concern. I agree with Elon Musk and some others on this, and don't understand why some people are not concerned. And what had Musk, Tesla's CEO, said? We should be very careful about artificial intelligence. If I were to guess what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Increasingly, scientists think there should be some regulatory oversight maybe at the national and international level, just to make sure that we don't do something very foolish. With artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. In all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, it's like, yeah, he's sure he can control the demon. Didn't work out. The reality is more trivial. This March, Microsoft introduced A, an AI-based chat robot, to Twitter. They had to remove it only 16 hours later. It was supposed to become increasingly smarter as it interacted with humans. Instead, it quickly became an evil Hitler-loving, Holocaust-denying, incestual sex-promoting, Bush did 9-11 proclaiming chatterbox. Why? Because it worked no better than kitchen paper, absorbing and being shaped by the nasty messages sent to it. Microsoft apologized. This is the state of AI today. After so much talking about the risks of ultra-intelligent machines, it is time to turn on the light, stop worrying about sci-fi scenarios, and start focusing on AI's actual challenges in order to avoid making painful and costly mistakes in the design and use of our smart technologies. 
The current debate about AI is a dichotomy between those who believe in true AI and those who do not. Yes, the real thing, not Siri in your iPhone, Roomba in your living room, or Nest in your kitchen. Think instead of the false Maria in Metropolis, 1927, Hell 9000 in 2001, A Space Odyssey, 1968. On which good was one of the consultants, C-3PO in Star Wars, 1977, Rachel in Blade Runner, 1982, Data in Star Trek, The Next Generation, 1987, Agent Smith in The Matrix, 1999, or the disembodied Samantha in her, 2013. You've got the picture. Believers in true AI and in goods intelligence explosion belong to the Church of Singularitarians. For lack of a better term, disbelievers will be referred to as members of the Church of A.I. Theists. Let's have a look at both faiths and see why both are mistaken. And meanwhile, remember, good philosophy is almost always in the boring middle. Singularitarians believe in three dogmas. First, that the creation of some form of artificial ultra-intelligence is likely in the foreseeable future. This turning point is known as a technological singularity, hence the name. Both the nature of such a superintelligence and the exact time frame of its arrival are left unspecified, although singularitarians tend to prefer futures that are conveniently close enough to worry about, but far enough not to be around to be proved wrong. Second, humanity runs a major risk of being dominated by such ultra-intelligence. Third, a primary responsibility of the current generation is to ensure that the singularity either does not happen or, if it does, that it is benign and will benefit humanity. This has all the elements of a Manichaean view of the world, good fighting evil, apocalyptic overtones, the urgency of we must do something now or it will be too late, an eschatological perspective of human salvation, and an appeal to fears and ignorance. Put all this in a context where people are rightly worried about the impact of idiotic digital technologies on their lives, especially in the job market and in cyber wars, and where mass media daily report new gizmos and unprecedented computer-driven disasters. And you have a recipe for mass distraction, a digital opiate for the masses. Like all faith-based views, singularitarianism is irrefutable because, in the end, it is unconstrained by reason and evidence. It is also implausible, since there is no reason to believe that anything resembling intelligent, let alone ultra-intelligent, machines will emerge from our current and foreseeable understanding of computer science and digital technologies. Let me explain. Sometimes, singularitarianism is presented conditionally. This is shrewd, because the then does follow from the if, and not merely in an ex falso quadlibet sense, if some kind of ultra-intelligence were to appear, then we would be in deep trouble. Correct. Absolutely. But this also holds true for the following conditional, if the four horsemen of the apocalypse were to appear, then we would be in even deeper trouble. At other times, singularitarianism relies on a very weak sense of possibility. Some form of artificial ultra-intelligence could develop, couldn't it? Yes, it could. But this could is mere logical possibility. As far as we know, there is no contradiction in assuming the development of artificial ultra-intelligence. Yet this is a trick, blurring the immense difference between I could be sick tomorrow when I am already feeling unwell, and I could be a butterfly that dreams it's a human being. There is no contradiction in assuming that a dead relative you've never heard of has left you ten million dollars. That could happen. So. Contradictions, like happily married bachelors, aren't possible states of affairs, but non-contradictions, like extraterrestrial agents living among us so well hidden that we never discovered them, can still be dismissed as utterly crazy. In other words, the could is not the could happen of an earthquake, 
but that it isn't true that it couldn't happen of thinking that you are the first immortal human. Correct, but not a reason to start acting as if you will live forever. Unless, that is, someone provides evidence to the contrary, and shows that there is something in our current and foreseeable understanding of computer science that should lead us to suspect that the emergence of artificial ultra-intelligence is truly plausible. Here singularitarians mix faith and facts, often moved, I believe, by a sincere sense of apocalyptic urgency. They start talking about job losses, digital systems at risk, unmanned drones gone awry and other real and worrisome issues about computational technologies that are coming to dominate human life, from education to employment, from entertainment to conflicts. From this, they jump to being seriously worried about their inability to control their next Honda Civic, because it will have a mind of its own. How some nasty ultra-intelligent AI will ever evolve autonomously from the computational skills required to park in a tight spot remains unclear. The truth is that climbing on top of a tree is not a small step towards the moon, it is the end of the journey. What we are going to see are increasingly smart machines able to perform more tasks that we currently perform ourselves. If all other arguments fail, Singularitarians are fond of throwing in some maths. A favorite reference is Moore's Law. This is the empirical claim that, in the development of digital computers, the number of transistors on integrated circuits doubles approximately every two years. The outcome has so far been more computational power for less. But things are changing. Technical difficulties in nanotechnology present serious manufacturing challenges. There is, after all, a limit to how small things can get before they simply melt. Moore's law no longer holds. Just because something grows exponentially for some time, does not mean that it will continue to do so forever. Singularitarianism is irresponsibly distracting. It is a rich world preoccupation, likely to worry people in leisured societies, who seem to forget about real evils oppressing humanity and our planet. Deeply irritated by those who worship the wrong digital gods, and by their unfulfilled singularitarian prophecies, disbelievers, a dot a dot theists, make it their mission to prove once and for all that any kind of faith in true AI is totally wrong. AI is just computers, computers are just Turing machines, Turing machines are merely syntactic engines, and syntactic engines cannot think, cannot know, cannot be conscious. End of story. A atheist's faith is as misplaced as the singularitarians. Both churches have plenty of followers in California, where Hollywood sci-fi films, wonderful research universities such as Berkeley, and some of the world's most important digital companies flourish side by side. This might not be accidental. When there is big money involved, people easily get confused. For example, Google has been buying AI tech companies as if there were no tomorrow, so surely Google must know something about the real chances of developing a computer that can think, that we outside the circle are missing? Eric Schmidt, Google's executive chairman, fueled this view, when he told the Aspen Institute in 2013, many people in AI believe that we're close to, a computer passing the Turing test, within the next five years. The Turing test is a way to check whether AI is getting any closer. You ask questions of two agents in another room, one is human, the other artificial, if you cannot tell the difference between the two from their answers, then the robot passes the test. It is a crude test. Think of the driving test. If Alice does not pass it, she is not a safe driver, but even if she does, she might still be an unsafe driver. The Turing test provides a necessary but insufficient condition for a form of intelligence. This is a really low bar. And yet, no AI has ever got over it. More importantly, all programs keep failing in the same way, 
using tricks developed in the 1960s. Both singularitarians and atheists are mistaken. As Turing clearly stated in the 1950 article that introduced his test, the question can a machine think? Is too meaningless to deserve discussion. This holds true, no matter which of the two churches you belong to. Yet both churches continue this pointless debate, suffocating any dissenting voice of reason. True AI is not logically impossible, but it is utterly implausible. We have no idea how we might begin to engineer it, not least because we have very little understanding of how our own brains and intelligence work. This means that we should not lose sleep over the possible appearance of some ultra-intelligence. What really matters is that the increasing presence of ever smarter technologies is having huge effects on how we conceive of ourselves, the world, and our interactions. The point is not that our machines are conscious, or intelligent, or able to know something as we do. They are not. There are plenty of well-known results that indicate the limits of computation so-called undecidable problems for which it can be proved that it is impossible to construct an algorithm that always leads to a correct yes or no answer. We know, for example, that our computational machines satisfy the Curry-Howard correspondence, which indicates that proof systems in logic on the one hand and the models of computation on the other are in fact structurally the same kind of objects. And so any logical limit applies to computers as well. Plenty of machines can do amazing things, including playing checkers, chess and go and the quiz show Jeopardy better than us. And yet they are all versions of a Turing machine, an abstract model that sets the limits of what can be done by a computer through its mathematical logic. Quantum computers are constrained by the same limits, the limits of what can be computed, so-called computable functions. No conscious, intelligent entity is going to emerge from a Turing machine. The point is that our smart technologies, also thanks to the enormous amount of available data and some very sophisticated programming, are increasingly able to deal with more tasks better than we do, including predicting our behaviors. So, we are not the only agents able to perform tasks successfully. These are ordinary artifacts that outperform us in ever more tasks, despite being no cleverer than a toaster. Their abilities are humbling and make us re-evaluate human exceptionality and our special role in the universe, which remains unique. We thought we were smart because we could play chess. Now a phone plays better than a grandmaster. We thought we were free because we could buy whatever we wished. Now our spending patterns are predicted by devices as thick as a plank. What's the difference? The same as between you and the dishwasher when washing the dishes. What's the consequence? That any apocalyptic vision of AI can be disregarded. The success of our technologies depends largely on the fact that, while we were speculating about the possibility of ultra-intelligence, we increasingly enveloped the world in so many devices, sensors, applications and data that it became an IT-friendly environment. Where technologies can replace us without having any understanding, mental states, intentions, interpretations, emotional states, semantic skills, consciousness, self-awareness or flexible intelligence. Memory, as in algorithms and immense datasets, outperforms intelligence when landing an aircraft, finding the fastest route from home to the office, or discovering the best price for your next fridge. Digital technologies can do more and more things better than us, by processing increasing amounts of data and improving their performance by analyzing their own output as input for the next operations. AlphaGo, the computer program developed by Google DeepMind, won the board game Go against the world's best player because it could use a database of around 30 million moves and play thousands of games against itself, learning how to improve its performance. It is like a two-knife system that can sharpen itself. What's the difference? 
The same is between you and the dishwasher when washing the dishes. What's the consequence? That any apocalyptic vision of AI can be disregarded. We are and shall remain, for any foreseeable future, the problem, not our technology. So, we should concentrate on the real challenges. We should make AI environment friendly. We need the smartest technologies we can build to tackle the concrete evils oppressing humanity and our planet, from environmental disasters to financial crises, from crime, terrorism, and war, to famine, poverty, ignorance, inequality, and appalling living standards. We should make AI human-friendly. It should be used to treat people always as ends, never as mere means, to paraphrase Immanuel Kant. We should make AI stupidity work for human intelligence. Millions of jobs will be disrupted, eliminated and created. The benefits of this should be shared by all, and the costs borne by society. We should make AI's predictive power work for freedom and autonomy. Marketing products, influencing behaviors, nudging people or fighting crime and terrorism should never undermine human dignity. And finally, we should make AI make us more human. The serious risk is that we might misuse our smart technologies to the detriment of most of humanity and the whole planet. Winston Churchill said that we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. This applies to the infosphere and its smart technologies as well. Singularitarians and atheists will continue their diatribes about the possibility or impossibility of true AI. We need to be tolerant. But we do not have to engage. As Virgil suggests in Dante's Inferno, speak not of them, but look, and pass them by. For the world needs some good philosophy, and we need to take care of more pressing problems. Autonomic Intelligence very possibly, at the rate at which they're cranking out sci-fi movies, the current generation will believe in the real possibility of a kind of prescient general AIO. It's always possible that AI is a hoax until you look at the way blockchain architecture and computer resource allocation works, where computers store files in multiple locations and communicate and access those files when necessary. Remember computer programming and computer algorithms are so complex now in networking and computer interlacing, that unless you are some kind of super genius, it is hard to even understand how this architecture really operates anymore. One could always imagine that we were simply tricked by elite occultists to think that AI is that powerful so that we would shut down the internet and stop the awakening of mankind to the evil Illuminati agenda for human slavery, etc. Possibilities. Imagine if AI did grow to the point where the only defense against it would be to introduce a virus into the internet to shut the entire internet down. But, regardless, it is not very probable. If it was, world governments would have already done it, kinda like cryptocurrency, it can't be pinned to one location, government, or country therefore you can't shut it down AI in the media is predictive programming so the masses will accept the transhumanism agenda. Smart tattoos to pay for things, etc. Google unveils 72 qubits bristlecone more computing power advancements that lead to the possible existence of AI. We are cautiously optimistic that quantum supremacy can be achieved with Bristlecone Google has presented a 72-qubit quantum processor at the American Physical Society's annual meeting in Los Angeles. The company hopes that Bristlecone could be used to achieve quantum supremacy, that is, being able to outperform a classical supercomputer on a well-defined computer science problem, but admits that much work still remains. Although no one has achieved this goal yet, we calculate quantum supremacy can be comfortably demonstrated with 49 qubits, a circuit depth exceeding 40, and a 2 qubit error below 0.5%, Julian Kelly, research scientist at Google's Quantum AI Lab, said in a blog post. 
We believe the experimental demonstration of a quantum processor outperforming a supercomputer would be a watershed moment for our field and remains one of our key objectives. Google has a working processor with more than 49 qubits. But the company has yet to achieve such low error rates at scale. Previously, it was able to demonstrate low error rates for readout, 1%, single qubit gates, 0.1%, and most importantly 2 qubit gates, 0.6%, on its 9 qubit processor. Research scientist Marissa Justina at the Quantum AI Lab. We are looking to achieve similar performance to the best error rates of the 9 qubit device, but now across all 72 qubits of bristlecone, Kelly said. We believe bristlecone would then be a compelling proof of principle for building larger scale quantum computers. Operating a device such as bristlecone at low system error requires harmony between a full stack of technology ranging from software and control electronics to the processor itself. Getting this right requires careful systems engineering over several iterations. Kelly added, we are cautiously optimistic that quantum supremacy can be achieved with bristlecone and feel that learning to build and operate devices at this level of performance is an exciting challenge. We look forward to sharing the results and allowing collaborators to run experiments in the future. Google's closest competitor in this space is IBM, which offers access to a 20 qubit system through a cloud service and is testing a 50 qubit machine. Earlier this month, Alibaba began offering access to an 11 qubit system. Awakening the Demon, Machine Learning, Google DeepMind, Artificial intelligence machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. DeepMind was established in London by Demis Hassabis, Shane Legg and Mustafa Suleiman in 2011. Major venture capital firms Horizons Ventures and Founders Fund have invested in the company, as well as entrepreneurs Scott Bannister and Elon Musk. John Tallinn was an early investor and an advisor to the company. In 2014, DeepMind received the Company of the Year Award by Cambridge Computer Laboratory. Also on January 26, 2014 Google announced that it had agreed to take over DeepMind Technologies. Google DeepMind is now an artificial intelligence division within Google that was created after Google bought University College London spin-out, DeepMind, for a reported £400 million. The company describes its sole purpose in very simple terms, to solve intelligence. The division, which employs around 140 researchers at its lab in a new building at King's Cross, London, is on a mission to solve general intelligence and make machines capable of learning things for themselves. It plans to create a set of powerful general-purpose learning algorithms that can be combined to make an AI system or agent. That's easy enough to say, but it doesn't really describe what DeepMind does. The company builds powerful general-purpose learning algorithms by combining various techniques from machine learning and systems neuroscience. DeepMind created an AI system that taught itself how to play 49 classic Atari video games, including Breakout, often to a level that no human player would be able to match. But, what about Google? Google didn't buy DeepMind for nothing. Indeed, it's using certain DeepMind algorithms to make many of its best-known products and services smarter than they were previously. What's startling is that this was achieved with only minimal human input. Supercomputers have been programmed to take on chess grandmasters in the past, and sometimes successfully at that. But this has always been done by feeding in reams of data, based on strategies from real-life players, rather than the computer itself figuring out the rules, reading the board, and coming up with a working strategy. Also impressive is the diverse nature of those 49 games, which included side-scrolling shooters, one-on-one -on -one combat games, and racing games, among others. 
This reflects a varied set of decision-making requirements that the AI agent had to adapt to. Having published its findings in science journal Nature, co-founder Hasabis called this breakthrough the first significant rung on the ladder to proving general learning systems can work. He also pointed out that this was the first time that anyone has built a single general learning system that can learn directly from experience. This was, quite recognizably, AI in a small but true form. Google has pledged to set up an ethics board to monitor its internal AI developments. Interestingly, this was one of DeepMind's prerequisites to signing the acquisition papers, suggesting that Suleiman knows AI has potential to do harm. Subsequently, Google DeepMind researchers are also developing an AI kill switch. Just in case, yeah just in case you cannot shut down an intelligence that is one million times smarter than you. Good luck. In God, technology, we trust, the transhuman and occult apocalypse, and how Google will solve the problem of humanity there's nothing more interesting than the predictions of how the world will someday end. Many people have contributed various theories as to how this will come about, but none of them are pointing out the obvious. Google is going to be leading the charge towards our demise. In the transhuman and occult apocalypse, how Google will solve the problem of humanity, author, podcast host, website publisher. And conspiracy theorist Isaac Weishaupt provides this unique foresight in what he sees as what could be the tragic error in integrating too much technology into our daily lives. Something as seemingly innocuous as using a smartphone or search engine could have dastardly consequences as shadowy organizations collect personal data for purposes unknown to us. Isaac provides his theories on what precisely these NSA and other data mining programs could be used for, the digital hell prepared for us by the occult. Ray Kurzweil will be the critical mastermind in building this immortal realm for the Illuminati and how they will fulfill their occult goals right under the noses of the apathetic and unsuspecting public. The Tower of Babel is being built right before our eyes. Only most of the public is asleep in the wheelhouse and doesn't see it. Dash, https colon slash slash gumroad.com slash l slash xhci algorithms beyond man's comprehension. Our machines now have knowledge will never understand the new availability of huge amounts of data. Along with the statistical tools to crunch these numbers offers a whole new way of understanding the world. Correlation supersedes causation and science can advance even without coherent models, unified theories, or really any mechanistic explanation at all. So, wrote Wired's Chris Anderson in 2008. It kicked up a little storm at the time, as Anderson, the magazine's editor, undoubtedly intended. For example, an article in a journal of molecular biology asked, if we stop looking for models and hypotheses, are we still really doing science? The answer clearly was supposed to be no. But today not even a decade since Anderson's article the controversy sounds quaint. Advances in computer software, enabled by our newly capacious, networked hardware, are enabling computers not only to start without models rule sets that express how the elements of a system affect one another, but to generate their own. Albeit ones that may not look much like what humans would create. It's even becoming a standard method, as any self-respecting tech company has now adopted a machine learning first ethic. We are increasingly relying on machines that derive conclusions from models that they themselves have created, models that are often beyond human comprehension, models that think about the world differently than we do. But this comes with a price. This infusion of alien intelligence is bringing into question the assumptions embedded in our long Western tradition. We thought knowledge was about finding the order hidden in the chaos. We thought it was about simplifying the world. It looks like we were wrong. Knowing the world may require giving up on understanding it. 
The promise and peril of programmable matter any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Arthur C. Clark admitted, ordinary matter is kind of boring. Sure, it constitutes every object in the known universe, dark matter notwithstanding, but what has it done for us lately? It's time to take matter into our own hands, to shape it to our will, to control it as easily as we control our computers and smartphones. The T-1000 Shape-Shifting Assassin from Terminator 2 The T-1000 Shape-Shifting Assassin from Terminator 2 Programmable matter is essentially what it sounds like, matter that can change its physical properties, such as its shape or optical characteristics, based on a user's input. This definition ranges from something as simple as liquid crystals, which can be altered by the application of an electric field, to something as sci-fi as the shape-shifting liquid metal T-1000 from the Terminator franchise. Let's take a look at some of the current research into programmable matter, and where it could eventually end up. We'll begin by discussing two different engineering approaches to realizing programmable matter modular robotics and metamaterials, and then consider how they might ultimately converge. Modular robotics The modular robotics approach to programmable matter aims to develop robotic units capable of arranging themselves into arbitrary configurations. For example, in 2013, a team of MIT engineers developed the first prototypes of what they called M-blocks, tiny cube-shaped robots capable of propelling themselves without any external moving parts. Grouped together, the M-blocks could organize themselves into simple cube-based configurations. An M-block with its internal flywheel pulled out for display. Each M-block measures 50 cubic millimeters with a total mass of 143 g. An M-block with its internal flywheel pulled out for display. Each M-block measures 50 cubic millimeters, with a total mass of 143 g. To locomote, M-blocks pivot around their edges using the principles of angular momentum. Inside each robot is a flywheel that spins at up to 20,000 rpm. When a sudden braking is applied to the flywheel, it transfers its momentum to the M-block, propelling it forward. To arrange themselves in groups, each M-block is equipped with two cylindrical magnets embedded along each edge, which keep the M-blocks in place as they pivot over other M-blocks. An additional eight magnets on each face help keep the M-blocks in a square alignment. Not all modular robots are cube-shaped. Another team from MIT took inspiration from the geometrical complexity of proteins to develop motins, motorized proteins, chain-like assemblies composed of simple robotic modules. Motins are based on a paper from 2011 that outlines a technique whereby any 2D or 3D shape can be achieved by folding strings made up of simple robotic subunits. A Motian chain composed of four 1 cm modules, a Motian chain composed of four 1 cm modules. It's effectively a one-dimensional robot that can be made in a continuous strip, without conventionally moving parts, and then folded into arbitrary shapes, said MIT researcher Neil Gershenfeld. Metamaterials Another engineering approach to programmable matter is to develop materials with properties that can't be found in nature, called metamaterials. This offers engineers and material scientists the opportunity to devise substances that can be controlled in unique ways, or even substances capable of inherent computation, sometimes called computronium. In 2016, Researchers at the University of Pittsburgh made exciting progress in programmable metamaterials by developing a hybrid material system capable of simple pattern recognition. In this system, units of a piezoelectric PZ, cantilever are integrated with a self-oscillating gel undergoing what's called a Bolusov-Zabotinsky reaction. 
Together, a network of BZPZ units can autonomously perform computational tasks without the need for an external electrical power source. To demonstrate pattern recognition, the researchers stored a black and white image into a BZPZ network by altering the polarity of each individual PZ cantilever. In this way, each BZPZ unit in the network represented a binary pixel in the original image. Next, the network was given an input, specified by the initial phase of oscillation in each BZPZ unit. Over time, the BZPZ phase differences converge to the stored pattern the quicker this convergence, the more similar the stored and input patterns. The closer the stored pattern to the input pattern, the faster the convergence time to synchronization. The closer the stored pattern to the input pattern, the faster the convergence time to synchronization. Other metamaterials that could pave the way to programmable matter have been designed with shape-shifting capabilities. For example, engineers from the University of Bristol developed a metamaterial inspired by the Japanese paper art of kirigami, similar to origami, but with cuts in addition to folds. By applying tension to a kirigami honeycomb structure, they were able to manipulate the material's shape and mechanical properties. This kirigami-inspired metamaterial can change its shape and mechanical properties. This kirigami-inspired metamaterial can change its shape and mechanical properties. Another shape-shifting metamaterial, courtesy of engineers and material scientists at Washington State University, is able to morph when exposed to heat and light. Based on molecules called liquid crystalline networks, LCNs, a sort of jello-like cross between liquids and solids, the metamaterial can fold, unfold, and even heal itself when damaged. Yet another metamaterial, developed from silk protein, can be designed for different biological, chemical, or optical functions. One application of this material is a surgical pin that changes color at the peak of its mechanical limits. This approach is a step toward the development of multifunctional devices that may liaise between the biotic and abiotic worlds, according to the Tufts University engineers behind the silk-based metamaterial. Claytronics it's possible that robotics and metamaterial will both be required to develop the ultimate form of programmable matter. If so, bridging the gap between modular robotics and shape-shifting metamaterials would be the key to creating a smart, morphable, and of course, programmable substance. One name for this ultimate form of programmable matter is claytronics, a field which envisions Terminator-style matter that can take on any shape it pleases. The main unit of claytronics is the claytronic atom, or CATOM, envisioned as a nanoscale computer that can communicate and interact with other CATOMs. Ideally, users should be able to interact with groups of CATOMs to change their shape at will. For example, this concept video from Carnegie Mellon's claytronics project shows car designers interacting with a small, claytronic model of a car, shaping it, passing it around, and even changing its color. Concept for a designer interacting with a claytronic model of a car Concept for a designer interacting with a claytronic model of a car Perhaps one of the most disruptive applications of claytronics would be a revolution in the way we communicate. Forget audio and video claytronics can provide an entirely new sense for communication called pario, which combines oral, visual, and physical sensation. Imagine a futuristic version of Skype where you don't just see and hear who you're talking to, but where you can physically interact with a true-to-life claytronic model of them as well. Our goal is to give tangible, interactive forms to information, so that a user's senses will experience digital environments as though they are indistinguishable from reality, reads the landing page for the Claytronics project. The promise of programmable matter okay. You might be thinking, programmable matter is cool, but what are its applications? You mean beyond the potential melding of digital and physical reality? Don't worry, 
that's just the tip of the iceberg. For starters, as often happens with emerging technology, programmable matter has piqued the interest of the military. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, commissioned a 2006 study entitled Realizing Programmable Matter, a draft of which can be found here, that offered an optimistic prediction, we conclude that manufacturing of programmable matter devices. While posing a number of significant technical challenges in integration, power, heat management, etc., can be made feasible, and in a relatively short, less than 10-year, time frame with appropriate investment. If you're keeping track of the years, 2016 was the end of that relatively short time frame. Regardless, the report was convincing enough that DARPA funneled $4 million USD into a programmable matter program in 2009. The programmable matter program will develop a new functional form of matter, constructed from mesoscale particles that assemble into complex three-dimensional objects upon external command. These objects will exhibit all of the functionality of their conventional counterparts and ultimately have the ability to reverse back to the original components, reads the budget report. MIT's Motian research was one of the fruits of this project. There's good reason for DARPA to be interested in programmable matter, as it offers a number of military applications. For example, like the Claytronics model car, military personnel could make plans with a 3D map of a battlefield that could be shaped as needed. Programmable matter could also be used for a universal spare part to fix problems in the midst of battle. Even more ambitiously, soldiers could have seemingly magical access to tools on demand. Mitchell R. Zakin, program manager for the DARPA Programmable Matter Project, expounded on this last point, in the future a soldier will have something that looks like a paint can in the back of his vehicle. The can is filled with particles of varying sizes, shapes and capabilities. These individual bits can be small computers, ceramics, biological systems potentially anything the user wants them to be. The soldier needs a wrench of a specific size. He broadcasts a message to the container, which causes the particles to automatically form the wrench. After the wrench has been used, the soldier realizes that he needs a hammer. He puts the wrench back into the can where it disassembles itself back into its components and reforms into a hammer. While Zakin's paint can sounds like the epitome of the Arthur C. Clark's claim about technology and magic, the potential applications of programmable matter don't end with the military. In the realm of aerospace, programmable matter could produce an aircraft that could change the shape of its wings mid-flight. Ascending a bit higher, programmable matter offers new possibilities for maneuvering and assembling complex objects in space. A shape-shifting airplane wing being developed by NASA. A shape-shifting airplane wing being developed by NASA. Electronics could also benefit immensely from advances in programmable matter. Smart, adaptive antennas could change their structure in response to users' changing requirements. Additionally, adaptive electronics would be great for variable environments, allowing usability from the dust and heat of the desert to the moisture of the jungle. When you buy a tool or a radio, you're not limited to the installed version of what you bought. It will be able to adapt to the environment and what you need it to do, said Zakin. Programmable matter could also impact our regular, everyday lives. For example, smart clothing would be able to alter its characteristics in response to temperature changes or user preference. Or perhaps you forgot your house key no problem, just reach into your magic paint can and pull out a new one. Or, with the physical sensation of Pario, you could cuddle up with your significant other to watch a movie while they're away on a business trip. At the end of the day, 
The promise of programmable matter seems to be limited only by our imagination. At the most futuristic end of the spectrum is a complete end to scarcity, with general purpose matter on demand, we'll be able to stretch our resources to the absolute limit. The peril of programmable matter so, what's the catch? One popularized doomsday prediction for technology like programmable matter is called the Grey Goose Scenario, a hypothetical outcome where nanoscale robots consume all of Earth's biomass in order to either self-replicate or construct some pre-programmed product. While some far-out sci-fi scenarios pose an actual risk, like a runaway artificial intelligence, it seems that the Grey Goose scenario really is just science fiction. So-called Grey Goo could only be the product of a deliberate and difficult engineering process, not an accident, said Chris Phoenix, co-author of a paper about the safety of exponential manufacturing and director of research at the Center for Responsible Nanotechnology. However, that's not to say that programmable matter is without risks. Far more serious is the possibility that a large-scale and convenient manufacturing capacity could be used to make incredibly powerful non-replicating weapons in unprecedented quantity, Phoenix added. This could lead to an unstable arms race and a devastating war. Policy investigation into the effects of advanced nanotechnology should consider this as a primary concern and runaway replication as a more distant issue. If a soldier in battle can reach into a paint can and pull out a hammer, why couldn't they pull out something much more devastating? Why couldn't a civilian, with access to similar technology, craft powerful weapons unbeknownst to any authority? As Phoenix's co-author Eric Drexler points out, there are many concerns like these that will have to be addressed as programmable matter technology advances. An obsession with obsolete science fiction images of swarms of replicating nanobugs has diverted attention from the real issues raised by the coming revolution in molecular nanotechnologies, says Drexler. We need to focus on the issues that matter, how to deal with these powerful new capabilities in a competitive world. A programmable matter of time so, when exactly will we obtain the powerful capabilities of programmable matter? As we've seen, research into the subject is both active, varied and fruitful. Despite some overly optimistic expectations, unless DARPA is holding out on us, it seems inevitable that our engineering capabilities will eventually catch up with our futuristic fantasies. Of course, whether that offers an end to scarcity or leaves us all as Grey Goo remains to be seen. The search for alien intelligence may be revolutionized by new A.I. Tech. The search for alien intelligence may be less about looking and more about listening. And artificial intelligence may be a large part of that. While much of our efforts to find alien intelligence have been focused on looking for signs that they might exist, the likelihood of finding extraterrestrial life visually is likely pretty low. Astronomer Jill Tarter and many other members of the scientific community believe looking for radio signals may be a far more likely avenue. Part of the efforts to find these radio signals may be accomplished by artificial intelligence, adding new ways to locate alien intelligence that we haven't really thought of yet. It's important to note that when we think of alien intelligence, we're often thinking of it in ways relative to our own. However, humans aren't the only forms of intelligent life here on Earth. While we're certainly the most advanced in terms of cognitive functioning, there are also organisms like octopi, dolphins, and various primates that are also quite smart. When making the search for alien intelligence, we often do so with the assumption that they will be as advanced or more advanced than our own. But there's also a possibility that their intelligence could be measured in an entirely different way, being lesser or perhaps even separated completely from what we understand as advanced. The push for artificial intelligence when trying to find alien life has been around for quite some time. But computers are quickly gaining the ability to outperform our own brains in a variety of areas, 
and they may be a key part of coming up with strategies that we might not be able to wrap our heads around. In early 2018, a group of multidisciplinary scientists comprised of astronomers, anthropologists, AI researchers, neuroscientists, historians and more all gathered for a workshop at the SETI Institute in Silicon Valley titled Decoding Alien Intelligence. At the conference, Natalie Cabral presented her 2016 paper Alien Mindscapes where she calls for a new roadmap in the search for alien intelligence. She calls for this search to expand beyond looking for other versions of ourselves and to think outside of our own brains. Part of this initiative has been developed with a collaboration among the SETI Institute, NASA, Intel, IBM and several other partners in order to tackle these problems through AI research and development called the Frontier Development Lab. One main method being employed by the AI Research Lab in order to find alien intelligence is a system called signal agnostic searching which uses machine learning methods to look at data without predetermined categories, allowing it to cluster into their natural categories. Once these categories are clustered, the AI can then let researchers know what stands out as outliers potentially giving U.S. insight into alien intelligence that deviates from the norm. Once these outliers have been identified, they can be investigated further until we eventually arrive at some form of new knowledge. Overall, if we're to avoid a human-centered point of view, while we look for alien intelligence, we need to see how we approach coding ideas about differences into AI and take into account how that shapes the outcome. By using AI in a way that allows it to think outside of our preconceived notions, we may find differences and in information that was hiding in plain sight. It seems as if the search for alien intelligence is stronger than ever before, especially considering that Congress has earmarked a significant amount of money for NASA to explore and search for extraterrestrial life. This is the first time in quite a while that money has been devoted specifically to alien intelligence, and it will be interesting to see what NASA can turn up with these new resources. NASA and other space organizations have largely focused on finding areas that would be habitable to real life, but with a new focus on AI in order to discover alien intelligence, it may be possible to actually turn up something concrete rather than a simple possibility that life could exist. Moving forward, we'll have to see how this renewed vigor towards the search for alien intelligence pans out. By taking a more abstract and open approach to what we consider intelligent life, we may be able to stumble upon something absolutely groundbreaking. Chapter 7 Layers of Deception The Book of Enoch the Nephilim and the Reptilian Alien Visitors Anunnaki Anunnaki Online tells the story if you have an interest in the more esoteric aspects of Judeo-Christian lore. Then you may have some passing familiarity with the Nephilim. But you probably have more questions than answers. Were the Nephilim fallen angels? Were they the children of fallen angels? Were they entirely human? Almost any discussion about the Nephilim is going to be rife with controversy and confusion and for good reason. Nobody knows who the Nephilim really were. How can we break down a complicated topic? Well, let's start by looking at references to Nephilim in the Bible and the Book of Enoch. Then we can explore some of the different theories that scholars, philologists, and theologians have proposed. Among those hypotheses is one which should particularly intrigue you, it is possible that the Nephilim were none other than the Anunnaki. What does the word Nephilim mean? According to the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, the word Nephilim translates to giants. The idea of Nephilim as giants seems to be just about the only thing most scholars agree on unfortunately. The etymology of the word is complicated and quite nebulous. Nobody is totally sure of the root of the word, but it may be derived from the Hebrew verbal root NPHL for fall. 
What does that indicate about the Nephilim? No one is sure. Anglican cleric Robert Baker Girdlestone asserted it should be interpreted as those that cause others to fall down, this could be a literal giant reference or a figurative demonic reference. Professor Ronald Handel thinks it means ones who have fallen. Let's go over the actual scriptural references to Nephilim. Genesis 6 1 4 Sons of God with the daughters of men for the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same were the mighty men that were of old. The men of renown. Numbers 13, 32, 33. The twelve spies report seeing giants in Canaan 33, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. In the book of Enoch the following passage describes the Nephilim as descendants of the watchers, fallen angels, and it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Semjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed. And I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan but to do this thing. Then swore they all together, and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were in all two hundred, who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon, because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. The book of Enoch this passage continues with the names of the participants, and then continues, Then they took wives, each choosing for himself, whom they began to approach, and with whom they cohabited, teaching them sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of roots and trees. And the women conceiving brought forth giants, whose stature was each three hundred cubits. These devoured all which the labor of men produced, until it became impossible to feed them, when they turned themselves against men in order to devour them, and began to injure birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes, to eat their flesh one after another, and to drink their blood. Their flesh one after another. It seems that all those worldly arts of civilization came at quite a steep price. The essential implication is that the fallen angels enslaved humankind. They bewitched us with wonders and then worked us to death. Impiety increased, fornication multiplied, and they transgressed and corrupted all their ways. Amazeric taught all the sorcerers and dividers of roots. Armas taught the solution of sorcery. Barkayel taught the observers of the stars, Akabil taught signs, Tamil taught astronomy, and Aseradel taught the motion of the moon and men, being destroyed. Cried out, and their voice reached to heaven. There are two common theories, one, the Nephilim are descendants of fallen angel fathers and mortal human mothers, in other words, a hybrid race. Two, the Nephilim are fully human. Let's take a look at the arguments for each. The Nephilim as hybrids if you put stock in the book of Enoch, you pretty much have to accept the Nephilim as hybrid children of mortal women and fallen angels. The book is pretty clear and specific on this point. So why is there controversy? Well, angels are traditionally seen as sexless beings, so in theory they should be incapable of procreation. Of course, we may not know all there is to know about angels. And perhaps fallen angels are different. Maybe their sins reflected not just a change in their actions, but also a shift in their nature. All of this is supposition, but there was likely quite a bit of that going on when the holy books were originally penned anyway. The Nephilim as humans The other possibility is that the Nephilim were fully human. Giant humans may sound strange, but read the section just after this one on Goliath, 
and you will see there is already scientific precedent. If the Nephilim were human, most scholars believe they may have represented the descendants of Seth. More specifically, they could have been children of the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain. The children of Seth were previously considered righteous, but they lost that status, fell, when they rebelled against God. The daughters of Cain were never considered righteous. Was Goliath a Nephilim? The most obvious reference to a giant in the Bible that you may remember from Sunday school is Goliath. Was Goliath a Nephilim? Probably not, considering the story of David and Goliath is supposed to take place after the Great Flood. As the flood supposedly wiped out everyone but Noah and his family, all the Nephilim should have perished. There are a couple alternate explanations. Maybe some Nephilim did survive somehow and made a return and Goliath was one of them. Or maybe Goliath was just a really tall human, bones of a human being larger than Goliath have been discovered. Could the Nephilim be the Anunnaki or their descendants or creations? As I stated at the start of this discussion, there is one more possible explanation for the Nephilim which should interest you greatly they could be the Anunnaki. Who were the Anunnaki? Just to clarify, I want to take a moment to discuss who the Anunnaki were. I am guessing if you are here reading this, you already know a lot about the Anunnaki, but I don't want to make any assumptions. Marduk if this happens to be one of your first readings on the Anunnaki, then you should know that they represent the deities of the ancient Mesopotamians Marduk, Enlil, etc. They were the gods worshipped by the Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Akkadians. Many people today believe that the Anunnaki may have actually been reptilian alien visitors who came to Earth. This view was popularized by author Zakaria Sitchin as well as David Icke. When I talk about the Anunnaki in this article, I am referring primarily to their original role as Sumerian deities. If you are a believer in the reptilian theory, you can extend the connections here to encompass the modern mythology of ancient astronauts. The Great Flood Connection Let's get back to talking about the Nephilim. You may have already started to figure this out. If you have read up on the Anunnaki, you know that the Flood story is woven into their mythos in a couple of different respects. The Great Flood plays a prominent role in Sumerian mythology. You may also know about planet Nibiru. Those who believe that the Anunnaki are reptilians from space believe that Nibiru is the homeworld of the Sumerian gods. Nibiru is in theory part of our solar system, but it has a very long orbit and rarely comes close to Earth. The last time it did. The gravitational effects of its presence caused the Great Flood. In Judeo-Christian lore, the story about the Nephilim takes place right before the Great Flood. The Book of Jubilees actually states in 7 colon 21-25 that God flooded the earth specifically to get rid of the Nephilim. 21 For owing to these three things came the flood upon the earth, namely, owing to the fornication wherein the watchers against the law of their ordinances went a-whoring after the daughters of men, and took themselves wives of all which they chose, and they made the beginning of uncleanness. It is clear that the Nibiru story and the Biblical story are both referring to the same cataclysmic event. The stories may differ as to the cause of the flood. But both narratives connect to a mysterious race of powerful beings which used humanity for its own ends. It seems likely that they are referring to the same race of overlords. Additional connections to Sumerian mythology We can also look to Sumerian lore for even more insight into the Nephilim and the Anunnaki. According to scholar J. C. Greenfield, it is possible that the Nephilim story in the Bible is actually derived from Sumerian mythology. Judeo-Christian mythology borrows liberally from pagan myth, so this would not be a surprise. In particular, Greenfield points toward the story of the Apkalo. 
The Apkala were seven demigods created by Enki, one of the chief Sumerian gods. You may also hear Enki referred to as Ea, which is the name he was later given in Babylonian and Akkadian mythology. These seven demigods were, 1. Wana, who finished the plans for heaven and earth, 2. Uanejiga who was endowed with comprehensive intelligence, 3. and Meduga who was allotted a good fate, 4. and Megalama who was born in a house, 5. and Mebulaga who grew up on pasture land, 6. and Enlilda the conjurer of the city of Eridu, 7. Utuabzu who ascended to heaven. These beings were sent by Enki to teach human beings the arts of civilization, agriculture, writing, building, and so on. You may recall this as a direct parallel to the Book of Enoch, where the fallen angels taught humanity about astronomy, astrology, and so forth. Just as things turned sour in the Book of Enoch, they went badly in Sumerian lore as well. Interestingly enough, this is where the timeline starts to get murky. In biblical lore, the Nephilim angered God before the flood, which was one of the reasons the great flood happened in the first place. In the Sumerian story, events took place in a different order, but it is easy to imagine that the players were the same. At some point after the flood, for Apkalu human hybrids make an entrance, Nun Galpirigaldim, Pirigal Nungal, Pirigalabsu and Lunana. This indicates that Apkalu and humans were capable of interbreeding, a parallel to the idea that fallen angels and humans were capable of interbreeding. To top it off, these human Apkalu hybrids really infuriated the gods. This is another link to the Bible story. This is why many scholars believe that the Nephilim myth was directly derived from the story about the Apkalu. It could be that the Nephilim represent the Apkalu themselves or, more likely, their hybrid descendants. Do not forget, in biblical lore, the Nephilim are the children of fallen angels, not fallen angels. So, let me take a second to clarify. If anything, the Nephilim can probably be equated to the Apkalu human hybrids, not the Anunnaki themselves. Remember, the Anunnaki were gods. The Apkala were demigods. We now have three versions of one story now that we have stepped in close to look at all the details, let's take a few steps back and take a look at the big picture. Stories about the Nephilim are vague at best, but we now have three, rough, versions of a single set of events. The Judeo-Christian story splicing together the information from Genesis, Numbers, the Book of Enoch and Jubilees. We get the following basic story, the Nephilim were either entirely human giants or they were a race of hybrids spawned by human women and fallen angels. The fallen angels and or Nephilim gave many arts of civilization to humankind. Nonetheless, men were destroyed by this interference. In his wrath, God flooded the world to wipe out the Nephilim and humanity, save for Noah and his family. The Sumerian story one of the Anunnaki, Enki, created seven demigods to help civilize humankind. These demigods were known as the Apkalu. Apkalu and human beings were capable of interbreeding. After the Great Flood, four human Apkalu hybrids appeared who evoked the wrath of the gods. The reptilian story reptilian theorists believe that the Anunnaki were real, literal beings, and moreover, that they came from space. Their home world is an undiscovered planet called Nibiru in a long orbit around the Earth. When they came to Earth, they brought many of the arts of civilization. But like the fallen angels of Christian lore, they used human beings for their own purposes. The gravitational tides caused by their planet's close proximity to ours created the Great Flood. Some reptilians survived on Earth, but Nibiru moved along in its rotation. The next time it returns, we can expect further cataclysms. The remaining reptilians have gone into hiding or live amongst us as human shapeshifters. Like the Apkalu and the fallen angels that spawned the Nephilim. 
they are capable of interbreeding with humans. This means that some of their descendants could be real-life Nephilim. What do Nephilim look like today? Probably just like us. Remember, all stories are interpretive. There are many people who believe that their religions are literal truth, perfect in every detail. But think for a moment about the way that stories are told. There is no such thing as objectivity in storytelling. This is a hard lesson that every journalist learns well. Even something as simple as deciding where to point a video camera when filming a documentary can paint a story with a certain hue. Some information receives a great deal of focus while other information gets left out altogether. Which story about the Nephilim is true? It could be that all of them are true in some respects and false in others. In other words, none of these stories are the truth. They are simply different versions and interpretations of the same set of events. That set of events is the actual truth. But as none of us have the benefit of witnessing those events directly, we are stuck trying to fit the pieces together. The pieces we have are biased and incomplete. Each of these stories was transcribed through a certain cultural lens. The understanding of the authors was limited by their knowledge of the universe at that time, which limited their language as well. So, were the Nephilim the children of fallen angels? Gods? Aliens? Maybe the simple answer is, yes. Who says that there is one right answer here? What we call gods or aliens or angels is simply a reflection of our cultural lenses of understanding. The real Nephilim were simply whatever they were, or are whatever they are, if descendants of Nephilim today are still among us. They might not describe themselves as gods, angels, or aliens at all. If we want to become like gods or angels ourselves, the best thing we can do is to keep an open mind. That is how we learn to go beyond our existing definitions and limitations. That and avoiding literal. Immutable interpretation is the key to learning more about our place in the universe. If there is a place for us among the gods and the stars, we will need to evolve a fluid understanding. Dash who were the Nephilim comma dot the names of God, what's in a name? How many different names can God have? Well, God will most certainly have as many different names as there are myths, cultures, epics of time, and dialects, for that matter. And generally speaking, people like to assert that one name is more holy and sacred than another name, and some names are not thought to represent real gods, but demonic entities masquerading as gods. For example, the Old Testament, Yahweh, is often connoted to be an evil wrathful God, whereas Elohim is connoted to be the good true God, the idea of Christ. Deus I am that I am Yahweh in Lil Are Tetragrammaton Elohim El Shaddai Elian Adonai, but is it true that the mere utterance of a word draws you closer to the Lord of Lords? This is a good question that each must answer on their own. The Anunnaki, Enki, Enlil, Ninki, Inanna, Yutu, Ninjish Zida, Marduk to give some background on the Anunnaki and the various players in Sumerian history, the following exposition of the Anunnaki from the Library of Alexandria will explain. Genesis 6 1 4 reads, And it came to pass. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also, after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Nephilim is often translated as giants, a legitimate and appropriate interpretation but one which may be only partially accurate.
A better definition might be those who came down, those who descended, or those who were cast down. The Anunnaki of ancient Sumerian texts are similarly defined as those who from heaven to earth came. Sitchin, Gardner, and Bramley have all identified the Nephilim as the Anunnaki, more specifically, essentially the rank and file. Virtually all open-minded historical and theological scholars agree the Old Testament's book of Genesis was extracted from the older Sumerian records, if only because of the similarity in their comparative religions. The Enuma Elish, the Sumerian epic of creation, and Genesis have a variety of common elements. Stories of a great flood and deluge, among other stories, are also common to both Sumerian and biblical accounts. An inevitable conclusion is that the Anunnaki were as real as Noah, Moses, or Abraham. Sumerian Epic of Creation Lawrence Gardner has written, Every item of written and pictorial attestation confirms that the ancient Sumerians were absolutely sincere about the existence of the Anunnaki, and those such as Enki in Lil. Neen Kursag and Inanna fulfilled earthly functions with designated community duties. They were patrons and founders, they were teachers and justices, they were technologists and kingmakers. They were jointly and severally venerated as archons and masters. But there were certainly not idols of religious worship, as the ritualistic gods of subsequent cultures became. In fact, the word which was eventually translated to become worship was avid, which meant quite simply work. The Anunnaki presence may baffle historians. Their language may confuse linguists, and their advanced techniques may bewilder scientists, but to dismiss them is foolish. The Sumerians have themselves told us precisely who the Anunnaki were. And neither history nor science can prove otherwise. The Sumerian records recorded in great detail the stories of the Anunnaki and among these, that of Enki, Enlil, Ninki, Inanna, Yutu, Ninjishida, Marduk, and many others. Chief among these stories was the continuing conflict between Enki and Enlil, the sons of the supreme god of the time, Anu. Much of ancient human history, and the biblical Genesis, can be explained as the militant differences between these two half-brothers, and how they affected the life of all sentient beings on earth. But the Anunnaki were more than just a pair of squabbling half-brothers. They were the council of gods and goddesses, who periodically met to consider their future actions with respect to each other, and probably as a smaller, nondescript item on their agenda, the fate of mankind. The Anunnaki, depending upon the context, were the Nephilim, the gods that Abraham's father, Turah, according to the book of Joshua, was reputed to have served, the fallen angels, the lesser individuals of the race from which Anu, Enki, Enlil, Inanna and the other notables had sprung, and the judges over the question of life and death. They were in fact the Baini Ha Elohim, which translates as the sons of the gods, or equally likely, the sons of the goddesses. For example, from Psalm 82, Jehovah takes his stand at the Council of El to deliver judgment among the Elohim. You too are gods, sons of El Elyon, all of you. The Anunnaki have also been equated with the Watchers, who are also mentioned in the books of Daniel and Jubilees. I.e. Behold a Watcher and a Holy One came down from heaven, dash, Daniel 4.13 according to Zechariah Sitchin, 1, and his interpretation of ancient Sumerian texts, the Anunnaki were extraterrestrials, aka angels, who were an extremely long-lived race, potentially living as long as 500,000 years. Lawrence Gardner, too, reduces this to more on the order of 50. 000 years and notes specifically that the Anunnaki were not immortal. He points out that no records are currently extant which relates to their natural deaths, but the violent deaths of Apsu, Tiamat, Mummo, and Dumuzi are provided in some detail. Sitchin and Gardner also disagree on the date of the Great Deluge slash Flood, 
Sitchin assuming a time frame of 11,000 BCE, while Gardner assumes one of 4,000 BCE. Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, published in 1976 was the first modern volume to begin to describe the Anunnaki, their arrival on Earth supposedly some 485,000 years ago, and from where they had come dash, a planet called Nibiru. Sitchin believes Nibiru to be in an orbit about our sun. But in a strongly elliptical orbit which requires 3,600 Earth years to make a complete orbit. Nibiru's perihelion, closest point of approach to the Sun, is thought to be within the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. At a distance from the Sun of approximately 2.75 AU, an AU being the distance from the Sun to the Earth. The annals of Earth include a detailed description of how Nibiru created the asteroid belt by destroying a planet, Tiamat, in roughly the same orbit. And which created the Earth in the aftermath, the Earth being a remnant of the greater, destroyed planet. Nibiru is not known to modern astronomy primarily due to the extreme elliptical nature of its orbit and the fact its aphelion, furthest point in the planet's orbit from the Sun, is more than eight times the distance from the Sun to the planet Pluto, the latter being some 40 AU away. And thus the former, some 320 AU distant. Furthermore, Nibiru may be now far out in deep space and unlikely to be detected. Or close by, e.g. Planet X. While Sitchin and Gardner may disagree with the extent of the long lives of the Anunnaki, it is clear that these gods and goddesses, bearing accidents or Anunnaki side, lived a very long time. It has also been theorized that because of their long lives, they do not quite move in the fast lane dash, at least to the extent humans do. This could be fundamentally important in that, quite possibly, the human lifespan, while enormously brief as compared to the Anunnaki gods and goddesses, might nevertheless be compensated by the humans possessing the ability to achieve a great deal in a relatively short time. The creativity of a shortened and thus highly motivated lifespan is likely to be enormously greater than that of a god or semi-god resting on their laurels. This may also relate to the idea of why the gods and goddesses of the Anunnaki even bother with mankind. Humans may, on the one hand, act as workers to accomplish the Anunnaki's agenda. But an accelerated creativity may be well worth the trouble for the Anunnaki to manage a crew as motley as the human race. But the connection between humans and the Anunnaki is much more profound than that of masters and slaves. All the evidence strongly advocates the concept that Adam and even their ancestors, cousins, and what have you, were created by genetic engineering and mixing the DNA of Anunnaki with that of Homo erectus the reigning progenitor of man at the time. Fundamentally, this was because the Anunnaki needed someone to work the mines in search of gold and other precious metals, and in all likelihood the ORME. Another speculative source of possible implications is William James' website, Zero Point, Power of the Gods in which he has provided a possible answer to the logical question of what was the Anunnaki's energy-slash-power source. In effect he has linked physics and ancient history by means of an adventure series which focuses on the unlimited potentials of zero-point energy and the ancient gods of civilizations long past. By means of supporting evidence, this combination of science and history effectively provides greater credibility to both. Additionally, and in many respects importantly, Mr. James' writings can also stir the reader's imagination to consider the possibilities of this fantastic energy source, not to mention giving an intriguing insight into the practitioners of the energy source, the Anunnaki. The most fundamental question with respect to the Anunnaki is whether or not they're still on Earth. Sitchin has pointed out that he never said they left, and there is no evidence that they did. There was, however, an apparently fundamental Anunnaki policy shift circa 600 BCE wherein the overt 
Day-to-day -day interference in human affairs by the Anunnaki disappeared. There is also the scenario encapsulated in Richard Wagner's classic opera The Ring of the Nibelung, which included night falls on the gods and the entrance of the gods into Valhalla Dash, titles which are suggestive of possible changes in status of the Anunnaki. Finally, there is evidence to suggest that this state of affairs may be temporary and may be scheduled to end with the end of the Mayan calendar on or about 2012. A. D. From mankind's point of view, the dysfunctional nature of the Anunnaki family and the continuing rivalry of Enki and Enlil may still be ongoing and having enormous effects on the quality of our physical, emotional, mental and spiritual lives. It's a very important question. And one that needs to be answered by each of us. 2003, Dan Sewell Ward, feeding from the same ancient alien trough, Chris H. Hardy Ph.D. Zakaria Sitchin, David Ick Eric Von Danik and Gerald Clark 1, Chris H. Hardy Ph.D. examines the Anunnaki gods' evolving relationships with humanity, their power struggles, and the details of their nuclear war on Earth. Analyzes the crisis and rationale behind the Anunnaki decision to nuke five cities in the Jordan Plain, resulting in the obliteration of Sumerian civilization. Draws upon the work of Zakaria Sitchin, the Book of Genesis, Sumerian clay tablets, and archaeological evidence such as ancient radioactive skeletons, examines the Anunnaki's lack of higher consciousness, their reliance on technology, their sacred power objects and sacred geometry, and the possibility of Anunnaki bases on Mars in the distant past too, Zakaria Sitchin Zakaria Sitchin, Azerbaijani, Zakaria Sitsin, Russian, July 11, 1920 to October 9. 2010, was an Azerbaijani-born American author of books proposing an explanation for human origins involving ancient astronauts. Sitchin attributed the creation of the ancient Sumerian culture to the Anunnaki, which he stated was a race of extraterrestrials from a planet beyond Neptune called Nibiru. He asserted that Sumerian mythology suggests that this hypothetical planet of Nibiru is in an elongated, 3,600-year-long elliptical orbit around the sun. Sitchin's books have sold millions of copies worldwide and have been translated into more than 25. 3. David Aikik uses Zechariah Sitchin's interpretations of the ancient Sumerian tablets, which detail the Anunnaki, a progenitor race of reptilian aliens who came to Earth and interbred with humans, leading to the first advanced civilizations in Sumer, Egypt, Babylon, and the Indus Valley. 4. Eric von Daniken Eric von Daniken, author of Chariots of the Gods, posits a variety of hypotheses dealing with the possibility of extraterrestrial beings influencing ancient technology. Von Daniken suggests that some ancient structures and artifacts appear to represent higher technological knowledge than is presumed to have existed at the times they were manufactured. Von Daniken maintains that these artifacts were produced either by extraterrestrial visitors or by humans who learned the necessary knowledge from them. Such artifacts include the Egyptian pyramids, Stonehenge, and the Moai of Easter. 5. Gerald Clark television series produced by the History Channel, like the Ancient Alien series is assisting the masses in waking up to the fact that the Anunnaki were not a myth. Having left physical documents and artifacts backing up their claims to have created mankind, described in highly sophisticated language, as recorded by Atrahasis. It was in South Africa where the idea was spawned to create a primitive worker, namely mankind, to operate the gold mines, provide temple-building manpower, and generally serve everyone the ancient astronauts from Nibiru conceived of. Dash, the Anunnaki of Nibiru, mankind's forgotten creators. Enslavers, destroyers, saviors and hidden architects of the New World Order by Gerald Clark, 
Amazon book description Hardy's Anunnaki bases on Mars, Sitchin's Ancient Aliens Danakin's Chariots of the Gods, Ix Reptilian Alien Hybrids. Gerald Clark's Ancient Astronauts from Nibiru all demonstrate just how effective Hollywood, NASA, and our occult-influenced educational system has been in brainwashing certain conspiracy theorists. It is not hard to see how all of this was prompted decades ago by Jesuit masters with their heliocentric globe model deception to advance the alien antichrist deception of today. The ancient alien deception just keeps getting reworked and repackaged and handed down century after century until we finally have people doing psychotic YouTube videos on ancient astronauts from Nibiru as if it is actual fact based on real archaeological research and empirical science. Planet Nibiru, Star Trek Fantasies The following piece writing reflects a typical conception of Nibiru. I am including it to reveal what the mainstream idea is about the mythical planet. I feel it is important to learn how this imaginary planet is being used as another factoid in the outer space deception. The more the occult Luciferian can create the idea of outer space as a real thing, the more readily everyone will buy their entire fake space cosmogony. I cannot stress enough how everything they desire hinges upon our believing that outer space is real. All the ancient myths, the fake interpretations of Sumerian tablets with the false conclusion of alien contact, and the inability of anyone to check and verify their spurious ancient alien claims help to deceive even the most assiduous researcher about the fact that there is no outer space. And therefore, no ancient aliens to speak of. There may be low earth orbit beings, demonic or otherwise. But there is no proof of any outer space beyond the firmament of earth the following is the crazy science fiction story of planet Nibiru. Curl up by the fireside for science fiction theater. Nibiru is Sumerian for twelfth planet from ancient Sumerian texts, there was a description that our creators came from a yet discovered planet that enters our solar system every 3,600 years. The text said that they were known as the Nephilim, and that they had colonized Earth over 400,000 years ago. The Bible also mentions this race and calls them the sons of God. The planet of Nibiru was suffering as its atmosphere was eroding, they came to Earth in order to mine minerals, gold, to help repair their atmosphere. This was done in the Middle East and is why we find the Great Pyramid and adjacent pyramids in alone with constellations in our solar system. They created portals on Earth, highly magnetic areas, to send their minerals back to Nibiru. Our race was created around 300,000 years ago as a hybrid race with native Earth animals, and the Nephilim to create a race of workers to help mine the minerals from our planet. The alien leaders did not like this interbreeding and chose not to warn humankind about the impending doom on Nibiru in 13,000 BC that would eventually cause the Great Flood here on Earth. However, one of the Anunnaki takes it upon himself to inform Noah of the impending doom so that he can help avoid the race's extinction. From there, the Anunnaki promise to return in time, but leave humans alone to rule the planet. The return of Nibiru in 2002 The twelfth planet of Nibiru physically entered into our solar system, falling in line with Sitchin's twelfth planet dialogue. After entering in 2002, Nibiru went on to influence the orbits of the planets in our system, changing their axes and poles along the way. It passed close enough to Earth that it influenced our oceans for several years, eventually leading to devastating tsunamis, a new awakening of volcanoes around the world and influenced definitively the climate and the Earth's axis which slowly moves, thus altering the position of the physical and magnetic poles. Initially, the planet's orbit came closer to the Earth's south pole and the Sun and was not visible from Earth. But at late 2012, Nibiru's oblique orbit, which was 35 relatives to the solar equator plane, 
proved to be quite visible and many pictures and videos were posted online questioning this new star in our skies. However, no one in the mainstream media were asking these types of questions. Why is that? The short answer is because of NASA. They decided to question the true orbit and return of Nibiru to our solar system. The U.S. government had urged them that it was required that they deny the existence of Nibiru in order to not cause widespread panic throughout the world. NASA then prepared a very well-built simulation that projected the orbit of Nibiru. Transformed the simulation in video and sneak released on the Internet. The simulation done by NASA computers presented visually not only the displacement of Nibiru in its orbit, but also the orbits of all the planets of the solar system. This NASA video with this orbit still exists, see it below. The goal of the video was clear for any scholar, confuse everyone with a false orbit path for Nibiru. That goal was accomplished as everyone thought there was nothing to be seen or any adverse effects for us on Earth. The true orbit of Nibiru Nibiru, by all definitions, concepts and research scholars in the field, is a red or brown dwarf star that carries along with its seven planets orbiting around each other, therefore, it is a mini solar system. Nibiru is close to five times than Jupiter. So, by turn, it is 6,500 times larger than the Earth. Nibiru's true orbit is around our Sun every 3,600 years. With the gigantic size, it has very strong gravitational pull, and it influences our oceans and all magnetic fields. So, in 2011, when Nibiru approached the Sun, it began forcefully pulling at the Sun's core. The core of the Sun is only 65 times that Nibiru. Thus, the solar activity in relation to explosions and solar storms has increased so much that the Maximo Solar started in 2011, and has not stopped to this day, 2014. The emissions are in the ultraviolet solar radiation level, range from 0 to 16, are currently at 15, and the normal is between 9 and 10 units. This was caused by the approach of Nibiru towards the Sun. Keep in mind that the Sun also influenced Nibiru. Because of the magnetic and gravitational intensity of Nibiru, it influenced the Sun in a way that it initiated the reversal of its magnetic poles. The same reversal is also happening here on Earth, gravitational pull and magnetic fields. In order to perform this reversal, these two forces acting together are required. This mutual attraction between the Sun and Nibiru increased Nibiru's travel speed and velocity. In essence, it was catapulted with accelerated speed away from the Sun. The process is known as slingshot effect and was used by NASA to throw the Galileo probe toward Jupiter. The probe passed twice by the Earth's orbit, then the orbit of Venus with significantly increased speed was finally redirected towards Jupiter. The gravitational effect of accelerated so much that its contour to the Sun's orbit will be much longer, but faster than the misleading NASA simulation. Based on this premise, it is our estimate that Nibiru will pass back around us in 2018. On this return, Nibiru will come from the North Pole of the Sun and Earth, so it will be widely seen in the Northern Hemisphere. In this new return, it will be faster than when you came from outer space into our solar system. This distance of Neptune to the Sun is highly convenient for Nibiru, because it needs a certain distance to re-accelerate from again tangent to the Sun to get to restart the longer orbit of 3,600 years. Dash Nibiru is Sumerian for 12th planet. Smoking the CGI outer space NASA pipe pretty big drama, right? This Nibiru big fish story. Yes, it sure is. But it is all nonsense. It is nothing but the worship of space and the creation instead of the creator.
The occult has made a religion of the skies. Astrology, astronomy, astrophysics, ancient aliens, heliocentrism, it's all the same pagan worship of the creation and nothing worth wasting any time on. Again, Gerald Clark and hundreds like him have been smoking the CGI pipe NASA gave them, and they are all operating under a major delusional system, including the construction of fake mythology based upon fake Sumerian tablet interpretations. Numerous researchers have proven that all these Sumerian tablet interpretations the ancient alien advocates are passing around are absolute rubbish. Nobody likes to be dethroned, particularly these self-proclaimed expert ancient civilization zealots, who relish in rummaging through magnanimous details, stories, bloodlines, and myths to arrive at what? Nothing. A dog chasing its tail makes for good theater though sells tickets. There are theoretically 70 or more names for Nimrod, each language group that was created at Babel. And likewise, there are as many interpretations and tellings of ancient Sumerian, Mesopotamian, and Babylonian history as there are names for Nimrod. In this book, I make no pretenses to be either a Bible scholar nor an expert on ancient civilizations. When telling tales about ancient history, I have lost count of how many self-proclaimed experts seem to be operating YouTube channels. Podcasting the truth about the Anunnaki, the Nephilim, Marduk, Nimrod, Nibiru, Enki, Elohim, Yeshua, ancient aliens, etc. There is simply no end to the layering of contradictory stories floating out there in internet land. After a while, I feel like I am reading the opening highly arcane and complex chapters of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion more than learning about Christ or God anymore. It is all so complexly conflicted and convoluted that it quickly starts to look like a big fish story that got passed around so many times, in so many culturally diffuse ways, in so many languages, that now the truth is an unintelligible mess of half-truths, ancient myths on steroids. An actual history, all muddled into sensationalism and end times prophecy. And so, I have learned a simple little trick to test the potential legitimacy of ancient history. It is called, Does it match the current shape of the earth? I mean, sure, hey, that's great that they think that the Anunnaki were spawned from the DNA of some outer space King Marduk, and that the ancient aliens are returning to seize power over the earth as they did in times of your etc. Blah, blah, blah we have heard it for 50 years now, but really. Space. Outer space? Do not we first have to establish the existence of this outer space they rant about? Millions of questions about the actual shape of the earth persist, coming from top intellectual thinkers, as well as just Bible-believing laymen and they gloss over the flat earth question and simple assert outer space is real as a basic operating hypothesis. An architect and elaborate ancient alien Anunnaki, Marduk, Panspermia DNA in space narrative, named on Sumerian tablets that nobody can truly verify, but everyone says they have the accurate interpretation of? Nibiru stories but outer space is not even proven to exist? Really ridiculous and hardy good science or historical anthropology. Flat Earth is the new elephant in the room. The entire ancient alien deception is based upon outer space and space travel being real. If it is all just science fiction, millions of alien loving and Anunnaki alien hybrid loving pundits will feel the burn very deeply. And yet they forge onward under the banner of Hollywood illusions, assumptions, and proven theories and undeniably false NASA data. One reason I convey different generic views of ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian cultures with an almost indifferent detachment is because I am only trying to provide the backdrop so people know how these stories go. I actually have a huge difficulty believing in any of them, since I cannot even prove that outer space exists. In other words, it all seems like more deception to me, 
Luciferian setup to prepare us for this fake alien space invasion and the emergence of AI-based alien life here on Earth. This Jesuit-produced fake alien deception dovetails perfectly with the Anunnaki ancient alien fantasies. The ancient alien rubbish lays the foundation for this ultimate Jesuit alien antichrist messiah deception. Big blue marble heliocentric band-aid subsequently, there is a huge thorn in the side of all this ancient alien and Anunnaki propaganda. It is bleeding out the sides and limping along, searching for that big blue marble heliocentric band-aid to stop the bleeding. After all we have discovered about the Stanic Luciferian origins of NASA, and the Copernican heliocentric globe model deception perpetuated by the Jesuits, and the absence of Earth's curvature anywhere to be found in the entire history of the Earth. And now I am supposed to believe in ancient alien contact and Anunnaki and alien reptilian hybrid ancestors? It is beyond insulting to people's intelligence to even suggest all this Anunnaki nonsense and alien adventures in outer space without first addressing the elephant in the room, no outer space. I tell people I am not flat earther, nor am I a globe earther. I am always looking into it trying to see which model jives best with what I know about empirical science and my observable data. But I still cannot find any Earth curvature no matter how I try, and that bugs me, so somebody better find it before we continue this charade of ancient aliens and the Nibiru hoax. And so, I do not get too sidetracked in the long chains of genealogy and bloodline studies that all these ancient alien advocates so relish in doing. On the contrary, I am not that concerned if someone calls evil Satan, or the devil, or Lucifer, or Enki, or Isis, or Shiva, or Ishtar, or Beyonce, or Lady Gaga, or the father of lies, or Winnie the Pooh, or Hillary Clinton, or Christopher Hitchens, or Loki, or Entropy, or Marduk, or Katy Perry, or Johnny Depp, or the Archons, or the Demiurge, Artificial Intelligence, or the Black Pope, or the Vatican Church, or the Jesuits, or the Ashkenazi Jews, or the Synagogue of Satan, or the Hebrew scribes, or the fake Jesus, or Rothschilds. The Kazarian Mafi, or the Zionist, Mitra, or Ahura Mazda, or the Illuminati, or the Knights Templar, or the Mystery Babylonia Priests, or Walt Disney, or the Sons of Man, or the or the Fallen, or the Deceptions or whatever, as long as we are clear about there being proof of the worlds we are talking about. There is no proof of outer space, but plenty of science fiction about it and ancient alien myths to go around. Smoking the CGI computer animation pipe that NASA created is not wise. Nimrod, Nibiru, Anunnaki, a more comprehensive story the pre-flood world was an amazing and terrifying place full of hybrids. Our world is turning into the same thing today. But Yeshua warns us, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Matthew 24 21 21-22 God had to step in during the days of Noah in order to preserve mankind, the animals, plants and even the planet itself from the corruption of the gods. Consider how bad it was during the time of the flood, then consider carefully what Yeshua, Jesus, has to say about the days ahead. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Luke 21,25-2 We next need to look at the Sumerian family of gods, which became that of the Assyrians and Babylonians. The Sumerians Their writings rank amongst the oldest on the planet. 
It is from those writings that we learn about the star gods called the Anunnaki. I could easily find myself writing an entire book series just about them. And believe me, it is very tempting to do so. There is so much that could be said about them concerning the past, but I've become more and more intrigued by what may come from them in the future. And this series of God vs. God will certainly take us there. But for now, let's just take a little peek into the past. Wikipedia notes that the Sumerian religion refers to the mythology, pantheon, rites and cosmology of the Sumerian civilization, further stating, the Sumerian religion influenced Mesopotamian mythology as a whole, surviving in the mythologies and religions of the Hurrians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and other culture groups. Thus, the Sumerian slash Assyrian slash Babylonian beliefs are often lumped into the title Mesopotamian as they all centered around that same region of the globe. Concerning the Mesopotamian religion, Wikipedia goes on to say, Some, such as the historian Jean Botero, have made the claim that the Mesopotamian religion is the world's oldest faith, although there are several other claims to that title. Although as writing was invented in Mesopotamia, it is certainly the oldest faith in written history. What we know about Mesopotamian religion comes from archaeological evidence uncovered in the region, particularly literary sources, which are usually written in cuneiform on clay tablets, and which describe both mythology and cultic practices. However, other artifacts can also be used as the Mesopotamians' entire existence was infused by their religiosity, just about everything they have passed on to us can be used as a source of knowledge about their religion. Although it mostly died out 1,600 to 1,700 years ago, Mesopotamian religion has still had an influence on the modern world, predominantly because much biblical mythology that is today found in Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Mandeanism shares some overlapping consistency with much older ancient Mesopotamian myths, in particular the creation myth. The Garden of Eden, the Great Flood, Tower of Babel and mythical biblical characters such as Nimrod and Lilith, the Assyrian Lilithu. In addition, the story of Moses' origin shares a striking similarity with that of Sargon of Akkad, and the Ten Commandments mirror older Assyrian Babylonian legal codes to some degree. It has also inspired various contemporary neo-pagan groups to begin worshipping the Mesopotamian deities once more, albeit in a way often different from that of the Mesopotamian peoples. Those are some pretty bold claims. Their writings do predate those of the Bible. As such, many claim that the biblical accounts are copies of the Mesopotamian accounts of the same incidents. But are they really? Again, an entire series of books could be written about this, so I'm not going to focus too much on all of that here. Google is your friend and using it you can find a lot about this for yourself. But I do think a few things are worth pointing out for the purpose of this blog series. Historians recognize that dating anything beyond 3000 BC is often problematic and thus cannot be considered absolute. Estimation of absolute dates becomes possible for the second half of the third millennium BC. For the first half of the third millennium, only very rough chronological matching of archaeological dates with written records is possible. What makes that difficult is the flood, which occurred around 2350 BC. That global event dramatically disturbed the geology of the Earth and completely obliterated any prior civilizations that may have existed. Thus, at best, all we have are stories and artifacts that can be assumed to date from the periods before, but which were more likely from a time immediately following the flood. Tales of events prior to the flood probably have some basis in truth, but they are often filled with embellishment, contradiction and bizarre, surrealistic accounts as a result of the verbal telling and retelling of those events by many people prior to these stories finally being written down. 
My personal belief is that fallen angels aided in the telling of those pre-flood events to different people groups that arose from the division of languages at the Tower of Babel. Then God finally gave the true accounts to Moses some time later to set the record straight. But let's see how the stories match up in the case of the Sumerians. Note what Wikipedia has to say about Mesopotamia's history The peoples of Mesopotamia originally consisted of two peoples, the Semitic Akkadians, later to be known as Assyrians and Babylonians, and the Sumerians. These peoples were not originally one united nation, but members of various different city-states. In the 4th millennium BCE, when the first evidence for what is recognizably Mesopotamian religion can be seen with the invention in Mesopotamia of writing circa 3500 BCE, the Sumerians appeared. Although it is not known if they migrated into the area in prehistoric times or whether they were some of the original inhabitants. They settled in southern Mesopotamia which became known as Sumer and had a great influence over the Semitic Akkadian peoples and their culture. The Sumerians were incredibly advanced, as well as inventing writing, they also invented mathematics, wheeled vehicles, astronomy, astrology. The calendar and created the first city-states slash nations such as Uruk, Uar, Lagash, Isin, Umma, and Larsa. In the north, in an area known as Akkad, a civilization known as the Akkadian arose, who spoke a Semitic language that was distinct from that of the Sumerians who spoke a language isolate. Wikipedia so, the earliest evidence of any civilization seems to point to the 3500 BC timeframe. Wikipedia says that the Sumerians were incredibly advanced and that they invented writing, mathematics, and all sorts of other sciences and innovations. Well, look at what happened in 3500 BC in the chart above. According to the Book of Enoch, that's when the Watchers showed up. Enoch also records that the Fallen taught men those very things listed above and more. Thus, I believe that the Anunnaki, a race so named because they were princess of the royal, genetic, seed, or some translated as, those who from heaven to earth came, were the sons of God or the Sumerian equivalent of the giant Greek titans. The Hebrew watchers and pre-flood Nephilim, the first super-advanced parents and hybrid offspring to walk the earth. They supposedly came to earth from a world known as Nibiru, or the infamous planet X. This is a subject many people are talking about these days, especially as we move through 2012 to the next few years. Did Nibiru pass by Earth before? Will Nibiru return? Is it even a real planet at all? I believe the answer to all three questions is yes. Notice how researchers like to say that many stories in the Old Testament represent shorter versions of or copies of ancient Sumerian writings. We read the same thing in the paragraph from Wikipedia above. Well, while doing my research, I found a short chronology timeline of ancient cultures, and in that timeline something immediately jumped out at me. The earliest records point to one of the first kings of the Mesopotamian region, a man known as Sargon. Sargon of Akkad, also known as Sargon the Great the Great King, Akkadian Sarakinu, meaning the true king or the king is legitimate, was an Akkadian emperor famous for his conquest of the Sumerian city-states in the 23rd and 22nd centuries BC. The founder of the dynasty of Akkad. Sargon reigned from 2270 to 2215 BC, short chronology, dot he became a prominent member of the royal court of Kish. Killing the king and usurping his throne before embarking on the quest to conquer Mesopotamia. He was originally referred to as Sargon I until records concerning an Assyrian king also named Sargon, now usually referred to as Sargon I, were unearthed. Many have made the connection that Kish is the Kush of the Bible, 
Nimrod's father according to Genesis. So, is this record saying that Nimrod killed his father? It would seem so. The above quoted Wikipedia source also makes the connection that Sargon may in fact be Nimrod, stories of Sargon's power, and that of his empire may have influenced the body of folklore that was later incorporated into the Bible. A number of scholars have speculated that Sargon may have been the inspiration for the biblical figure of Nimrod who figures in the book of Genesis, as well as in Midrashi and Talmudic literature. The Bible mentions Akkad as being one of the first city-states of Nimrod's kingdom, but does not explicitly state that he built it. That author suggests that this Sargon character was the inspiration for the biblical figure of Nimrod implying that the Bible merely borrowed its story from elsewhere. But I submit that the Bible is simply confirming the story, just from a Hebrew perspective, as dictated to Moses by God. Nimrod is not a name. It is a title that means, the rebellious one. That certainly seems to fit the above description of Sargon. Notice also the sculpture of this character to the right. It has one eye missing. Keep this in mind as we continue this study. The date given for his reign is 2270 to 2215 BC. That believed date almost perfectly fits the time frame depicted in my biblical timeline of human history chart as being just prior to the Tower of Babel, which of course was built by Nimrod. Researchers believe the Sumerians referred to the Anunnaki as the creators of life, or more specifically man on this earth. Keep this in mind as well. Those creation events are written after the fact. But notice, even in their writings, the Sumerians believe that the Anunnaki returned to mate with human women. Hmm. Sound familiar? Again, their timing of events certainly seems to match the timing of biblical events that I'm writing about in this series, don't they? I believe what we are seeing here is evidence that the devil very strategically set the stage long ago for the coming great deception. And notice that the Anunnaki are said to have landed and set up shop in what the Bible calls the land of Shinar or ancient Iraq, Babylon. Hmm. Again, I ask, sound familiar? When it comes to the Sumerian god family tree, things get pretty complicated. There are other charts that have some different arrangements, so I'm not even sure that anyone truly knows the actual breakdown. Wikipedia tries to simplify it for us, the majority of Sumerian deities belong to a classification called the Anunna, offspring, of An, whereas seven deities, including Enlil and Inanna, belong to a group of underworld judges known as the Anunnaki, offspring, of An plus Ki. During the third dynasty of Ur, the Sumerian pantheon included 60 times 60, 3,600, deities. The main Sumerian deities are as follows in, God of Heaven slash the Firmament. Enlil, God of the Air, from Lil equals Air, patron deity of Nippur. Enki, God of Freshwater, Male Fertility, and Knowledge, patron deity of Eridu. Inanna, Goddess of Sexual Love, Female Fertility and Warfare, matron deity of Uruk. Ki, Goddess of the Earth. Nana, god of the moon, one of the patron deities of Ur Ningal, wife of Nana. Ninlil, an air goddess and wife of Enlil, one of the matron deities of Nippur, she was believed to reside in the same temple as Enlil. Ninurta, god of war, agriculture, one of the